Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Peter Gettler. It's my honor and privilege to be president and CEO of the Cato Institute, and also my honor and privilege to welcome all of you this morning to Cato. Also, a bulk of our audience is online, so welcome. Um, glad that you're joining us for this important and timely conference, New Challenges to the Free Economy from Left and Right. As a libertarian, I often say that I don't feel any gravitational pull towards one political pole or the other. No gravitational pull towards one political party or the other. In fact, every summer at Cato, we welcome 400 middle school and high school educators here. And in order to illustrate to them our philosophy, I tell them that I could go out on the street here and pull any person aside at random, and I would probably agree with them on, let's say, 50% of their public policy positions. Now, which 50% would depend on whether they were coming from the left or the right, but it just illustrates that we can find common ground on policy with virtually anyone. And on the basis of that common ground, we seek to constructively engage with everyone. Except in economics, those of us who advocate without reservation for free markets and free enterprise, which describes virtually all of us at the Cato Institute, we increasingly feel orphaned. We increasingly feel lonely as the ranks of the free market's defenders seem to be thinning. Despite that loneliness, we think markets and enterprise are well worth defending. We all know the story. For tens of thousands of years, humans walked, a lucky few rode animals, and virtually everyone spent their lives obsessed and fully engaged with how they would get enough food on this day to ensure that they would live to the next day. Yes, life was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And if those words won't, don't resonate with you, I'll paraphrase, paraphrase our late great friend P.J. O'Rourke, who reminded us that if we want to know how good we have it in the modern age, just think about one single word, dentistry. But then the long struggle to limit government and to bring government under the rule of law led to the dawn of a golden age only about 250 years ago, give or take. And a steadily increasing share of the population were set free to pursue their hard work and their ideas and to keep the fruits of that hard work and those ideas. Those changes generated a wellspring of innovation that has persisted and continued growing until the amazing times in which we live today. Another friend of Cato, Daniel Hannon, has reminded us Open markets lifted billions from poverty, added decades to our lives, and gave us powers that previous generations attributed to wizards or gods. But Hannon's postscript to that reminder is that yes, open markets lifted billions from poverty, added decades to our lives, and gave us powers that previous generations ascribed to wizards or gods, but we didn't even notice. We take all these things, like modern dentistry, for granted. And we're all too complacent about defending the free economic system that has delivered them to us. And the reason advocates of the free economy are feeling lonely is because both the left and the right are moving in a direction away from markets, in a direction towards more interventions and more exercise of state power in ways that distort markets. Markets and enterprise get held to an impossible standard, for the free economy is the one thing we only judge against utopian perfection. And every observed suboptimality against that utopian ideal is a candidate for policy interventions, well-intentioned but misguided policy interventions that too often just make things worse. When open markets are allowed to operate, they deliver amazing innovation, progress and results. But for the things that are too important to leave to markets, we carve out a large role for state intervention. And how's that working out for us? For most middle class adults in America, their greatest aspiration is providing and taking care of their family. That means having a place to live. 
It means living a long and healthy life. And that means getting their kids an education so they can each pursue their own American dream. But these essentials, a home, quality health care, and higher education, are now moving beyond the reach of average Americans. And not because of markets, but because in each of these areas, we're not letting markets work their magic and giving government an outsized role. And in each case, government has decided to restrict supply and especially to subsidize and stimulate demand. And when this quite predictably causes prices to escalate rapidly, the policy response is to further subsidize demand, making the problem even worse. Ironically, these policy failures, which are largely bipartisan, are blamed on free market economics, further undermine, undermining the support of open markets. The left is increasingly paternalistic, spending huge sums of money to smooth over every rough edge the free economy creates. Again, holding markets to an impossible utopian standard and creating new theories to tell us it doesn't matter how reckless our fiscal and monetary policies may be. Meanwhile, the right has traditionally talked a pretty good game defending markets and advocating for limited government, albeit while joining in the bipartisan spending follies and policy mistakes. But now the populist national conservative right doesn't even defend the free economy with words as it peddles the mistaken idea that markets have failed the working class and turns against globalism in favor of failed ideas like protectionism and industrial policy that we hoped were behind us. And both sides of the political spectrum are not opposed to wielding state power against corporations that aren't behaving as politics concludes they should. The bipartisan push to use antitrust laws against technology companies is a case in point. But we're hosting this event with participants from many different points on the philosophical spectrum because we've discovered that yes, while defending the free economy is lonely, it might not be as lonely as we believed. Because there are interesting new alliances developing as we see that among the detractors of the free economy on both left and right, there are supporters as well. There is a growing coalition of market defenders across the full range of political viewpoints who may not all agree on the size and role of government in many cases, but a coalition that is broadly pro-market, that recognizes the achievements of a largely free economy, and recognizes the great risk of turning away from a system that has been so successful. Almost nothing could better illustrate the current state of the world, both the move of former supporters away from the free economy, as well as these interesting new alliances than the $2 trillion Biden stimulus. Were Republicans pushing back hard on this third COVID spending blowout? Not really, because while it was going down, they were too busy obsessing about Dr. Seuss. The most notable criticism of the bill came from the center left in the person of Larry Summers. We are so fortunate to live today, having inherited a system and framework that produced the great enrichment and the wondrous age we luckily inhabit. And it will be our shameful, immoral legacy if we deny future generations their prosperity and their own even more wondrous age if we walk away from that system. That's why it's worth joining with allies on both left and right to defend the free economy from its enemies on both left and right. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you especially to all the day's presenters. I also want to express our deep appreciation to the Searle Freedom Trust for its generous support of today's event and our work to defend free markets. The Trust has also been patient as we finally convene a conference that was originally to be held in the third month of the pandemic, two and a half years ago. Now let's get on with the discussion. As I mentioned, one policy area where the progressive left and the national conservative right seem to be coalescing in their thinking is on using or threatening to use antitrust and competition law to bring big companies to heel. So today's conference will kick off by examining antitrust populism under the chairmanship of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation's Aurelian Portraits. So I'd like to invite Aurelian and our first panel to the stage. Thanks so much.
Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ryan, for the invitation. I'm very honored to uh, moderate and chair this uh, great panel of distinguished speakers. Uh, this panel is titled Fighting Back Against Antitrust Populism. So the question is, what is antitrust populism? Well, one could argue that um, populism is inherent to antitrust in a sense that back in the 19th century, at the time of the Gilded Age of massive innovation and in very large uh, increased growth, there was this reaction, these populist reactions that started to rebel against innovative and productive uh, companies. And so you, ha you had this movement, the Grangers movement, the People's Party, the Populist Party in the late 19th century that pushed for state antitrust laws and finally federal antitrust laws in 1890. And so after this momentum, we had many years of improvement of antitrust, many years of improvement through economic analysis through the Chicago School, but also more generally through economic analysis where we refined antitrust just to make sure that consumers are not harmed when governments intervene in the economy. And yet again, here we are with a new antitrust populism. Well, we are in a new antitrust populism because the populists consider that we are in a new gilded age. Just to mention, uh, for example, Tim Hu, who is now competition advisor at the White House, wrote a book, The Curse of, business, of, bigne, of uh, Bigness, Antitrust in the New Gilded Age. So they consider that we are in a new Gilded Age. Also, Senator Klobuchar, who was one of the main leaders of uh, antitrust reforms in Congress, wrote also a book, Antitrust, Taking Monopoly Powers from the Gilded Age to the Digital Age. So the question is like, we are in this new gilded age, if you want, of massive innovation, massive economic growth, because uh, we have this new digital innovation. And yet, we have the same populist reactions of trying to tame uh, these innovations in the name of some uh, reactionary uh, reactions. So the question is, what is this uh, populism? And populism is defined as a thin ideology, as opposed to a fake ideology like socialism or conservatism, which promotes the ideas of the people's belief, even though it's at the expense of the divides of society. It's so the divides of society can be small businesses versus big, can be the rural communities versus the coastal elites, and of course, the people versus the establishment. The establishment can be experts, the media, and any learned uh, societies. The populists themselves don't deny that they are populist. Just to give you an example, uh, Barry Lynn, who spearheaded this so-called neo-Brandesian revolution, wrote in 2016 that we need uh, economic populism, antitrust populism, with a brain this time, which is not nice for the old populist of the 19th century. So what, what does it mean to have this new antitrust populism in this digital revolution, digital innovation. These are the questions that we're going to try to answer and that my very distinguished panelist is going to try to explain. So I'm very delighted to have today uh, with me Jennifer Udoston, who is a policy counsel at NateChoice, Hal Varian, who is chief economist at Google and emeritus professor at Berkeley, and Joshua Wright, who is professor at George Mason University and executive director of the Global Antitrust Institute at Anton and Scalia uh, Law School. So each of the panelists is going to give an opening remark of five minutes. Then we're going to engage in a discussion. And finally, um, uh, some Q&A from the audience and also from the, uh, from the uh, from internet. Uh, you can ask the questions remotely. I think there's an hashtag, which is CatoEcon. So please ask a question from Twitter, from any digital app. Um, we will be very happy to, to uh, answer. Uh, perhaps, Hal, do you want to start your opening remarks? Hi. Hello. That's not there. Okay. Um, I have a very short uh, slideshow for you. Does that do anything? No? 
No. There we go. Third, third one's charm. So I'm going to say a few words about uh, antitrust populism and online platforms and um, start with the premise there's a lot of misinformation about the tech industry, uh, especially on the populist side. But the good news is there's also a lot of publicly accessible information that's available to everybody uh, through things like financial filings and blog posts, advertiser documentation, uh, academic research, industry newsletters, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, of course, I can't uh, dis describe this information in depth uh, in my uh, five to seven minute uh, remarks. And, and of course, I understand clearly that you can't really convince the true believers, but there is some hope for the un undecided. So I've compiled uh, over the years several uh, white papers on exactly this topic. Uh, how does the information compare to the misinformation that we're seeing uh, externally? And so here's just a list. Uh, so in my seven minutes, I'm going to talk about each of these uh, points <clears throat> for maybe 12, 12 seconds apiece, I think I calculated. But I'm only going to talk about the, uh, the first uh, five of them uh, there because that's uh, a good example of what can be done with these other topics. So competition, we'll start there. Where's the competition? And uh, in fact, if you look at the competition among the big five uh, ecosystems, they're all competing very heavily against each other. And uh, that's why we see these low prices and high rate of innovation. And just take a second and look down that list and see the areas in which there is uh, in really intense competition among the big tech uh, firms. And what about search? I'm particularly asked about that. People say, well, of course, there's competition in mobile phones and things of that sort. But what about search? Well, there it's really a tough business because just ask AOL and AltaVista, ask Gs, Inc, Yahoo, Inc to me, Excite. I mean, they're there's a huge, there was a huge competition among those firms. And why is it so difficult? It's because you have to answer 100% of the searches, but you only get paid for about 6% of those, namely the commercial searches or the ads. And uh, that means you have to build this big infrastructure where we will answer all questions that come in uh, in an acceptable way. And uh, on the other hand, there's really only a few of them that make money. And that's true in advertising in general. It's true for magazines, newspapers, billboards, on and on and on. They're uh, not something that people seek out, really, but they see as a side effect of things that they do seek out, information of one sort or another. And the competition for those commercial searches is very in intense. You've got all the Amazon, eBay, Facebook, Yelp, Travelocity, on and on and on who are trying to uh, build up enough of a brand recognition that people navigate directly to those sites rather than going through any kind of, uh, of search. So if you look at direct navigation, organic clicks, app clicks, and so on, you'll see that the most popular way that people get to a website is a direct navigation. You go to Target because you want to buy some socks or something like that. Most people have favorites, whether it's uh, shopping or whether it's weather, and uh, direct navigation is the usual way they get to those sites. Look at organic search, where you're looking at a search and then looking at the organic results rather than the ad results. Organic links, search ads, and so on. Search ads are only about 8% of the entry points to shopping uh, sessions. Uh, and again, the same is true of other commercials. They, they, other commercials and advertising, they tend to be, uh, what should I say, a small part of total browsing, whatever the medium is. And what's been the result of this for spending on ads? Well, in fact, the U.S. spending on advertising as a share of GDP has been going down uh, for the last uh, few decades. Now it's uh, less than a percent of the uh, total spending on uh, advertising as a share of GDP. The BEA has assembled a, a nice uh, table with 100 years of uh, advertising spend. And you can see that, generally speaking, we're seeing a period where advertising 
has become very cheap and uh, very easy to use. And in fact, if you look at search ad prices in particular, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the prices there have declined about 60% in the uh, decade from 2010 to 2020. So it was a really dramatic uh, change, and that's because of all that competition that I outlined in the first slide. Point about innovation, if you look at the tech companies, they are the largest companies in terms of innovation uh, globally. Uh, Amazon, Alphabet lead the pack, then Samsung, Volkswagen, Microsoft, Huawei, etc. And if we take the uh, GAFA firms, the top big five, and uh, combine those with the other technology firms, you see a huge, all that red bars are showing you the amount of R&D that's going into, uh, in, in, into uh, information technology research. So these days, uh, IT is mostly Sorry, the innovation comes from information technology, from biotech of one form or another, and, uh, and automotive are really the big uh, areas that show up as uh, spending on uh, as a fraction of GDP. And if you look at Google in particular, the R&D share of revenue at Google has doubled since 2002. So that's a picture of what spend a uh, fraction of revenue is being spent by Google, 16%, do I say that? No, not in this part, around 16% of, uh, of earnings. 6,000 research reports, 60,000 patents, granting about uh, 2,500 2, a year. And uh, of course, I recognize that patents are not uh, the be all and end all of metrics for uh, uh, innovation. In fact, a lot of what Google's doing is open source and uh, open, uh, open data, but uh, it's an it's a important metric, uh, in fact, one of the few available metrics to really measure the uh, innovation in a consistent way across uh, industries. And let's see, acquisitions. Say a word or two about acquisitions. Half of the acquisitions at Google have seven or fewer people. This is quite remarkable, 95 acquisitions had three or fewer employees because what's really going on in Silicon Valley is uh, aqua hires, that is an acquisition that's intended primarily to get the uh, intellectual capital from uh, an, an enterprise to contribute to your own uh, production. Uh, nice example, great case in point is Android. When it was acquired, there were four engineers in Android and uh, only a prototype operating system that kind of sort of worked. Uh, but what they really had was a vision of what you could do uh, with respect to a model of creating this mobile phone infrastructure that we've found so, uh, so useful. So generally speaking, it's a heck of a lot easier to hire a five engineer, to, to acquire a five engineer company than it is to hire five engineers separately because they're people who've worked together, they've accomplished something, they've shown their skills, and that's the real asset uh, in Silicon Valley is being able to have that labor market or the intellectual capital market function in a way that really uh, contributes to, to innovation. And five times as many acquisitions and IPOs. IPOs get all the press, but actually if you look at what happens in Silicon Valley, you're seeing primarily acquisitions as the exit point from venture capital. And it's well known if you look at Silicon Valley Bank and you ask, uh, and they ask in their uh, quarterly survey, uh, what's the likely exit for your uh, firm and uh, roughly 50% of the people say we expect to be acquired because that's the way to get your product and your innovation to market is to uh, align yourself with uh, a larger firm who can specialize in those sorts of activities. And I think this is my last slide on entropy. We're well, not quite the last slide. Uh, we're seeing a huge uh, expenditure on startups. That's a picture of what the money looks like for first rounds and later rounds of, uh, of funding. And finally, my last slide, this is truly my last slide, I think, data portability, which is a big issue. Google Takeout has been available since 2011. 
70 different products at Google. If you want your data to sit on your computer or on somebody else's uh, website, you can pull it down very uh, easily to G Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, Desktop, whatever you want to do with it. And we're working on that even more with other companies to try to establish a standard for data transmission so you can download it from, let's say, your, from Google, your Google account and move it to another account in a seamless way. Uh, that's all an open source project and we expect to see that uh, developing in the next, uh, next few years. So finally, I'll end with some words of wisdom from Judge Leonard Hand who said, a single producer may be the survivor of a group of active competitors because of skill, foresight, industry. The successful competitor, having been urged to compete, must not be turned upon when it wins. So I will leave that to the rest of the panel to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hal. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Hal, for this uh, great presentation and great quote. Um, Jennifer, do you want to... Thank you. Thank you, Aurelian, and thank you to the Cato Institute for hosting what's sure to be a wonderful day of full discussions. Um, before I start my opening remarks, I do have a few requests for our, our audience in the room. If you could please silence any Nokia cell phones. <laughs> um, make sure that if you're going to follow up on any of Hal's comments, I assume y'all all use Yahoo because they won the search wars. And finally, the hashtag Aurelian mentioned earlier, I'm sure that will be trending on MySpace momentarily. <laughs> It's easy to laugh at all this now, but less than 20 years ago, these were real headlines about the tech monopolies of the day. That Nokia was the cell phone king that could never be caught, that Yahoo had clearly won the search wars, and what on earth were we going to do about MySpace's natural monopoly in social media? Now, like I said, we all laugh at this as a joke because since we did not see heavy-handed changes to the regulatory environment around competition, what we actually saw is that oftentimes innovation is our best competition policy. Innovation allows new entrants into the market to provide services that we as consumers might not have, ma have imagined in even what was recent history, let alone if we think about how the market for information or entertainment or for cell phone or for telephone services has changed over the past 50 years or so. Perhaps what is very concerning about the current push for antitrust populism is the impact that could have longer term on our lives as consumers, as well as what it could mean not only for the products that we currently love, but for smaller businesses as well. Increasingly what we've seen is that there is a group of conservatives that have signed on to a, a group of proposals largely being pushed by the left-leaning neo-Brandeisians, in part because they're concerned about tech companies. They're concerned about issues like online content moderation or about questions that they may have about how these companies are, are uh, reacting to conservatives or just pure anger at times. But the reality is that that's a very dangerous game to play. It's a dangerous game to play in part because the left is increasingly saying the quiet parts out loud of what they believe widespread antitrust reform would do. Not to mention, antitrust would not solve most of the problems that these conservatives claim to be concerned about. Antitrust is not a tool to change content moderation policies, and it's a dangerous slope to start allowing the government to have power to regulate the industries that you're mad at. In fact, we've seen this with Democrats when they're often talking about not only how antitrust could impact big tech, but other industries of critical importance, things like pharmaceuticals, agriculture, energy, and more. But the real thing I want to highlight is at the end of the day, while we often have these concerns about what this could do to the market in a very theoretical sense, and those are valid, I want to bring it a little closer to home and talk about what the concerns could be for consumers. Because one of the great triumphs of free market economics has been the establishment of the consumer welfare standard. That when it comes to competition policy, what we're really focused on is what happens with the consumer. This distinguishes it in a lot of ways from the European approach to antitrust. And it's part of what allows a flourishing ecosystem of competition 
and part of why we also have so many choices as consumers. So let's think about some of those favorite products that we probably have as consumers. One of the examples I think about when I think about Amy Klobuchar's uh, current AICOA proposal in, that would provide broad um, antitrust changes that's been debated in the Senate is what impact that would have on a service like Amazon Prime. Many of us during the pandemic have done a lot of online shopping and we've enjoyed the fact that we're discovering new small businesses through these different services as well. But these proposals could make it very difficult to offer certain products and services such as Amazon Prime. Additionally, when we look at what's going on with acquisitions, we often think of, hear this portrayed as some sort of kill zone for small businesses. But the reality is, as was mentioned earlier, this provides yet another exit strategy for small businesses. There are some small businesses and startups in Silicon Valley that want to be the next Google, the next Facebook, the next Twitter, the next whatever tech company you can think of. But there are others that are looking to make an existing product better. There are serial entrepreneurs whose main goal is inventing new things, but they rely on others to really take those to market. The reality is all of these exit strategies should be considered completely valid. And while we should certainly applaud those IPOs and be excited about those new products that make it to the next phase, we should be equally as excited about those products that get incorporated into our existing products and make our example better, make our lives better as consumers. Finally, I think it's important to think about the impact that these proposed changes could have when it comes to consumers and prices. Again, the consumer welfare standard has so far been focused on what is the impact on consumers. But we've seen an increasing number of mergers challenged, particularly by the FTC, on, on some kind of concerning grounds. One example would be the Illumina Grail merger, which is a, a biotech issue, um, where what we've actually seen is that that could bring prices down rather than up. And as a result, consumers would benefit from having more access to genetic testing. So at the end of the day, perhaps the most concerning thing about antitrust populism is that it shifts this focus away from consumers. It shifts back to an idea that big is bad and that we should focus on competitors rather than consumers. If no one's thinking of the consumer, then what are we missing out on? Great point, thank you. Great point, Stacia. Thank you. Uh, Josh, uh, I would love to have your take on what's going on with the antitrust populism those days. Thanks, Aurelian, and thanks to Cato for having me. I have been uh, waiting since Ryan invited me a couple of years ago to come here. Um, so thanks, Ryan. Uh, from uh, so my daughter, I have, I have a teenage daughter, and she debated with me this morning what she was allowed to wear for her Halloween costume. So I say no to everything. She keeps on proposing costumes. And at some point she said, um, but dad, it's spooky season. I don't know what that means, but, but I, it, she's a teenage girl and I'm, I, don't, I don't know, it's been in my head all morning. Uh, and so I think I'm gonna play the role uh, following Hal and, and Jennifer of scaring you a little bit more about what the antitrust agencies are doing. Um, I think that they've both set up quite nicely what's at stake, um, but when we talk about what antitrust populism is on the ground and as applied through the agencies, um, I think it's worth talking about what's actually happening inside the agencies um, and what kind of proposals are on the ground being taken seriously or, alre or are already being uh, implemented. Um, I will probably focus most on the FTC in uh, my, my old job before I returned to academia. I served as a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission for a couple of years, uh, and it is, uh, it is sad to see some of this happening at, at the FTC, so I will, I will start there. Um, let's talk about a couple of the proposals sort of actually on uh, the ground that put some of the gains um, that Hal showed you and that Jennifer talked about sort of up, up for risk. Um, Maybe the best place to start is, I'm glad they left the quote on the board. It's, it's one of my favorite quotes when I teach antitrust. Um, what, what Hal didn't teach you is the, the next sentence. Uh, you probably, 
if you read the quote, this looks like a case the defendant won, didn't it? Right? The judge says, oh, it's great to compete and outcompete your rivals. If you get to be the monopolist at the end of that, that's wonderful. The very next sentence says, um, but Alcoa, this is a case against Alcoa uh, from over 50 years ago. Very next sentence says, um, but the way that you did it was pretty scary, and so you lose. Uh, and antitrust has come a monumental distance since then uh, by implementing the consumer welfare standard that Jennifer talked about, where the currency of proof in cases is a, a plaintiff to win has to come into court and show uh, abuse, creation of or abuse of market power to the detriment of consumers. And sort of chopped off uh, cases from the distribution where uh, the complaints are about something else other than competition. Uh, life within the consumer welfare standard for the agencies over the past 40 years has been um, you know, differences in Republican and, and Democratic administrations, but not, not a ton. Um, sort of until now. So we'll give, give an example. Um, perhaps uh, the most striking to me, so as I live in the practice of antitrust law, every day is the Federal Trade Commission has announced uh, that when seeking consents on mergers, you go to get a merger approved by the agency, uh, and the FTC comes to you and they say, um, nice merger you have there, it would be a shame if anything happened to it. Uh, and so if you would like approval, we would like you to sign a consent decree that says, for any merger moving forward, you will need approval of the Federal Trade Commission uh, explicitly. Now, happens if I have a merger in front of the agency, the agency thinks it's bad, I think it's good, I say let's go see a judge. Right? So they are asking merging parties, sign away your right to go see a judge in the case that we disagree in the future, and just give the hand, uh, put that in the hands of, uh, of a couple of bureaucrats inside the Federal Trade Commission. Um, another thing actually going on inside the agency is a call for restoration of the Robinson-Patman Act. Um, uh, gentleman, Commissioner Bedoya, who sits in, the, in my old seat, um, has said, you know, you know, what would be great is if we <clears throat> brought back vigorous throated enforcement of the Robinson Patman Act, which largely renders in law, unlawful retail passing on discounts to consumers that come from firm size. So, uh, price differences that arise from one firm being superior to another in terms of efficiency or cost or distribution or you're a retailer and you learn to do something really well uh, and you get lower prices because of it, um, most of that is unlawful. Um, you go back in antitrust history, 50, 60 years, left, right and center. If you wanted to find people in antitrust policy agree on something, which is increasingly unlikely these days, you ask people what they thought about the robinson Patman Act. Um, it certainly resulted in higher prices um, and was about preventing large format retailers or manufacturers from taking advantage of economies of scale. Like if you designed a piece of legislation to make sure you got higher prices, you probably couldn't do better than the robinson Patman Act. Um, the federal agencies have sort of gone away from it over time. There's still a little bit of private enforcement, uh, but this is the first time you've seen public agencies uh, call for vigorous enforcement of it in 50 or, or 60 years. Um, a couple of other things just to sort of round out. If you're not scared yet, I'll, I'll sort of pick it up a little bit. Um, you've got Cong excuse me, the agencies openly lobbying Congress to pass uh, the legislation that Jennifer mentioned. So, so uh, the Klobuchar AICOA bill would do things like render it unlawful for a platform to both serve as a platform and have a product. So whether it's Amazon Prime or Google Maps or, I don't know, Apple having a store, right? The doing two things at once becomes unlawful if you are a platform, right? Uh, no walking and chewing gum at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. Most of you use one of those three things that, that I mentioned, and um, I always get in the Q&A, the, do the bills really do that? And the answer is yes, the, the bills really, really do that. Um, one more um, to sort of round out spooky season. Everybody's scared of prison a little bit, right? So uh, the DOJ, I haven't done them yet. I've been doing mostly the FTC. So the DOJ, uh, one of the first speeches that Jonathan Cantor, the Assistant Attorney General, gave when he took over was he said, 
you know, we've sort of review, uh, reserved criminal antitrust enforcement for the really bad stuff, you know, naked price fixing cartels. Um, gas station owners meet in the middle of the street and say, hey, do you want to fix price? Yes. It's a felony, remains a felony. Um, what Jonathan Cantor has said is, uh, in theory, all of the antitrust laws have a criminal provision. You can sue under Section 2 of the Sherman Act and send people to jail uh, for what have been civil antitrust cases for a long time. You believe a company's got exclusive dealing provisions you don't like. They're buying up too much of the shelf space in the grocery store. Uh, you don't like the way they order their, their, their search results. Um, they've said out loud and repeatedly uh, what they would really like to do is bring a criminal case uh, for business conduct that at most has been subject to civil antitrust suits, which they have largely lost uh, over the past 40 or, or 50 years. Uh, and if you're not scared at least a little bit for them threatening to send Hal to prison, um, I, don't know, I don't know if I can help you. Um, <laughs> what, what the, the thought I, I, so these are proposals that are actually sort of out and, and, and around, and the, the thought I will, will end with, having hope that I have at least spooked you a little, um, is, you know, at least a, sort of a, a minute of thought on are they going to be successful? Um, and I think the answer is, is, is no. Um, and I, at least for discussion purposes, want to say why. Um, a unifying theme of many of these policy proposals is to uh, evade judicial review. So one of the things that is very unique uh, and I think a, a wonderful feature, uh, there are some bad features out there, but a wonderful feature of American antitrust law is the primacy of judicial review in our process. Agencies do crazy stuff sometimes. Um, Cantor can try to bring a, a AG, Cantor can try to bring a case that's criminal, um, and the defendant can say, let's go see an Article Three judge, I bet you don't win. Uh, they can bring a case for conduct that is largely pro-consumer, because they don't like it or because they you know, don't like what they had for breakfast in the morning, it doesn't really matter what the reason is, I can say no, let's go see a federal judge, prove it. Um, and historically, this has disciplined the conduct of the agencies to you know, try to bring cases they can win. Uh, and the agencies have done that across administrations sort of fairly well and over time. Uh, one of the differences in this administration is, you know, where I don't, for the FTC, a, a year and something into it, and the agencies combined, I think, are 0 for 6 in merger challenges. Uh, there's not been a losing streak like it in a very long time, uh, and I don't think we'll see another one like it for a very long time. Um, the good news, I believe, is that the ways to evade judicial, ju judicial review are either you get one of these bills passed, I've lived in D.C. for 20 years. I'm like a bet the under on congressional activity kind of guy. Um, get rulemaking authority. FTC doesn't have it. They'll probably try but lose in courts. Or win cases. Actually put together cases and put them in front of a judge and prove to them that conduct is anti-competitive. Uh, so far, the agencies have not done that successfully. Um, and I think the... The good news in, in spooky season is that ultimately having successful and long-lasting policy changes of the type we're describing require you to do the work and go in and court and do it early and often um, and for a long period of time. Uh, so far that has not happened and I think that the chances of these policies implemented sort of in equilibrium is, is small. Um, but goodness, there's a lot of damage to do uh, in the interim, and it's, and it's really important stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to, to, to kick off the uh, discussion, I think I will have perhaps one first question. Um, one of the key uh, ways this new antitrust populism has been materialized lately was this ex executive order that President Biden passed last uh, July. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, he passed this executive order when he said that, well, we tried this experiment over the last 40 years, uh, this Chicago School Consumer Welfare Standard uh, experiment, and basically we failed, antitrust laws are broken, 
and we've never seen such a high level of monopolizations and concentrations. So that's why we have to completely change uh, the pendulum and, and have the, embraced this populist uh, momentum, which is uh, brushing away 40 years of antitrust economic analysis and enforcement. What would you reply to those who precisely uh, say that antitrust laws are broken, antitrust enforcement has failed, and we have to radically change the pendulum. But how? Well, I would say the biggest uh, issue in, uh, in my mind is that uh, 40 years ago, we lived in a very different economy than we live now. We're in a global economy, and size matters because you're not just producing for the U.S., you're producing for the entire uh, world. And if you look at a lot of these studies that have been done, by uh, economists and others, uh, they tend to ignore the rest of the world. And so if you're looking at a company, well, it's big compared to the local economy, but this is, we're in a global economy now. And in many of these technologies, a global economy really matters in terms of being able to utilize uh, technology in an, in an effective way. To the global economy um, point, I think it, we've been focusing very much on what's going on in the United States around this, but this is also, we're seeing conversations around appropriate levels of competition policy happen more globally, notably in Europe with the Digital Markets Act that is, quite frankly, an, an attack on American success. It's deliberately targeting these large, successful American companies in an effort to try and bring them down um, because they've been so successful and we haven't seen a European competitor emerge in part because of a lot of different regulatory structures there. Um, if I can also build on kind of a, a Josh's scary comments, I think one of the scariest quotes in Senator Klobuchar's book um, that, that was referenced earlier is her comments about the reason that she believes we need antitrust reform is because of conservative judges. Um, so again, to the, we're seeing a, a call to make these changes however possible, rather than focusing on the consumers, focusing instead on political goals or on beliefs about what the right number of competitors, what the right size of a business is from the top down rather than from the market approach. And I think that that's highly concerning. And with the Biden executive order, again, like a lot of the debate we've seen in Congress, this was not focused only on one industry. There are certainly significant ramifications for the tech industry, but there are many more areas of the executive order that impact the economy at scale and would be a, a dramatic change in the way we've seen government intervene in the economy. Can you talk a little bit about the, the sort of legal part of the claim that our antitrust system has failed in, in 40 years? And I, um, the sort of underlying premise of the call for change in the law is that there's anti-competitive behavior happening at happening that the agencies or private plaintiffs can't get to, right? They're, they're losing cases that they should be winning. Um, and I'm often on uh, panels or in talks where somebody makes this claim, and I, I say, you know, na name the case. Um, surely you can, you can name one. What's, what's the wrongly decided case that the, the government should have won, but, but, the, but they didn't? It turns, I mean, over the past 40 years, you're looking for a, a crisis in the courts in which uh, the government is losing antitrust cases regularly. Um, it's pretty hard to identify one. I'm a law professor with a case book. I can point to my favorite cases. You can point to your favorite cases that you think go the other way. The government's win rate, um, the government saying that there's a crisis in the antitrust laws and they need to be flipped around, essentially, and you'll notice the one empirical regularity in every policy proposal is to lower the burden of proof for the government. Right? Uh, the government's win rate in antitrust cases over the past 20 years is edging really close to 90%. Um, try to get your sympathetic crisis feelings out with that. Um, I can't. Uh, they win most of their cases. It's not quite you know drug prosecutor win rate, 
uh, but it's really high for a set of complicated cases. Uh, the government, when it puts together a case and has evidence of consumer harm, wins its cases. Uh, loses some here and there. That's, that's what happens when people get to defend themselves in front of a judge and put on evidence in the other direction. Um, but it is very difficult uh, for me to look at what actually is happening in litigated cases uh, under the American antitrust laws uh, and think that reform in the law is needed to make the world easier on, on the government. If I can just add something as, as well, it's important to note here that the consumer welfare standard is agnostic about the number of cases that the government could bring. It's not a tool that says you must bring fewer cases. It's a tool that says this is the standard it will be held to. It's also, I think, if anything, easier to look back in retrospect and kind of wonder about some of the cases that were successful. One of the ones I often think about is the Hollywood video blockbuster case that was blocked from merging because these were the two giants of home video rental. It was blocked at roughly the time that Netflix was starting to emerge. So the question becomes, what, what would have changed? And again, it's easy to play hindsight is, is always 2020, but I think there are as many cases that we can look back on now knowing how innovation was coming in, questioning how the market was defined, um, per perhaps too narrowly given what was going on in the actual consumer experience, as there is to question whether there were more cases that should have been brought. Let me pick up on something that Jennifer mentioned earlier. She said that uh, it's not just tech. It's uh, across the board. And that's absolutely right. But there are some provisions that are exactly targeted towards tech. In fact, not only in industry, but five firms. Mm -hmm. They've structured the description of who is able to uh, self-favor, uh, and the de definition applies only to five firms. It's perfectly fine for CVS, for Walmart, for Target, et cetera, to have house brands. We're used to those. But it's not okay to do that online, which is yeah. a pretty amazing bill with that kind of provision. That's a very uh, important point to make. I mean, very, very quickly, perhaps I would like to love have one of your thoughts, each of you, um, about this new antitrust populism, which is also a rejection of economic analysis. I mean, I'm sitting next to a chief economist. So it's like, they, they push their ideals in the name of values. They say, like, it's not about economic analysis. We, we, get, we get enough of economists, and we put these legal changes also in the name of values, of fairness, of redistribution, of restructuring the market. So what would you, what would all of you, would, would reply to this idea of, we just got enough of economists. Uh, antitrust shouldn't be only about efficiency. There's one question here, so is GDP the most important thing? Uh, should we care about efficiency, prosperity, or should we just care about redistribution, fairness, and, and, and so-called values? And we don't know what it is, but what's your take on that? Yeah, I would say that the current rhetoric which emerges from the progressive side is fairness, fairness, fairness. Now, fairness is a virtue, I'm sure, but it's a question of just how is it interpreted uh, in, this, in this context. And uh, of course, by fairness, I mean fairness for my friends, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily anybody else. Uh, and it's a definition which is, I think, definitely subject to, uh, to abuse. Yeah. Yeah. To pick up on that, I'm not an economist. Um, I'm an, a lawyer. Um, and one of the things I think about with this debate over what role should economics play or what role should fairness play in antitrust analysis is the question of if you replace that economic analysis, what are you replacing it with? Right now there's a pretty objective standard. It's something that, that can be measured and we can debate what the market definition should be, but it's something that when you go into court is a relatively objective standard. Small players, large players, consumers, the government can all know kind of what's being applied. If you replace that with an idea like fairness, that's much more subjective. And when you think about some of our, our polarized political age, what does that allow to do, particularly with an agency like the FTC, with some of the behaviors that Josh mentioned in his opening, and their ability to target companies they don't like? What does that do in terms of handing the government power, 
not just when the party you like is in power, but when the party you don't like is in power. And I think that's very important to remember when we think about what that standard might end up replaced by. It's not just what that standard would end up replaced by when whoever you think are the good guys are in power. It's what that standard would end up replaced by when whoever you think are the bad guys are in power. Despite not being an economist, Gen Jennifer asked exactly the right economic question, which is, you know, compared to what? Um, and I think one of the places we can learn about what would happen with our standard versus um, what is being proposed, the sort of multi-factor, if we're going to get rid of the consumer welfare standard and we're going to maximize two or three or four or five things at once, you know, fairness and there's a bunch of a, what is it, democracy and uh, unicorns or whatever, um, what are, we, what are we doing? We're giving up some consumer welfare to get other stuff. Um, I think the critics of the existing system have been a little bit unclear about what other stuff exactly we are getting, but we have experience with exactly that sort of antitrust system. Um, we did not coordinate this, but, but Hal, this is the perfect quote, right? So we, we had a pre-consumer welfare standard, we had an antitrust system in this country that said uh, the way we will read Sherman Act and Clayton Act decisions is, you know, we're going to maximize uh, consumer welfare and small business welfare and fairness and maybe some industries we care about and maybe not some industries we don't care about, small dealers and worthy men and some general sense of ethics. And the uniform uh, response to that in the United States from left, right, and center was uh, this didn't turn out well. Um, if you read the antitrust decisions coming from courts and 1966 or so, um, a couple of things will be clear. One, the government always wins. Two, judges really struggle uh, with, as anyone does with a standard that maximizes six things at the same time, with figuring out how to make decisions in a consistent manner. Um, and so the state of play in the US circa 1966 or, or what have you is most things are illegal. Um, tying arrangements are illegal, virtually all horizontal mergers, most vertical mergers, exclusive dealing contracts, most things you would do other than hand the barista five bucks and get your coffee at the same time, most of them give rise to antitrust liability. There's a reason the Supreme Court in a bunch of nine nothing decisions said let's stop that and do consumer welfare, sort of cabin the antitrust laws to a thing uh, we can do. These weren't controversial decisions, these were bunch of unanimous decisions. Um, and I think the history of the US antitrust experience gives a lens through which one can observe exactly what we would get. Um, you get decisions where Judge Hand says, um, of course we don't use the antitrust laws to punish su successful competitors, eh, except probably this one. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very difficult, I think, to you know, <laughs> run an economy in that sort of operation. I really like I sure. really liked your uh, bringing up the Robinson Patman Act. It's uh, important to, no, to inform the audience that the target, uh, one of the major targets of the Robinson Patman was supermarkets. Supermarkets were unfair competition for a mom and pop stores on the uh, on the on the street, and there was a basically a 30-year vendetta against uh, A and P on grounds of of antitrust. And Robinson Patman was designed to meet the need for legislation that supported the opinions that were held by the FTC. We, we are in the house of uh, free market here, and it's very interesting to, to also reflect of what does it mean antitrust populism for the view of free market and, and, and its ideals. What, what is clear is that antitrust populism as an as a alternative view than free market, which is what sometimes they call open market. I would love to have your, your thought of how this idea of open market, like everything has to be shared, everything has to be accessible, where it, with the antitrust sometimes duty to help rivals, to, to really promote them. Uh, any intellectual property right has to be commonly shared. You have to share the data, you have to, because in the name of open markets, everything which is innovation could be seen as a barrier to entry. So you have to have these platforms that completely share. And, and this is, of course, I mean, somehow undermines uh, 
free market. And how can you, how, how do you see these directions of um, this ideology of open markets undermining uh, free markets in, in some sense? I'm happy to. Yeah. I'm happy to start. Um, I had a last name with W. I never get to go first. Um, so I sympathize. <laughs> I get it. Um, I occasionally seek out my uh, Scalia Law uh, co-author Todd Zawicki just so I can have my name first. Uh, in any event, uh, one of the, uh, the the way I see this, not to sort of beat a, a, a dead a dead horse is there's a collision in that with that view and existing antitrust doctrine in, in this country I think one of the uh, um, said earlier one of the very unique features of American antitrust uh, jurisprudence is how judge centric it is so the Congress got together in 19, 1890 and then 1914 to write the antitrust laws and said um, some really vague and unhelpful things about what would be lawful and, and not. And if you read the, the legislative history, they're asked questions like, would you like to be more specific? And they largely, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, said, no, that's the judge's <laughs> problem. We don't want any part of um, hard work here. And they, they sort of punted the whole exercise um, to the Article Three courts. And, you know, we've got this sort of slow evolution to sort of, Took antitrust law to where it is now, and it's a history with uh, all, all sorts of problems that run sort of contrary to, to free market thinking. Uh, however, I think sort of where we sit now, that judicial centric role has created, I think, what really is the, the other signature feature of American antitrust law, which is how open to innovation it is. So. Uh, which compared to, there are now something like 133 antitrust jurisdictions in the world. Uh, and in many of them, uh, if you uh, do the thing described in the judge hand quote, um, you should just keep that up all day. If we do the thing described in the judge hand quote, you, you build the better mousetrap and you become the monopolist and you charge the monopoly price. It's unlawful in a bunch of jurisdictions across the world. Um, in the United States, American antitrust law not only allows, we look at Scalia law, there's a Scalia opinion in Trinco where there's like a love poem uh, to it becoming the monopolist through in innovation. They say, you get to charge the monopoly price in the short term, and we will take that uh, trade off to invite innovation. I do not think it is uh, a coincidence by any stretch of the imagination that um, we have that approach to antitrust law here, and when Hal put up his graph of where all the R&D spend is, an awful lot of it is within the borders of this country. Uh, I think that feature of US antitrust law where we don't say, if you build a better mousetrap, you now uh, must describe how to build that mousetrap to all of your competitors. Uh, we, we do not um, turn upon the successful firm uh, in modern antitrust. Um, and I think this sort of concept of uh, expanding the duty to deal and, and, and Aureli and what you described as a sort of sort of open markets, I think it's in direct contrast with what sits in American antitrust law. And I think that's why you see pushes to change that through Congress and other means rather than doing it through bringing cases um, because you will lose those cases. And it is very difficult to run a revolution by losing cases. Also, to kind of build on what Josh said and go back to my kind of opening joke as well, I think at times it, I think it dramatically undersells the value of disruption. That what we've seen time and time again is this initial disruptor arise and then because they found some underlying consumer desire, others rush to meet the same need. We can think about this in, in retail. You, uh, grocery stores were brought up and of course AMP was considered an incredibly disruptive um, party at the same time. What we eventually saw was that this was what consumers wanted and other grocery stores followed suit. And now it's you know much of our, our same experience. We've seen this in terms of the growth of quick shipping and, and things like that. But I also think it's different when we are seeing the responses from individual companies to meet that consumer demand. So for example, Hal brought up earlier data portability. That is something that 
is often done not because of a government mandate, but because it's what consumers want. And that goes back to, I think, the real focus needs to be on how are we responding to consumers' demands. I think there is some particularly concerning um, things and some proposals out there around this idea of open markets. The one that immediately comes to mind is the Open App Markets Act. Um, and there are some other potential consequences there, not only to what does this do to innovation, but some other questions that would need to be asked around, for example, what does requiring some of this openness do to, for example, cybersecurity in the, in the tech industry? What does some of this requiring openness do to what have been generally accepted business models um, throughout multiple industries and things like that? So I think it's important that we consider those other consequences as well as just kind of the, the general value. Yeah, in fact, it's, uh, it's worth pointing out that the most, the loudest voices for evening, evening up the playing field are coming from Europe because they don't have the technology companies that the U.S. has and they're going to go through lots of measures in order to try to acquire those companies by this uh, play leveling, the, uh, le leveling the field. And there are laws that are now passed in the Digital Market Act that says uh, uh, search engines have to give away uh, all of their data to their competitors. They're mm -hmm. even quite explicit on this uh, point. Now this runs headlong into privacy issues and how that's going to be solved in Europe, I have no idea because how can you give away all <laughs> your data and then uh, at the same time, preserve privacy for your clients who chose to use your system rather than someone else's. And it, I, I, I don't understand how that, that will possibly be uh, settled, but uh, they're moving headlong into doing exactly, uh, exactly that. All right, thank you so much. <coughs> Any questions from the, oh yeah, many questions. Um, gentlemen, I, I don't know if we have a, a mic, yes. just repeat the question. <coughs> uh, I think this discussion has raised some very important issues about the nat political nature of yeah. decision making, and of particularly uh, responding to Joshua Wright's comments about six different factors. Naturally, that's going to end up in uh, uh, litigated cases. Is that the right framework for it? Are judges, uh, generalist judges, suited to doing that? I think one of the problems we're facing is this, this popular image, w which to a large extent is correct. This is a two-tier economy. And so the giants are seen as the top tier, and how do you reconcile that with the general theme of one size fits all, which dominates our intellectual property system and dominates our competition system? And yes, we do have this challenge from Europe, and it's not just Europe that doesn't have the tech companies, it's most of the world, with the partial exception of China. And we seem to be running into really difficult semantic issues about what open means and, and uh, standards and networks and uh, other things. What could we possibly have, imagine, a more sophisticated way of thinking about what's going on in the economy that can explain, uh, and I, I love Hal's presentations, I came specifically for that because he's so matter of fact and speaks because they're so graphic, they speak directly to some of the problems that people, that a lot of people are thinking about, but in very concrete terms. Is there a possible alternative parad paradigm between antitrust on one end and regulation, which is typically gravitates towards heavy-handed uh, rate of return regulation on the other hand, yeah. that would help our political system deal with this. Great, I think we're gonna take w another questions. Uh, just two questions and then we answer. And uh, uh, la lady, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would follow up on, 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 on this, this point and um, um, maybe answering uh, uh, Professor Varian's uh, uh, questions. What, what is special about digital uh, markets and digital industry? Of course, it's special because the network effects 
are tremendous. The first time in, 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 in economic history that we see um, uh, you know, market tipping and we see um, uh, a winner takes all. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad per se, it's innovation that's behind it, but, but it's, it makes it special. And in that respect, um, I'm wondering whether, uh, what, what, what the panel would say about uh, Jason Pullman's report on the UK digital industry, because that's perhaps the one that the gentleman before me asked, is sort of that's a kind of a light touch um, uh, regulation, recognizing the specialty of the digital uh, economy, digital platforms, but at the same time not heavy handedly um, regulating it as perhaps uh, the case here. Great, let's try to answer both questions uh, simultaneously. Hal, you, you were mentioned. Well, I've heard of this network effect thing. <laughs> In fact, I wrote a book about it, so. <laughs> 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 I, I, I would say uh, there are cases where you see technology which is a natural monopoly of one form or another. They're much rarer than one would think. If you look at supermarket chains, remember the important part was they had a chain of markets that could serve the entire U.S. just by replicating what they'd done in the previous city. Uh, do the same thing here. Walmart's another e example. So this isn't just limited to the digital world. And, and I think we should have an explanation of just how it is that five companies, not even an industry, just five companies are uh, required to behave in certain ways because uh, it is felt at the FTC, for example, or the DOJ, that there's something wrong with this happening. You want those economies of scale. That's how they're able to make cheaper products. That's how they're able to compete effectively uh, because of the benefits that are there from the, from the economies of scale. Remember, it's not just the U.S., but it's the entire world that you're looking at. And certainly there's room for many different retailers when you look at the entire world, online retailers. And I think that you're continuing to see that these markets are incredibly dynamic. I would say that the consumer welfare standard is very adaptive to a wide range of industries and can take into consideration new technologies, including the digital market. But one of the things I think about are the threshold requirements in Senator Klobuchar's bill. So depending on the day, Facebook, also known as Meta, is very close to dropping under those or may be under it depending on the particular day, while Walmart is continuing to grow to a point where within a few years it could very easily be covered by it. I, I will say quickly, I'm uh, aware we're sort of running out of time uh, uh, to respond to the, the political system question, or at least my my view on, on it is um, I think go in the United States regulatory system, Going to court is how we get, the agencies have a case against every single one of these companies in federal court right now. I bet you they win one or two of them. Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't under, it fails, uh, it escapes me um, what other than the time of going to court, uh, the sort of delay, the, the court system is slow, uh, what the advantages are to some alternative relative to going to court, if you've got a competitive problem, you go to court and if you can prove it's harmful, you will win. Uh, we have 50 states that have sued virtually every one of these five companies and two, brand, two parts of the federal government that are right now in federal court uh, at various stages of litigation trying to address what they perceive as problems. They will go and they will try to prevent, uh, present evidence in front of an Article III judge where they win most of the time. Uh, they, they might win some of those cases, they might lose some of those, those cases, but I will take that on both speed, efficiency, and accuracy, and sort of a healthier way to travel to the next equilibrium. It's longer, and it's a little messier, um, but I think it gets us uh, in a healthier way that's more friendly to innovation um, than regulation is. Right. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. We have many questions uh, from the audience here and even online. Uh, perhaps just one word before Ovid, sort of like a giveaway. Uh, what would you uh, wish for this Congress, the next Congress, to do uh, in order to limit the antitrust populism? Like, if you have one advice to policymakers, what would it be in, in few seconds? Oh, I can do this quickly. Enshrine the consumer welfare standard into statute so that it's no longer common law. 
do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure your analysis uh, is uh, based on real data and real information. Great. Thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, Thank you. Ten minute coffee break. Yeah. Thank you. That was, that was great. Great job.
Okay. I think everyone uh, will get started on the next panel. So hello everybody, uh, thank you for joining us here and online. Uh, my name is Scott Linsicum and I'm the Director of General Economics and Trade at the Cato Institute here. Um, this hour's panel is called Resisting the Protectionist Tide. Um, as the title implies, uh, free trade is uh, under attack today. Um, greater attack, in my opinion, than it has been in decades, especially but not only, and certainly not only in the United States. Uh, despite continued public support for foreign trade and globalization generally, even during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a bipartisan cadre of politicians, pundits, and wonks is increasingly skeptical of the long-standing consensus in favor of trade liberalization. The U.S. government, in particular, has downplayed open markets in favor of national security, economic resilience, and the people and communities left behind by our modern and globalized world. An official's nationalist rhetoric has been backed by action, such as the Biden administration's reluctance to remove former President Trump's tariffs on steel aluminum and imports from China, uh, the Biden administration's refusal to pursue new trade agreements, and its championing of several new economic nationalist industrial policy initiatives on things like semiconductors and environmental goods. Now these moves, along with pandemic-related supply chain snarls, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, creeping protectionism abroad and in other countries, and the continued impotence of the World Trade Organization have signaled to many that an era of deglobalization is upon us. In my view, as I've written a lot, and some of you probably know, uh, I think the current skepticism of free trade and globalization remains very misguided, even as its justifications and the global economy have, have changed, often dramatically. In particular, academic literature and recent experience continue to provide strong economic, geopolitical, and yes, moral support for free trade in the multilateral trading system. There's also little concrete sign that the world, so far at least, is really deglobalizing through trade and supply chains, as well as the rules under which they operate. Now, those things are changing, but there are a lot of other ways globalization has actually increased in the last few years. A digital trade, in particular, has su exploded. Supply chains, they're changing, yes. They're more shifting than they are coming home, though there is certainly some of that, too. We're really more re-globalizing than de-globalizing. So I think the death of globalization is exaggerated. But trade policy, again, particularly in the United States, but not only here, remains in a rough spot, a very rough spot right now. And to discuss why and how we escape that spot, I'm really happy to be joined by three top thinkers on the subject. And uh, I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll speak today. First. Adam Posen, at the far end, is president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He's contributed to research and public policy regarding monetary and fiscal policies in the G20, the challenges of European integration since the adoption of Euro, Brexit, China, U.S. economic relations, and developing new approaches to financial recovery and stability. Next is Susan Hausman, vice president and director of research at the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. She chairs and co-directs several programs on labor and economics, too many to list right now, but inc this includes two Sloan Foundation-funded research projects on measurement challenges arising from the growth of, global growth of globalization. I mention these because those projects are where much of her uh, presentation today comes from. Last but certainly not least is Arvind Panagaria, professor of economics and Indian political economy at Columbia University. Arvin has offered numerous books on international economics, including one of my recent favorites, Free Trade and Prosperity, How Openness Helps Developing Countries Go Richer and Combat, Combat Poverty. So each panelist will speak for five minutes, and then we'll have a couple minutes of discussion, and then we'll open it up to your questions and to the questions of those online. Um, so with that out of the way, I'll now turn it over to Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And thanks to Brian Moore, who organized this conference, which is 
filled with distinguished speakers, including your two colleagues on my right, um, and to Cato for hosting this. I think uh, under the title of this conference, there are almost no places where left and right have come together as much as they have on anti-trade. Um, and I think in the US as perniciously as anywhere. Um, and the idea that is out there and has been taken over the mindset of the Biden administration is the idea that workers got a terrible deal uh, from the opening of China into world economy, globalization more broadly, and therefore we need a completely different so-called worker-centric trade policy, which consists of protectionism, industrial policies, subsidies to large corporations, restrictions on things like the Jones Act, and so on. Um, I'm going to spend my remaining four and a half minutes talking about a particular angle on this rather than rehashing all the evidence-based uh, facts about trade that Scott and I and others at Cato and Peterson Institute and many other places have gone through through the years. What I particularly want to point out is a perversion of the sense of manufacturing decline in this country that is being used as the leading political force to promote anti-trade views. And um, this, I wrote about this in Foreign Affairs in an article a little while ago called The, the, Cost, the Price of Nostalgia. And we've done some additional work at the Pearson Institute on our website, which Scott, with his amazing Twitter following, has been kind enough to promote at times. But th the main point is, um, I'm sure I'm going to piss off both of us to go left and right, so I apologize. Um, that the fetish for manufacturing is part of the general fetish for keeping white males of low education um, outside the cities in the powerful positions they're in in the US. And um, that is really what's going on here. Because when you look at the costs of manufacturing, and Susan Hausman and her co-authors have done a lot, of, not of manufacturing, but trade, and job displacement and community, Susan Hausman and her co-authors have done a lot of work on this, and I'm sure she'll have a different view than I do. But when I look at the co so-called costs of the China shock or the costs of the decline in manufacturing, I always think compared to what? For decades, there was enormous, enormous displacement of African Americans in this economy. Every time there was a recession, African American unemployment rates shot up much faster and higher than white people. Single women were methodically excluded from the workforce, and, and especially if they became parents, or ghettoed in particular sets of jobs throughout the economy well through the 70s into the 80s. Um, displacements on large scales would happen when technology or trade broke through, like all the secretaries who got replaced by personal computers and other forms of office animation. Uh, excuse me, not animation, automation, excuse me. Um, and these kinds of churn, as the economists put it, never were decried. They never got political attention. They never got much notice. But when it started being the white male manufacturing people in the so-called heartland, which by definition was not urban, um, then suddenly this was a crisis. And when you look at the scale of this, whatever the pain for individual people, we must remember that even at its peak, uh, manufacturing employment was well under 20% workforce and has declined a lot since then. Um, and even at its peak, um, Otto Dorn and Hansen come up with an estimate of additional manufacturing jobs lost by the uh, China shock. And there's various debates as to whether that's an overestimate and whether the, that takes into account offsetting job creation. But let's take that number at face value. That's 2 million jobs over a 15-year period. Two million jobs divided by 15 years is, what is that, 150,000, 160,000 jobs a year in a workforce that is now currently 160 million. So a tenth of a percent per year of the total US workforce. And 
Meanwhile, millions, tens of millions of people every year lose their jobs and involuntarily into the churn of companies. So the idea that the manufacturing tail should wag the economic dog, even as a social justice matter, strikes me as very odd. And then you can say, well, there were good jobs in manufacturing for women and people of color. Well, for a period there were, but once manufacturing started contracting, largely because of the seniority rules at place in these unionized workforces, um, African Americans, Latino Americans, and women reduced their share of the manufacturing workforce as the manufacturing workforce shrunk. They were the first to go. Again, it's not universal, but if you look at the percentage of manufacturing workers who were black or Latino or female, over time, it goes down. Moreover, it goes down even as the number of Latino Americans rises in this economy, and even as the number of Latino Americans as a share of workers who are less than high school educated or high school educated goes up. We also have this question of why in the US do we, is it such an issue? You know, people will say, well, it's because Germany and Japan cheated like China before them and they maintained their, their manufacturing. Well, actually that's not even true either. Um, as my colleague Robert Lawrence has documented, as others have pointed out, um, as a percentage of the workforce in these countries, there's essentially the same slope decline of manufacturing working in the economy for Germany and Japan, even though they're running huge manufacturing trade surpluses over this period, even though Germany is exporting huge amounts to China for much of the so-called China shock period. I, last time I testified before Congress, before a congressional committee, I put together just because I knew there was a person from, a representative from Ohio who's been trying to protect industry since the late 60s, um, who's, who believes that any decline in manufacturing employment since 1968 must be the result of cheating by foreigners. Anyway, so I, I did a comparison of Nordrhein-Westfalen uh, which is the industrial heartland of Germany and is basically their equivalent of Ohio. And despite all the trade surpluses, Nordrhein-Westfalen lost more jobs in manufacturing proportionally than Ohio did. Why do I go through so much on manufacturing? And I'll stop there in one minute. Um, I go so much through manufacturing because clearly this becomes the macho image that Joe Biden, a self-professed car guy, gets into. Rob, Robert Lighthizer and Donald Trump, who never met a service export that they cared about, only about things that they can drop on their feet. There's just this imagery of steel and cars, and all these macho things. And it's just such a shame when these people can't live in exactly the same place they always did and do exactly the same job they always did. Whereas, of course, by the millions, Americans, particularly female Americans, particularly people of color, but all kinds of Americans have been moving around the country, have been changing jobs, and don't have the macho advertising that gets the politicians in their hearts. And so this is why I think we have to be realistic in both international comparison and in distributional terms about manufacturing and get rid of the nostalgia for it. Because once you do that, then the political lobby for protectionism has lost its best red flag waving argument, both left and right. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Next. You're next, Susan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Scott, uh, Ryan, and, uh, and Adam for setting me up <laughs> on, this, on this debate. But I'm going to spend my introductory remarks really focusing on how we got here. What were the underlying sources of uh, the erosion for free trade? And I don't think anybody on this stage, um, I'm sure nobody on this stage, uh, uh, questions the notion that uh, open, openness to trade, uh, on balance at least, uh, generally results in good things and is efficient. But how did we get here? Okay, 
Um, these are levels of manufactured employment since, uh, since World War II, okay? World War II to the, to the present, what you can see is that manufactured employment rose at first, then it bounced along, it's highly cyclical. Uh, but we get to roughly 1998 and it drops off a cliff. Between 2000 and 2007, both business cycle peaks, U.S. manufacturing employment lost 3. Point million jobs or 20% of its employment base. This is the first time in U.S. history that manufacturing employment did not recover or at least largely recover following a recession. It is unprecedented and it was precipitous. Many people refer, refer to this as the employment collapse in manufacturing. We get to the uh, Great Recession in uh, 2008. Manufacturing employment is hard hit again. Um, there has been some recovery, but on net, uh, manufacturing is down. Manufacturing employment is down by about 5 million jobs or 28% since 2000. It's also worth uh, bearing in mind that there, much of manufacturing employment is contracted out or it is, uh, there's a lot of services input. So this isn't counting. If you look at the input output tables, roughly double these numbers in terms of their impacts. Okay. So uh, that's where we were. It's uh, misleading to look at employment shares, I will argue. Look at the levels. Other countries, for the most part, except for perhaps the UK, did not experience this precipitous decline in such a short period of time. Okay. So what were the initial prevailing views? They largely uh, matched what Adam just said. Um, but particularly, um, lots of people uh, uh, pointed to uh, statistics, um, uh, official statistics on manufacturing. The graph below shows, compares real GDP in manufacturing to that in private sector. And what you can see is, is that uh, manufacturing employment, I'm uh, sorry, manufacturing GDP output was largely tracking that of the private sector. So it appeared to be quite healthy. Okay? At the same time, productivity measurement measured was much higher. So many people took these descriptive data and said that the job losses uh, were largely caused by productivity growth in the form of automation. There was some acknowledgement of trade during this period, but it was largely uh, automation. Workers were simply, as it was often said, victims of their own success. Ma Let's see. My contribution, along with that of Rob Atkinson, who, who independently was making this point a decade ago, um, was to point out that one industry, computer and electronic products, was driving the apparent robust output and productivity growth in manufacturing. If you take out computers, electronic products, this is basically, think computers and semiconductors. Um, manufacturing GDP growth was under half, it was only 45% of private sector GDP growth from 1979 to 2000. It was less than a quarter from 2000 to 2019. Manufacturing output was actually slightly lower in 2019 than in 2007. Manufacturing productivity, as uh, Martin Bailey, Barry Bosworth of Brookings Institute have uh, pointed out in a, um, uh, an academic article, uh, shown that manufacturing productivity was no higher than aggregate productivity without computers and semiconductors. So this paints a picture where it wasn't doing so great. Okay, we were, we were sort of misled on this. So, so I wanna just spend uh, 30 seconds talking about, well, well, what was happening in the superstar industry? Computers and semiconductors. It's important to note that this sector, one sector accounts for less than 15%, the entire post-war period of manufacturing GDP, so it was, but it was driving the growth of output and productivity. What was going on there? Well, it just reflects a statistical adjustment for the very uh, genuine rapid advances in produ product quality that were happening. Uh, in computers and electronic products, and by extension in all of manufacturing, the robust growth resulted from product improvements, not process improvements not from, from automation. Despite 
moreover, despite and somewhat ironically driving the apparent robust uh, domestic manufacturing output, the locus of production was moving to Asia. We all know that, and employment losses in computer and related industries reflect the shifting global locus of production. So, what do we get from that? There's no prima facie case here that, uh, uh, that you know, automation was driving or largely responsible for these uh, employment, uh, the employment collapse during this period. So let's turn very briefly to the research evidence that has pointed to large effects of trade had on manufacturing employment from the high value of the dollar during this period, the surge of imports, multinational offshoring of production, and the lack of investment in this country. It was also has been uh, shown uh, quite compellingly that trade caused large economic disruptions in uh, various regions in the country. It also has uh, resulted in, in uh, lower levels of uh, patenting and, and innovation. On the other hand, uh, the uh, rigorous research has failed to find a causal link between technology investment and, and, and employment declines during this, this period when we lost so much employment. In a nutshell, there is absolutely no evidence that a technology shock um, uh, ha could have caused the sharp employment decline, a 20% decline in employment in a seven-year period. So we go to, uh, you know, the, the 2016 ele election. Uh, interestingly, somebody on the, on, you know, the Republican, uh, Donald Trump and Dan uh, Bernie Sanders on, on the left, is arguing that uh, losses, these losses reflect trade policy. It took quite a long time for us to have a national debate on, about this. Um, no matter what you think about their politics or policies, they were fundamentally correct. And the research evidence supports it. They were fundamentally correct to point to trade as the proximate cause of these very large declines. Um, and we should take it as no surprise that there has been a political backlash um, against, uh, towards protectionism and against free trade. The manufacturing and employment collapse in the early 2000s, I know that Adam was dismissing it as some you know, white, blue-collar worker thing and so forth. Lots of, lots of uh, people <laughs> are employed in manufacturing. But you've got to appreciate that it was econ both economically and politically destabilizing. If you don't want it to, to lead in this direction, you can't have that big of a shock hit the country. Um, of course, the supply chain disruptions during the pandemic underscored U.S. vulnerabilities to trade and reinforce protectionist measures. Um, but the move, as Adam has pointed out, was long in place before this happened. So I'm just going to close um, with a couple of policy considerations as we move forward and talk about the future. Um, as I started off by saying, uh, I think most of us believe that uh, trade expansion generally is beneficial on net for the country, but we have to also recognize that, that it's not always. And that's very rigorously theoretically demonstrated, okay? Um, uh, recent theoretical work on this area has pointed to circumstances in which trade can lead to significant loss of comparative advantage, uh, what the trade uh, theorists call uh, terms of trade uh, in high-tech sectors. What we need to do uh, when we think about trade policy is to consider an optimal policy when our trading partners behave as mercantilists. Okay, we can't be the only, only ones out there uh, uh, promoting free trade. Um, I agree that it can lead to a spiral, but we need to think about controlling this. I also want to say, and this was dismiss dismissed in the earlier remarks, but the U.S. actually needs a, a, a healthy manufacturing sector to sustain innovation and a healthy economy, and also obviously, I think quite obviously, for national security reasons. Um, you often hear it said, well, we're just going to become a, a services economy. But that's a false dis di dichotomy. Okay, many services are embedded, including these uh, IT services are embedded in products. The two are linked. Moreover, um, manufacturing and research and development often need to be co-located. 
So we think that we can be brilliant here and innovate like crazy, but very often the R&D follows manufacturing. Concern over the loss of, uh, of manufacturing in this country um, led to uh, MIT, arguably the uh, nation's uh, premier engineering school, to run a multi-year study uh, about this. And their conclusion was basically that the loss of the manufacturing, what they call ecosystem, is already undermining our country's ability to innovate. So thank you, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Susan. Arvind. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks from me also to Scott Ryan, Cato Institute. Um, so I don't work so much in the United States, but more globally and particularly in the developing countries. Um, so I just want to make two or three points in the opening sure. uh, five minutes that you have given us, Scott. Um, first, I think, you know, at a very broad level, um, so truth in advertising, I'm an eternal optimist, and, and that's my first remark that's uh, 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 following from that. Um, there's a lot of this malaise on free trade, and uh, many of you must have seen uh, one of these very recent issues um, uh, in The Economist, which says how to re-globalize. And, and that really got me to thinking that, you know, have we really deglobalized so that we need to re-globalize? Certainly we are all aware that, uh, you know, certain uh, um, U.S.-China trade war happened. Uh, we also have had recently uh, the, the sanctions on Russia and so forth. But has trade really deglobalized? And at least at the aggregate level and even at this, uh, some of the specific country levels when I look at it, I don't, don't see that, you know, there has been a major uh, deglobalization, uh, certainly not in trade. Uh, when China kind of in a big way began to enter the global trade, and one can track it back to the 1980s and 1990s as well, but really the big kind of trade expansion of China is in the 2000s. So when China, you know, if you go back, look at what was global trade like in the year 2000, roughly about $6 trillion merchandise. Today, <laughs> the latest figure we have for is 2021, uh, 22 billion, uh, 22, 22 trillion dollars, so 6.5 trillion to 22 trillion dollars. And this, by the way, uh, is about three trillion dollars higher than the pre-COVID peak, uh, which was 19 trillion in 2018. So at least for the countries in general, as far as I see, uh, that uh, do want to flourish and, and take advantage uh, of uh, export-led growth. There's plenty of trade going on, and in fact, you know, it's not so easy <laughs> to stop uh, 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 from trading those who actually want to trade. Uh, uh, you know, the exporters who are determined penetrate the markets, importers who actually want the goods, they manage to find ways to do it. I mean, we all coped with uh, the difficulties of buying and s uh, selling goods during COVID, but we did all that. Uh, and and w all the predictions that had been made about, you know, the decline in uh, foreign trade uh, in uh, during COVID actually turned out to be all overestimates. It was very, sh uh, it was smaller, smaller, much smaller than what happened during the global financial crisis. Uh, and it picked up very quickly back. Uh, it rose up to the, to the pre-COVID levels very, very quickly. If you look at the countries, uh, Vietnam, you know, which uh, has been persistently opening its economy uh, over the last several years, uh, trade figures, you know, from in 2010, about $72 billion worth of exports. 2021, $336 billion. Uh, now, some of it may be, you know, diversion from China to Vietnam to other countries and all, uh, especially the United States, but still, you know, and, and certainly, you know, this, uh, this diversion would start only after, two th you know, after the U.S. sanctions on China. Um, small country like, s much smaller and poorer country like Bangladesh, you know, from 19 billion in 2010 to 44 billion in 2011. China itself, uh, uh, again, 1.6 trillion in 2010 to 3.4 trillion. So I think, you know, th though some bit of recidivism has happened uh, in trade policy in some major countries, 
on the other hand, globally, I personally think that you know, free trade is very much alive. And uh, if anything, uh, going by the numbers today, uh, uh, we, we, we are seeing a lot more trade act actually happening exposed than it was happening, say, even 10 years ago. So, so I generally remain optimistic. Uh, what has not really happened is that the free traders, and so glad actually Cato Institute is at the forefront now here. Uh, we are all talking about it, but the free traders themselves actually have been somewhat absent uh, from, uh, from uh, defending it. Uh, my second point, uh, uh, which, is, which is, and, and that will be my sec uh, last point uh, uh, that I want to make is that, again, th there is this whole issue about the industrial policy uh, that, uh, uh, and, and the, the we continue to kind of go back to the Koreas, Taiwans, uh, uh, and all during the 60s and 70s, and even now to some degree to China. Um, uh, the, the simple point really is that, you know, governments, uh, government's nature is to intervene. So whether a country doing, is doing badly or it is doing well, governments are always intervening. Uh, uh, and and, and it, it really takes a, l a lot of uh, uh, um, education to, to, uh, to, to educate the governments into withdrawing from interventions. So, so even when they have succeeded by withdrawing interventions, they go back to interventions. And, and the, my favorite example is South Korea. You know, to 1963 to 1973, there was a whole decade when Korea had very neutral policies towards foreign trade. Uh, 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 um, no industrial policy whatsoever, it grew 9 to 10%. And massive movement out of agriculture of the workforce into industry and services, uh, uh, real wages rising about 9 to 10%. Uh, and then exports as a proportion of GDP went up from like 5% to something closer to 25%. Correspondingly, of course, imports rose as well and, you know, that is the only reason, I mean, you export more so that you can import more. Uh, that's the only reason to export. Uh, and, and of course, you know, so imports also expanded. And then the government steps in and thinks that, oh, gee, you know, there are all these goods that we are importing. We can produce them at home. And that is where, you know, the heavy and chemical industry drive started in 1973. But if you look at the evidence, uh, 73 to 82 decade, growth rate actually declined by two percentage points in South Korea. Uh, from about nine to 10, it went down to about 6.9%. Uh, and, and it began to then, you know, towards the uh, uh, end of the 1970s, it began to withdraw actually from this uh, 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 industrial targeting. And lo and behold, of course, the decade that followed uh, uh, did see the growth rate actually shift again back to about nine, nine to 10%. Um, Another way to look at it is that, you know, if you look at those contemporary episodes of South Korea, Taiwan, uh, 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 Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, if you wish, um, when people say that, well, you know, South Korea really intervened and was so successful, uh, even in the 70s and, and early 80s, um, if you look at the countries that intervened less, uh, so everybody intervened. I mean, Singapore also intervened and Taiwan also intervened, but Singapore and Taiwan intervened a lot less and Hong Kong was perhaps the one which is closest to laissez-faire. But all those three countries did a lot better than South Korea. So, so the claims of industrial policy actually succeeding uh, are simply based on this association. Uh, we on the free trade side actually are uh, always held to a very high proof of, uh, a very high standard of proof that, you know, is there causation? And I think, you know, on this side, we have done a lot of work, but is there any proof at all where that uh, you can show that the, that the rising protection uh, or high levels of protection actually cause growth to happen faster? I don't think anybody has even tried to show that even as a correlation, let alone as a causation. So we, you know, on the free trade side, actually, they have done a lot of work showing the causation. I know there's a plenty of evidence, particularly in the last uh, 10 years or so, which uh, uh, addresses this issue of causation as well. Uh, on the other side, I see nothing that is there uh, which, which shows any causation. So, right, stop there. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, so before I open it up to audience uh, questions, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask one question that I'd like 
all of the panelists discussed, because I think all three hit on something here um, that I think it's really important. I want to avoid, for now, the methodological debates and stick more on the trade policy debate. Uh, Susan, you mentioned the failed trade policy. Adam, you mentioned in your foreign affairs piece and elsewhere about uh, whether trade policy can really uh, revive manufacturing, employment, and the rest. Um, and I want you to talk more about the role of trade policy in causing manufacturing employment decline. So not trade flows, but trade policy. Uh, and the ability of trade policy to somehow fix what's ailing manufacturing the economy. Let's just assume there is some economic problem here. Because but before I go over, I, again, I'll, I'll take a, a, a few points. Um, first, uh, even if you look at the China shock papers, for example, they say that the majority of China's export competitiveness came not from its entry in the World Trade Organization or permanent normal trade relations, but because China was becoming more market-oriented, lowered its own trade barriers, and uh, was just becoming uh, a, a better place to do and operate manufacturing business. Meanwhile, the United States, uh, as we at Cato love to note, uh, is not some free trade angel. Right, uh, And I'm not even talking about the Jones Act or the sugar quotas. We can talk about any, any dumping duties. We can talk about steel tariffs, plenty of subsidies, and the rest throughout the last few decades. Um, yet, and I, oh, and I should add that every presidential candidate, most members of Congress, have promised for decades to bring back manufacturing jobs to places like Youngstown, Ohio, and the rest. Right, And it just hasn't worked. Um, you look at the... China shock papers and others, and they talk less about trade policy failure and more about adjustment policy, right? Why didn't workers adjust after these trade shocks? And as Adam and Arvin have mentioned, foreign country experiences don't give us a ton of hope in somehow uh, having a massive reshoring program or uh, something like that, again, using trade policy. Um, heck, China over the last few years has lost almost 20 million manufacturing jobs, give or take. Uh, you know, the, again, these kind of global seismic things going on. So with that very leading question, I'd like to get your views on to what extent really was it trade policy causing these problems um, as opposed to other U.S. policies, as opposed to global macroeconomic phenomena, and similarly, how much can trade policy really fix any of these things? So um, please you know, feel free to chime in. <laughs> let me uh, let, let me start off. Um, when, when I said failed trade policy, I was I was uh, 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 talking about the lines of, of uh, Donald Trump and, and Bernie Sanders oh, in that okay. campaign. Um, I want to make a, a hit on a big point that I think is often lost, and that is there was a very large decline, 20% seven years, okay? That hit a lot of communities hard and there's a lot of resentment. It wasn't just ma white males. Um, and what we know from lots of research in on these sorts of things with job losses, this is my area of research, is that you know communities can absorb small losses but you get to a certain level and it creates a downward spiral and it could take a generation to recover. We, uh, uh, you know, uh, Adam's predecessor, Fred Bergsten, was writing, uh, complaining quite a lot during this period about currency manipulation. Was there some sort an exporting of unemployment? Was there something, um, you're the expert on trade policy, that we could have done? Was there a hitting back and a resistance? You know, China pegged its, uh, it, its, its currency to a very favorable exchange rate. If you're, what you're trying to do is to uh, uh, em employ a lot of unemployed people in China, that um, uh, persisted for many years, right? That should have been addressed earlier in trade policy. We, the, the, the key is not to stop globalization. Um, it is to avoid very large, sudden, disruptive shocks that are quite destabilizing, both economically and politically. 
So the one, uh, one point I'd like to make is that, after all, the adjustment does happen. I mean, I'm not so familiar, as I said, I don't study the United States, but certainly I think of Pittsburgh. Yeah. It used to be a steel town, and now it's home to health industry. And so adjustment has happened, and, and maybe, you know, in other communities and other states also, this adjustment will happen. Um, so I think that's, that's a thought that comes to me. No, no, in Pittsburgh it did happen, and in the neighboring towns it didn't. Um, and, and, and yeah, it, it, it varies. It it's often depends on whether there's but, a big university there and like, but. Sorry, no, Adam, go ahead before I. Yeah, um, so just before I reply directly, I just want to point out, in Susan's presentation and my presentation, I think Arvind's presentation was terrific and his reference to South Korea as the example, I think is, is exactly right. In Susan's presentation, my presentation, what I want to point out is we were mostly talking past each other, which I think was right. We chose to do different things. She was talking about the scale of the manufacturing job losses, and I was talking about why we shouldn't care. And then she, in her, her last slide, discussed some reasons why we should care, and at some point, I can give my views on why I don't think those reasons either are relevant or are well supported. But I want to now, returning to Scott's question, um, I want to agree very strongly with Susan that I think currency manipulation was the major problem. Um, and I think that's not trade policy per se, but it is the key policy. And, and she, I appreciate her citing my colleague, Fred Bergston, but also colleagues at Peterson, Joe Gagnon, Morris Goldstein, Nick Lardy, and even I wrote about the problems of currency manipulation and took to task repeated American administrations, both Bush and Obama administrations, who basically said, no, the State Department's right, we can't make a fuss over this. And so I completely agree with her. I think that that is a major problem. Now, I think it also, as we're seeing right now, and if you remember the graph Susan showed of actual manufacturing employment, you know, it picks back up the last couple of years. And this has happened not just because there was a recovery from COVID, which of course we all would expect, but because of various things, including industrial policy, including competitiveness, including other things. But this has happened while the dollar has been strengthening. So I, I don't want to say the dollar is everything, and I know Susan doesn't, but the scale and duration of Chinese currency manipulation in the early 2000s was to me a, a major, when we talk about mercantilism, that's the one that counted more than anything else. And I, I just want to emphasize that we're in agreement on that. The final point is I want to quote what Arvin just said, adjustment does happen. And that was kind of, that's a much pithier and more pointed way of saying what I was trying to say in, in my initial remarks. There's a certain amount of adjustment that a market economy or even a partial market economy like the US goes through. And that that adjustment had been disproportionately borne by groups other than the manufacturing sector employees. And the fact that the manufacturing sector employees now bear a larger share of the adjustment to me is not prima facie a problem. What is the issue, and I think Susan raises and others have raised, is how much you want to temper the forces of adjustment based on geographic concentration. I think that's a legitimate discussion to have. I'm at the extreme end of thinking if Pittsburgh thrives while the local towns around Pittsburgh decline, I'm, you know, I'd like to do something for those towns, but I'm actually not so sure that I want to do much for those towns because people can move. Um, I also think that there are other possibilities, and I've written about this, and many other people have written about this. You know, if we had better child care policy in this country, if we had better health care policy in this country, then people might not be so afraid to move because you're not leaving where your family or your network is may not be so dangerous for you if we had a better universal safety net. You don't have to rely on the fact that your sister is there, and so you have you can't afford daycare, and so you park your kids to, with your sister. I mean, there's a lot here to discuss, and there's a lot of views other than mine. But I do, I would like us to focus more on not so much failed trade policies, the failed exchange rate policy, specifically vis-a-vis -vis China, 
and the underprovision or the lack of uniformity in certain basic social services that make people more tied to their local areas than they might otherwise be. Okay, let's, uh, I'm gonna go to a question on Facebook real quick, and then uh, if we still have some time, we'll, we'll go to the audience for sure. Um, so the first one comes from Dave. It says, um, isn't looking at manufacturing output, uh, putting the cart before the horse, isn't manufacturing declining because of relative demand for manufacturing, that, because relative demand for manufacturing falls as we get richer? So I think this is a point that one of Adam's colleagues has made, that simply as we get rich, we tend to, we tend to consume fewer goods and more services, and that can fuel a lot of the supposed decline of manufacturing. So I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that question. Um, all I'll say is the colleague Scott kindly refers to as Robert Lawrence at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, he'll be pub he is publishing with us a monograph on this issue of what's really behind the manufacturing decline and what happened with jobs, and it'll be out in the first quarter of 2023. Yes. Add, add to that, you see, also over time, it, it, there is the trend of, you know, labor intensity of manufacturing declining. So, so on the one hand, you have this declining labor intensity uh, in manufacturing in particular, and on the other hand, you have the rising incomes, which through the income elasticity effect are pushing the demand towards services. So the manufacturing is demand is not expanding as rapidly right. as in, with incomes, but at the same time, employment per unit of manufacturing is also declining. And that's sort of, you know, in aggregate, actually, there is a decline in the employment in manufacturing. So I'll just say that there are, there are undoubtedly lots of reasons why, uh, when I showed that graph taking out, uh, you know, somewhat hard to interpret uh, 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 trends in, in, in uh, computers and semiconductors because of statistical adjustments, that it was, uh, growth was much lower. And there, there are likely many factors. One is the one that, that um, uh, the ones that were just mentioned, that uh, you know, there's a relative increase in, in purchase services. Um, another is, is that uh, 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 things were shifting overseas. That's actually not a problem. We tend to think that as goods commoditize, uh, you know, they, they will naturally shift to other countries. That's fine. We didn't have this political backlash when adjustments occurred relatively slowly. It's only when they hit uh, uh, very hard. And then, of course, there is, uh, uh, on top of all of that, there are, is uh, a, a back line of, of automation going on. So, uh, but, but that's not causing a uh, decline in, in output. That's, that's the employment. I, I, I'm, uh, I just want to put down a marker. Um, those of you who are interested can pursue it. There is a difference of opinion on how direct the mapping is between uh, rate of job loss and people's voting for anti-globalization or populist, broader populist positions. There are papers, including one that was published in Proceedings, National Academy of Sciences, more recent papers by Carolyn Freund and Marcus Nolan, among others, who show that if you put in some ideological factors like concerns about crime or race or security, that basically, in the regression, absorbs most of the impact of the local employment conditions. This isn't settled, but it's just Susan has twice asserted as fact that the uh, popular swing is directly attributable to unemployment, localized unemployment. That's actually not a proven fact. Okay. Audience. Uh, Mark Lerner, is there a national security interest here? So, for example, if all semiconductors are made in China and China decides they're not going to ship to the U.S. or I work in healthcare during a Puerto Rico flood, a lot of medicines are made in Puerto Rico. We couldn't get basic things like IV bags. So is there a national interest in having things made here? Yes, absolutely. And we see, are seeing that now in the case of Europe, heavily dependent on Russian oil. Anyone, anyone else? 
Um, I mean, some of the little things will happen. Uh, uh, countries just started producing their own masks and their own PPEs, et cetera, and, and that's also triggered by the fact that, you know, uh, in, in times of uh, pandemic, these things disappear, disappear from the global marketplace. I think the problem isn't that such an exception exists. Adam Smith, even in the Wealth of Nations, has, I forget exactly where, I'm sure there are people in this room who know where, but there's a half a chapter in which he talks about national security needs. But the tendency, as with all good things in Washington, is them to be taken to extremes. Yeah. So the issue isn't should we stockpile certain things or have capacity, it's how do we draw the line. And, you know, you can fantasize, as I sometimes do in my spare time, about a wonderful technocratic process. And, and that, of course, would probably have its own failings of multiple types. But, you know, I mean, so just let me use the example of steel. Steel is not semiconductor. Steel is not IV bags. And again, I'm not suggesting any of my colleagues are, are on this side. But, you know, the Trump administration invoked national security for steel. Yeah. And according to the Defense Department's own publications, you need roughly 4% of U.S. steel production capacity to, to fulfill the Defense Department's needs. Let's say we go on a warfare building binge to counter China, maybe we need 8%. Um, does that mean we should cut out Canada with tariffs when effectively they're part of our industrial base as the Pentagon? Again, people in this room, certainly the people in this panel, we all recognize that. I'm, I'm just using it as an example yeah. that we can all agree we need some semiconductors. We can all agree it really was a cheat and a lie to call steel a national security issue. And then the question is, how do we create a process that somehow gets us somewhere in between? Yeah, and uh, un unfortunately, we're out of a oh, week. We can do one more question. Good. I'll just add the other thing is you have to balance, uh, you need a diversity of supply, right? right? Because you have the risk of having too much of your eggs in the domestic basket. Right. And then you end up with a baby formula crisis because 98% of all baby formula consumed here was made here. One factory goes down, and the next thing you know, shelves are empty for now we're going on eight months. So you, the best approach, we Cato, at least, think is an open and flexible system and a diversified supply base. So one last question in the corner. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm curious, what do you, what, is there a solution, though, for this unabsorbed labor? It sounds like that's going to continue in the manufacturing sector. I mean, job retraining and all that doesn't really work. What do you think of universal basic income and some of those other types of concepts? Maybe I'll go first so others can have the last word. Um, I talk about this a little bit in my foreign affairs piece and some other places. Uh, the record of retraining isn't great, but there are other economies that spend a lot more on specific kinds of occupational retraining and more on matching people with jobs. Denmark is always the stellar example, but there are others. And the U.S. spends, depending how you count it, between a fifth and a tenth of what they do as a share of GDP on this. So I think there is room to improve that. Um, AEI had, I think, a very nice, well-balanced, very broad study about trade retraining and adjustment um, that came out about a year and a half ago. Um, but the other thing, just to say, along with what I said earlier, that there are interconnections that you can provide things that make it easier for people to be mobile. Um, Others at Cato have written a lot about NIMBY issues, real estate issues, li occupational licensing issues between states. There are things you can do that won't solve every problem, but can make it easier for people to move to where opportunity is or to afford housing where opportunity is or to transport their skills even within the U.S. Um, so, I mean, there are things we can do to, to make it better. I'd actually second that very much, and, and I mean, I study India, and, and where we end up doing exactly the opposite. You see, India is at, at a different level of development, and what it, it really needs is to move an enormous amount of its workforce out of agriculture into industry and services. But what does politics lead to? That there are a lot of poor people there, I want to do good for them, and therefore, I'm going to create this, you know, so we have an employment guarantee scheme which provides for every household one person getting 100 days of guaranteed employment. 
Similar other schemes, uh, don't move from there to here, but I will bring the amenities to you from the, the tax dollars or tax rupees uh, of the others in the village, right? And, and that impedes the adjustment. You know, it is true that a lot of the poor people in the short run, immediate run need help, and, and that help in the form of cash transfers, et cetera, is welcome. But policies that end up actually tying them to where they are do exactly the opposite. You know, the adjustment is actually prevented. And so I sort of have a very different uh, uh, example there uh, uh, that, that, you know, you actually want to faci facilitate the movement of the people uh, where better paid jobs uh, are available or can be created. So I just want to say that we, uh, while mobility is good and encouraging that is fine, uh, you know, social networks that people develop are really important. And uh, you don't want to completely disrupt that and just give people uh, money for bus tickets to go someplace else. Um, the, uh, I want to call out in just a, a 30 seconds a, a proposal that was actually adopted as part of the uh, put forward by my colleague Tim Bardick at the Upjohn Institute uh, that was adopted as part of the CHIPS Act. It's a pilot program that specifically targets um, uh, distressed communities and tries to improve conditions uh, there. Uh, largely, he advocates through infrastructure, training, and the like. And, uh, but, but I absolutely agree with uh, you know, some of the points that, that Adam made, that you have to be careful about politics getting you know, into things, and there can be inefficiencies. You want to uh, very rigorously evaluate these things. But yes, there is also scope for um, sound economic de pol uh, development policy, much as we did with the Tennessee Valley uh, Authority and uh, Appalachia in the past, that were you know, generally agreed to be quite effective uh, today because some communities were very much left behind. Thank you. So uh, I'll just close with one uh, plug. We actually have a, I have a book coming out in a, about, uh, in a few weeks on uh, all sorts of policies that can help American workers, particularly with adjustment on licensing, housing, criminal justice, uh, you name it. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but back to the panel. Thank you so much for a, a wonderful conversation. Thank you.
Okay. Hello. I think we're ready to get started with the next panel. And this is too far. Can I take this out? It's going to drive me nuts. There we go. Hello, everyone. I know we didn't have much time for a break, but if we could kind of come back into the room, we're going to get started with our next panel. My name is Emily Eakins, and I'm a vice president and the director of polling here at the Cato Institute. And it's a pleasure to join you this morning um, for our next panel that I will be moderating, the politicization of business, what gives. To discuss this important topic, I am joined um, by the following panelists. I'll get started with Elizabeth Kemp. Elizabeth is an associate professor of finance at Harvard Business School. Her research, um, she researches the intersection of political economy and empirical corporate finance, and specifically the role of political partisanship and ideology in finance. Prior to joining HBS, she was a professor at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and she holds a PhD in finance from Tilburg University in the Netherlands. I'm also joined by Robert Atkinson. He's the president and founder of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Before starting ITIF, Dr. Atkinson was a vice president of the Progressive Policy Institute and the director of PPI's Technology and New Economy Project. He has previously worked in the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations, and he received a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We're also joined by Matthew Mitchell. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Economic Freedom and at the Fraser Institute, and a senior research affiliate at the Nee Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation at WVU. And his research focuses on public choice economics and the economics of government favoritism. And he received his PhD in economics from George Mason University. So we've got a panel of doctors. <laughs> You have to trust what they say. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the time over to each of our panelists for about five minutes or so of opening remarks. I think it would make sense for Elizabeth to begin um, to outline what we know about political polarization in the boardroom and in the private sector and what's driving it. And then next we'll hear from Rob and Matt um, to outline their thoughts on the intersection of business and politics. So I'll turn the time over to you, Elizabeth, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Emily, and also to Ryan for inviting me to be on this panel. So yeah, I wanted to use the five or so minutes that I have to um, share with you what we know on the research uh, side about how politics has been uh, entering the realm of business. I want to you know, be clear, this is a very young and emerging literature, so there's a lot that we don't yet know and a lot that's uh, still to be studied. Um, but I really wanted to highlight three main um, facts. Uh, the one is that political partisanship um, divides uh, people not just in terms of their positions on uh, spe specific policies, but also in how they view the economy. Um, and here you see a graph from a, a, a poor research uh, survey that I think shows this um, pretty nicely, where you see that your alignment with a president actually has a strong influence on how optimistic uh, you are about the economy. Um, Republicans tend to be more optimistic when a Republican president is in power, and the opposite uh, is, uh, is true with Democrats being more optimistic when a Democratic president is in power. Now, what we've seen on, in uh, recent years is a literature emerging that shows that we see this not just for the average American, this is kind of what, what this graph here shows, but increasingly we see this partisan perception of the economy also among decision, important decision makers in business and finance, uh, including financial analysts, fund managers, um, entrepreneurs, loan officers. And we are also um, starting to see that these decisions actually can matter, or these partisan biases can uh, affect these economic decisions that in turn move prices and can actually lead to uh, misallocation of capital. And then of course, more recently, we see um, a growing partisan gap in views on, for example, inflation, the risk posed by the pandemic. So essentially, topics that maybe we wouldn't have perceived necessarily as political, a uh, couple years, a couple decades ago, now are increasingly uh, 
uh, uh, dividing us. The second thing I want to highlight is the rise in corporate political speech. And that is probably matches the perception that a lot of you uh, might have, but it turns out it's actually very difficult to measure. Um, and so this is actually a graph from an ongoing research project that we're hope, hoping to circulate in a couple of weeks. Um, where we looked at corporate tweets and just um, measured how similar do the tweets that companies um, put out there in the world sound relative to tweets sent by politicians. And what you can see there is uh, towards the end of 2017, there's a clear increase overall in uh, corporate political speech, meaning that companies start to sound more like uh, politicians. Before that, they actually on average tended to sound more like uh, Republicans, which might not be so surprising. There's a, a lot of the topics um, that were covered were things like support of free trade agreements, tax reforms, and so forth. Um, but after 2017, uh, we see a strong increase in particular on um, tweets that are supporting uh, demo, uh, the, the democratic agenda, in particular uh, in 2020, an increase in uh, the, uh, the statements made about uh, racial injustice um, and, and equality. I think what's still very much an open question, and so this is where I would love to hear you know, the, the views of my uh, fellow panelists and, and people in, in the audience, is um, what exactly drove this um, uh, uh, change, and is this uh, just individuals advancing their personal uh, political agenda, or is this companies responding to the polarization that's happening in the society around them? So is this companies um, catering to, um, they are you know, trying to attract employees who expect them to take a position on, on certain issues, or investors who, you know, have, um, uh, in addition to financial uh, returns, uh, care about the positions that the companies they invest in uh, take. And so um, this is very much uh, an, an, open, uh, uh, an open question still. The third fact I want to highlight is that we also seen uh, an increase in um, increasingly political silos in corporate America. So uh, increasingly companies that are led by all Republican, all uh, Democratic uh, teams um, here, the graph uh, that I'm showing shows you the importance of shared political affiliation in predicting which firm's executives uh, uh, work for. So do they work in the same firm? And also here, it's actually quite um, uh, uh, surprising how, how well it lines up with a previous graph. It's also in 2017 that we start to see uh, an increased importance of shared po uh, political affiliation. So essentially this increased um, uh, homogeneity, which suggests that, you know, maybe this, the, the fact that now political uh, issues are being discussed uh, ha or companies are, uh, are discussing these uh, among their top leadership uh, team kind of leads to this uh, political, uh, political segregation. I also want to emphasize that a, a big part of that actually is a geographical component. So that means companies and uh, Texas, Ohio becoming more uh, uh, Republican companies in California, New York becoming more Democrat, which is a trend that if I had to make a prediction, you know, post uh, recent decision on, on Roe v. Wade, would, you know, I would expect this to continue. And then the last thing um, that we did in that study was to try to get a sense of, okay, is this trend towards more, towards more homogeneous team a good thing? Is it in the financial interest of the firm? And um, we looked at stock price reactions to uh, executive turnovers there, and they actually suggest that this trend towards more homogeneity is actually not in the financial interest of, uh, of shareholders. So in particular, losing executives that bring a different political viewpoint to the, to the firm is actually destructive uh, to firm value. So I'll, I'll stop here and um, you know, look forward to, uh, to the thoughts of uh, Rob and uh, Matt. Uh, thank you, Emily. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. The only thing worth noting on my resume, which <coughs> you didn't note, is uh, I'm the author of a book called Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business. And uh, I don't think you can buy it at a small bookstore. Only, only Amazon <laughs> sells it, so uh, they hate it. Um, so I found your uh, comments very, very interesting. I'd I'm looking forward to learning more about your research. But I think at one level we should be 
asking the question, not why is business politicized, but what took so long? I mean, everything is politicized now in America, everything. My favorite sport, the NBA, is now politicized. Uh, I can hardly watch the game sometimes. And NFL is politicized. So everything's politicized. So the idea that somehow this massive part of our economy, of our society and business, wouldn't be politicized, I think it's a thing. So there's forces on both sides of, that are doing that. Um, and on the progressive side, you have to ask why. Because the progressive side is really the bigger engine of politicization of business. They really want to politicize business. And the answer, question is why. And the short answer is the left knows it can't get what it wants through Congress because of the, because of the filibuster. They're not going to get 60 senators. So they basically have a strategy, and the strategy is twofold. One is to use antitrust, which I, my colleague Aurelian uh, Portus talked about this morning. All you need to do in, in, is get a, get a president who wants to break up companies, and off you go. But the second thing they want to do is they want to put pressure on companies to achieve their agenda whether that is a social agenda, a racial agenda, a uh, gender agenda, climate agenda, trade agenda, you name it. So the progressives have decided that they're going to be able to accomplish a lot of their goals through business being their uh, agent, if you will. Uh, now, what's ironic about that, I, I recently wrote a piece called The Emergence of Anti-Corporate Progressivism. On the one hand, they love corporations because they can force them to do what they want. They're not going to go to the local bike store that I shop in in Bethesda and picket that because it's a little deeny little bike store. Who cares? They are going to go after Amazon or Exxon or Citibank or whatever. Those are big, visible things. So at one level, they love big corporations because they're pliable and they can force them to do what they want. On the other hand, they hate corporations because they see them as just totally antithetical to the world they want to live in, which is everybody working at a worker-owned co-op that has 12 people and they all wear Birkenstocks. So business now has a choice. Okay, what do I do? I could side with the progressives, uh, and if I do that, um, I probably am not going to lose a lot of support from conservative consumers. Uh, and uh, if I don't side with progressives, they're going to come at me. They're going to pick at me. They're going to have stockholder meetings. They're going to do everything possible to make my corporation look bad. And if I'm the CEO, that's the last thing I want. Um, now, why do they want to do that? Well, one of the reasons they want to do it is that a big share of their customer base are liberals. So if you think about that, um, people with a bachelor's degree earn 75% more over the course of their lifetime than people with a high school degree. So that's a lot of money. And when you look at uh, when you look at the Pew polling of uh, Democrat, uh, sorry, college educated versus non college educated, college educated people are much much more liberal than non college educated people, and not only that, but much more consistently than Republicans. Republicans, uh, conservatives, and uh, in, in, you know, non college educated, they're like they're liberal on maybe one thing and a little conservative on another, and mixed on that. Liberals tend to be liberal, 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 liberal. So they're motivated, they're energized, and they're consistent. 54% of graduate students are liberal now. 12% of people with high school are liberal. So if you're a company, um, you're like, hey, I don't, I don't want to alienate these valuable consumers who actually think about before they buy something. Like, if you talk to the average working class person in America, hey, when you go into a store and you're trying to decide between haagen and Ben and & Jerry's, do you care what their politics are? And the average working class person would go, no, I just happen to like Chunky Monkey. Mm -hmm. And it's a good price. Actually, they probably don't eat Chunky Monkey, but whatever. Mm -hmm. So not only that, their customer base they want to appeal to, and that drives them to be, take more liberal positions, but they're knowledge workers. They're the most valuable workers that companies have are knowledge workers. You can replace your mail clerk uh, or your janitor and not worry too much about it. But if your knowledge workers start to go on strike because they happen to not like a position you take, you know, you get in big trouble. 98% of Netflix employee donations were to Democrats. 90% of IBM corp uh, donations by employees were to Democrats. So they know that if they want to keep their employee base happy, they have to at least signal that they're going along this line. Let's say a couple more quick things. The other thing, and this maybe Elizabeth, I don't know if you've gotten into this or not, but 
um, there are all of this, all of this now is being driven in part by the finance sector, where the finance sector is signaling, I make $180 billion, but it's okay because I like green economy, so don't worry about that $180 billion over here. Just realize I'm doing good things for gender, race, and, and the climate. So the finance world, if you will, rather than have people focus on the old populism, which was rich people versus non-rich people, they're inoculating themselves by doing all of this um, uh, corporate social responsibility. Great case in point is the UN Principles for Responsible Investing. I don't know why the UN is doing this, but 5,000 members, 5,000 financiers, members, including BlackRock, and here's what they say on their website, that when companies are investing, I'm sorry, when, yeah, when these investors are, are deciding which stocks to pick, who are you gonna punish, who are you gonna reward in the market, they say, quote, consideration of equity and inclusion alongside diversity is needed to ensure not just equal opportunity. Okay, I'm fine with that, we're all good with that. Equal opportunity, but then they say, but also equal outcomes for all people. So that's a pretty radical statement, really radical statement when you think about it, and that is what BlackRock now has committed itself to. Uh, BlackRock and, and these others have also decided that investors should focus on tax fairness, particularly with the operation of digital platform companies. So now they're gonna basically say what? That they want the Europeans to tax American companies? So that's another big reason. You have these investment communities that see this as a low cost way of signaling virtue. And then if you're a CEO and you don't go along with that, they're gonna sell, give you a sell signal, not a buy signal. So you have all three of those things together. You have the customer base, you have the worker base, and now you have the investor base. Now on the Republican side, and I'll just wrap up, um, Republicans sort of historically were for corporations but now they don't want to do that anymore because it makes them look like country club Republicans who are out of touch. So you had Paul Ryan, for example, write an op-ed, which I don't know, maybe Fortune picked the title for it, but the title was Down With Big Business. When you're the Republican leader in the House and you write, a, you write an op-ed, Down With Big Business, what has happened to the Republican Party? And one of the points that I wrote in Big is Beautiful is that politicians and policy should be size neutral. It shouldn't be up with small and down with big or up, down with small and up with big. It just be everybody's equal. And then you had the Trump notion that these companies aren't really loyal and so there's this sense. All right, so what do we do? Um, I'm pretty pessimistic that we can do anything really. Um, ideally, if corporations are smart, which I understand why they're not always, um, and smart in the long run would be to work collectively together to just de-escalate because at the end of the day, this is fundamentally gonna backfire one way or the other. Either the Democrats are gonna be completely pissed off at them, or the Republicans are gonna be mad. I mean, Mitch McConnell recently said that. Uh, he said, my warning, if you will, to cooperate to corporate America is to stay out of politics. So McConnell's saying, if the Republicans get in power and the companies keep doing this, there's gonna be a consequence. So companies, I think, have gone too far and uh, they really need to sort of figure out a way to de-escalate and be able to go out and buy haagen Doss or Ben and Jerry's without thinking about politics and thinking principally about ice cream and value. So, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to uh, Emily and to the fellow panelists and to Ryan for uh, inviting me here. I'm delighted to have this uh, opportunity to chat with you all. Uh, so I thought I might frame it in terms of three um, maybe mutually exclusive views on the, on the matter. Um, the, the first is a little bit contrarian. Um, the second is perhaps obvious. And then um, the third is maybe provocative. So the contrarian uh, view of it um, is not all that different from Rob's, which is kind of, you know, why did, what, what took him so long? And my point here is that, you know, business is a uh, profoundly, you know, important in cultural 
uh, aspect of humanity, right? Uh, so this is something that um, Deidre McCloskey has been writing quite a, quite a bit about in recent years. Uh, uh, my colleague Virgil Storr also talks about this. Uh, you know, if you go back to the Greek idea of catalaxy, it's the, which is the, the Greek word for economy, um, it is the process by which strangers become f uh, friends through exchange. And so for thousands of years, people have uh, made their identities part of their business. You know, uh, businesses, merchants have been um, making their religion, their culture, their um, ethnicity, their nationality a part of their, their uh, business identity. And so it sort of seems um, totally natural that they might do this uh, in terms of business. Uh, in terms of politics. Uh, it, increasingly, it makes sense that they might do this as we tend to uh, identify more uh, through our politics. And you know, there's, there's a large bit of uh, social science research suggesting that people are less inclined to identify themselves in terms of their race or their religion, but they're more inclined to identify themselves in terms of their politics. Um, and so it, it if you think of a business as a bundle, you know, you, you go into Ben and Jerry's, since 1978, uh, progressives could shop at Ben and Jerry's and get uh, Chunky Monkey and also be able to sort of indulge a little bit of their uh, political beliefs. It doesn't seem particularly uh, surprising that that might happen. You can also imagine, however, um, if, if to the extent that this is the explanation, we can have some testable hypotheses, which it would be there is a reason not to get political, which is you don't want to alienate, you know, at least half of your, your customer base, right? And so why would some firms get more political and other firms get less? Well, based on this model, that this just sort of obvious model of uh, the bundling, um, you would imagine firms whose products are less elastically demanded or who have a little bit more uh, market power are gonna be more inclined to get political. Um, but the other thing that you're gonna, you might uh, guess here, and I think it's gonna be true for uh, all these explanations, is that once firms get political, there's gonna be a tipping point and they're gonna tend to stay that way. So uh, you could think about you know, Hobby Lobby or Chick-fil-A. You know, once you're, you're branded as uh, being the, the uh, Republican uh, brand, you might as well just go with it because uh, now you're gonna, now, now you're, you've indulged that. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the obvious one, uh, or that's sort of the, the contrarian view, which is maybe this isn't a big deal. Uh, the second perspective uh, is maybe obvious, but it is important and worth saying, which is the role of technology and particularly social media. So um, not so long ago on um, social media, somebody said, when did everything become about everything? And I thought, you know, that's actually a pretty good view of our world today. Um, and the basic idea here is that the difference, you know, the uh, once large gap between public and private no longer exists. So now potentially any activity um, that any of us engages in, anything we say, any walk through the park could be turned into something that is, that can be seen by millions of other people. And so therefore our private beliefs about politics uh, now have to be, now are, are public. And so again, um, it sort of makes sense through that first uh, view, the contrarian view that um, uh, ho-hum, maybe this isn't anything unusual, is that of course firms are gonna start indul indulging this. Uh, an important part about politics, uh, Brian Kaplan is here, and so uh, you know, I have to, I have to uh, um, plug his work, is the idea that uh, politics is increasingly about show, and it's increasingly about indulging in sort of your irrational um, beliefs, because it's not, and, and even though we have this perception that politics is about trying to change uh, policy, it's, um, it's especially when you you, you uh, combine it with social media, it's really about indulging, um, you know, whatever irrational beliefs you have. Um, and so that's, I think, a, a part of it. And then the final point I wanna make, which is maybe slightly more provocative, is that um, maybe this isn't the politicization of business, but it's the business, businessification of politics. We'll have to work on the, uh, uh, that phrase. But the basic idea here is that um, firms get political because policymakers uh, get into business. And so, um, for this, we need a little background. Go back to 1967. Um, Gordon Tulloch uh, suggests uh, this idea of rent-seeking, that if uh, uh, 
policymakers are handing out favors to particular firms or industries, then those firms or industries are gonna invest uh, scarce resources seeking that, those favors. Uh, a few years later, Fred McChesney adds to the idea and says, well, okay, it's not just about uh, people expending scarce resources seeking favors, it's also about policymakers threatening punishment or threatening pain. This is called rent extraction, and firms are gonna invest scarce resources uh, trying to avoid being um, preyed upon. Uh, okay, so Tulloch introduces this idea, and then a few years later, I, this is one of the things I, I've, I've always admired about him, it's, it's you know, the idea for which he is the most, most famous is rent seeking, and then a few years later, he then kind of basically has a series of papers in which he says, why is rent seeking not a big deal? You know, essentially kind of uh, de-emphasizing his greatest contribution. And his, his question is, it's known as the, the Tulloch paradox, is if you can get so much from uh, politics, why do firms invest so little time in it? And empirically, it does seem to be that firms don't spend that much uh, effort lobbying. Why? One way to resolve this is that lobbying is an obvious way to see firms' political activity but politicization is a less obvious, less measurable way, but it is also rent seeking. So if a, a, a one valuable asset that a firm could give to a politician who might be handing out per, uh, favors or privileges is um, politi politically useful statements, right? So if this is what's driving the phenomenon, then what we would be, uh, be wondering is around 2008 or so when you see uh, businesses get more political uh, was uh, the business, businessification of, of politics happening around that time. Were, were, was politics, were, business, uh, were policymakers more interested in getting involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of businesses? You would also guess uh, through this hypothesis that the uh, firms or industries where there is a lot more government involvement would tend to be a, little, a, a lot more political. Um, so, and you would also guess that the more contestable is the uh, favor or disfavor, then you're gonna see more um, politi politicization. And so by that I mean, imagine a firm that's just everybody loves. Let's say, I, I'm, I think this is roughly true, both left and right love Boeing, right? And both left and right are gonna give a lot of, lot of money to Boeing. Um, if, that's, if, if that doesn't fit your priors, pick another, another firm that's, that's uh, bipartisanly popular. But um, if the, to the extent that that's the case, you wouldn't necessarily expect all that much political uh, posturing by Boeing. It's more contestable in, um, markets for favor where you would guess uh, there's gonna be a lot more uh, investment in, the, in that type of language. So those are my three views. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure which one is right, but I, I think that that's a nice, uh, a helpful way to frame it is, um, you know, basically inconsistent with, consistent with Bob's, or Rob's point is, you know, what took them so long? Um, I think technology has something to do with it, and then I think also it's the reverse phenomenon of, of politics getting involved in business that may be uh, just as explanatory as business getting involved in politics. So that was very interesting. And I think that we've kind of addressed a lot of the, the different explanations for why. But I do want to ask a couple little follow-up questions to that end. Um, the kind of the why is this happening, but why now? And why, in particular, given um, Elizabeth's, your research, that shows that this might be bad for the bottom line, that this could be harmful for businesses? Because a common argument that's made is the reason businesses go along with you know, some campaign on Twitter to do something is that they have to or they will, you know, their profits will suffer. But it seems like perhaps, well, so you're, you were looking more at homogeneity in the corporate board, right? So there, there might be a difference between acquiescing to a Twitter um, campaign, if you will, um, versus homogeneity. But I guess that's what I want to get into a little bit here. And if there's some disagreement, like let's talk about that, the why now and why if it might be hurting the bottom line. Yeah, so I, I actually, um, you know, I agree with uh, both with Rob and Matt that, you know, th this 
is very likely a strategic, you know, um, th there might be a strategic uh, rationale for companies to, uh, to do this. I think they've probably underestimated, you know, some of the costs that go, um, you know, with positioning themselves, uh, you know, on, on, on controversial uh, issues. And I think, um, you know, p part of that cost that, that we see is that, um, yeah, you know, it's impossible to please everybody. And so that means you might be actually struggling to retain um, talent, whether it's executive talent or, you know, um, uh, uh, other workers that would actually be a good, you know, fit for the company's uh, uh, business model, but, you know, you're losing them uh, uh, because you, you make these statements. So I think a bit um, on uh, the, the town side, these might be costs that have been underestimated. And then in my view, actually, the uh, one of the risks um, really came up is actually uh, the risk that lawmakers would actually retaliate, um, which I think is, uh, is you know, we, we're starting to see, and I think that is uh, also an, another cost that, you know, why businesses might actually realize that, um, you know, may, maybe they're, uh, they're pushing this direction too far. That is at least, you know, in my conversations that I've had with managers is that they're starting to realize a bit that the idea of, um, yeah, bringing, encouraging everybody to bring their whole self to work can actually, you know, uh, be challenging um, if, you know, and that there can be some um, um, benefits from just focusing on the, the product that you deliver um, and, and the ideas that you're selling. Thank you. I think another reason which, um, you know, so if you're an economist, you think about businesses from a, they're, they're rational, uh, and, and if you're in business administration, you understand they're not rational because they're, they're people. And I think one of the things that's happened, a colleague of mine was talking uh, to, uh, I won't say who it was, you would all know his name if I mentioned, a very important leading journalist. And, uh, and my colleague said something modestly okay, that Trump had done something modestly okay. My f colleague is not a Trumpian supporter, but you know he's a rational person, and of course the Trump administration did some good things. Um, this person, the, the journalist's reaction was basically to call my colleague a Nazi and uh, to call the Republican Party the biggest threat to the Republic ever. So this is not a person who used to be like this. I've known this person for 20 years. This is a person who became that way, and I think that. I think, uh, my guess is there are a lot of CEOs now who have drunk the Kool-Aid, and they actually believe this very hardcore stuff, and they really want to go forward with it. Um, there's, a, there's a quote uh, that I ran across by um, uh, Ken Chenault, who was the former chief executive of Amex, uh, who's a black, leading black business leader, uh, and he said that, um, he was unmoved by calls for chief executives to stay out of politics and that he viewed it as his obligation to keep speaking out on issues he believed in. Excuse me, your obligation as a CEO is not to speak out on issues you believe in. If you want to do that, go do something else. Your obligation as a CEO is to run your company to make the most amount of money. And I'm not saying that his issue is not important or right or wrong. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that he thinks that as a CEO, he has an obligation, not just the ability or the right, but an obligation to politicize his company. So I think that's probably more common than we think. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said. The only thing I might add to it that might be a helpful framework is the idea of X inefficiency. Um, and so this is uh, Harvey Liebenson's uh, contribution, and it's the notion that um, firms really, uh, you know, rarely are, are have a total, uh, you know, are totally tight in terms of producing where marginal cost equals marginal benefit. There's usually some slack. And the more, the less competitive is the industry, the more slack there's going to be. And so, you know, you can interpret it, uh, sometimes this is said, is that the, the, the best of all monopoly profits is a quiet life, is being able to just have a, uh, not necessarily always looking over your shoulder at your competitor. And if that's under the normal uh, framework, it's the idea that, well, firms will use their slack uh, to kind of sit back and relax a little bit and then maybe neglect customer desires, neglect costs. But the other way they could use their slack is to engage in their own personal interests in, in some of these maybe politics. So another prediction here would be is that, uh, again, the firms that are less um, uh, constrained by competition are going to be more inclined to indulge in their political beliefs. 
That's a really interesting um, contribution to this conversation about how the role of market power in playing a role in political speech. Let's get um, specific. Let's talk about some concrete examples. I think sometimes that's really interesting to think about how we navigate. Um, so I'm thinking about Disney. Disney versus Governor Rod DeSantis in Florida. Um, so just to kind of briefly summarize, um, there was a, a law in Florida that was controversial that um, the, the governor of Florida had endorsed. And Disney came out against it, perhaps maybe didn't describe it in the most precise detail, um, but they were against it. And then the governor um, responded soon after by removing their tax exempt status for Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Um, so what are your thoughts on, like how do you navigate this? Because there's a lot of cross cutting kind of things going on. Um, like should they have had that tax exempt status to begin with? Is this a retaliation for political speech from a business that is actually their first amendment right? Um, all of those things. How do you navigate some of these kind of concrete situations? Rob, I feel like you, you feel like I could do this. <laughs> so it is their First Amendment right, and it is also Ron DeSantos's First Amendment right to change a law. I mean, that's what it is. The problem with so I think you know, I, look, I think Disney did that because they felt like they had to respond to their worker workers there who were really up in arms about that and were saying, "Hey, you got to do this, or else." and Disney went ahead and did it. I think it was a mistake for them. But the, I think what the, the problem, the slippery slope we go down here is we end up with, we, we all know progressives attack big corporations, but when Republicans start doing it, or conservatives start doing it, well, it's, it's political, when, when Republicans start doing it, you know, is that good for Florida's economy? I mean, maybe it's not. Maybe some at the margin, Disney decides it's going to spend more money in Disneyland or you know in California or open something else. Is it good for the global for the U.S. economy when Republicans attack tech companies? I, I think it's bad, actually. I think it's bad for the global for the U.S. economy when they do that. So it feels good. I mean, I understand why Republicans do it because they're mad and they feel like these companies are not respecting uh, their views. I get that, and I understand why they're mad. Uh, but the problem is it, you end up with pot potentially harmful policies. And at the end of the day, both parties should be thinking about what's the right policy. And demonizing and attacking corporations is not going to be the way to do that. But to the point about policies, what types of policies are you concerned about that this might lead to? Like the what kind of retaliation policies? Well, uh, here's one, get rid of section, big, big debate on that, but to get rid of section 230, which, uh, which gives companies the right to take down somebody's speech or to keep somebody's speech. I think that's fundamental to the global, to, to the US having a vibrant internet economy. So to, to remove section 230 right. would be a, an example of a problem, like that would be a bad yes, thing. Yes, that would be a bad thing. And the major reason why Republicans want, the reason the left wants to get rid of it is because they want these companies to take down almost all conservative speech. The reason the Republicans want to get rid of it is because they think they're taking down too much conservative speech and they want to punish them. So this is about punishment. And uh, so that would, that would be one example. I think you, the other example I see is when you see Republicans who historically have been uh, more in the Chicago school of antitrust enforcement, now switching over to the Neo Brandeisian school of antitrust enforcement because they see it as a way to get back at big corporations who they don't agree with politically. That's not what you're supposed to do. Antitrust should be on, done on its merits, not on, I don't like the politics of this company. Once we start going down that path, we start getting something close to a banana republic. And uh, that's not really what America should be, because once you go down that path, then you start losing all investment certainty. Companies don't know how to play, the, how, how to invest. We, so I think it's super dangerous, and, and I don't see any sort of stopping points that, that we could have right now. Yeah, I think that's a, a, all those points are, are spot on. I think the um, DeSantis and Disney um, story is a great example of with just the idea that with government uh, shekels come government shackles. And if a, a firm is receiving a particular favor from government, then it's easy then for government to, to impose uh, conditions upon that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's that's a lot of what we're seeing. The, the other point with uh, Section 230, which uh, that I think that illustrates, is this notion of uh, regulation through raised eyebrow. 
So uh, if, you're, if you're parents, um, I'm sure at one point or another, you, you've, done, you've uh, looked at your kid and you've gone, <laughs> right? And you don't even have to impose any rule. You just raise your eyebrow and the kid, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll stop doing that. Um, well, I think that's a lot of what was going on in terms of um, firms were, the, uh, Facebook and, and uh, Twitter were not interested in policing content. They didn't want to get into that business. But the more that they were threatened uh, through uh, raised eyebrow, the more they felt, okay, we do have to start policing content. Uh, that then, uh, it happened, I, the, the content that they were policing was uh, Republicans, uh, Donald Trump in, in particular. And um, you know, now uh, the, the response from Democrats is, okay, we're gonna, um, or now, now Republicans also want to crack down on them. So it's like you've got both eyebrows raised. Um, you've got both parents raising their eyebrows at, at, the, at the kid, and the kid doesn't know who, who to follow. Um, but I think it's, uh, uh, I think those are the, that's a good way to illustrate it a little bit. And Elizabeth, with your research, do you think there is a public policy implication, or do you think that this is more of something that the private sector has to work out on its own, where they just they haven't yet figured out that this is hurting their bottom line? Yeah, I, so I think, yeah, th there's no, I don't think there's any immediate uh, policy implications um, just yet. And I think, yeah, you, you could, you know, have the, the view that, okay, if, you know, consumers want, you know, to buy ice cream that is consistent with, with their values, you know, there should be um, a market for, you know, firms to, to cater to that demand. Same for investors. If there's investors that say, yeah, we, um, we have, you know, so certain social goals in mind, there, you know, should be room mm -hmm. for, uh, um, for, you know, funds to emerge that, um, that cater to, uh, to those preferences. Um, and even if it comes as a, at an economic cost, right? Maybe as an investor, you're just as happy, you know, if, if uh, you feel like you're investing aligned with your, uh, with your moral compass, even if that comes at a financial return. I think kind of being aware and, and, and quantifying mm -hmm. the cost is, is still important. But in my view, yeah, the, the bigger, um, the bigger risk of that is actually precisely what we just talked about, that there's this impulse from uh, lawmakers to punish uh, the companies that actually do end up you know, t uh, taking a, a position that, that can be harmful. I also want to point out like, something that we haven't touched upon yet, which is you know, when business, I think, moves more you know, in, in, uh, into the, uh, having two political camps, that that can actually further exacerbate the divide that we're already uh, seeing happening. There's actually uh, interesting research by political scientists that say, for example, the workplace is actually the most important place when it comes to interacting across partisan lines. Mm -hmm. You're much more uh, likely to encounter people with different political views at work than you are you know, in, uh, at home in your neighborhood. And so I think from that you know, broader so societal perspective, you know, th these, this trend might, might be worrisome. Right. Well, thank you. Um, so now I want to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Lots of hands. OK. So we'll just start here, right there, Brian. <laughs> um, I think you have a voice that can project, so go ahead. <laughs> so a lot of totally true comments about the roles of consumers, uh, workers, and investors in leading to politicization. But there's one puzzle, and the puzzle is the sheer uniformity. It is almost impossible to find any large publicly right-wing corporation in America. It seems like just, oh, oh, just the fact that we have such a large economy, you think that there would at least be some other place, 10 or 20 percent of firms would be taking the opposite view. Anytime you see that kind of uniformity, I say you really should be looking to government. So you need government to get everybody on the same page, especially everyone with a lot to lose. Uh, now, where exactly would we blame government for politicization? I say that in the main issues we're talking about, it's got to be discrimination law. You just imagine if there were a corporation that had a lot of corporate propaganda saying, do not make false accusations of racism and sexism. We harshly punish false accusations. Something like that. That would basically be putting a lightning rod up, why don't you go and sue me for discrimination just for saying something that... You could say maybe that's a reasonable policy to say we're very worried about false accusations. So anyway, I guess my question is, to what extent are we forgetting to blame government for politicization? Which seems like a, the obvious place to start, actually. Mm -hmm. OK, so the question is, to what extent has government politicized business, not through the mechanism that? OK, any thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of sort of my my point is uh, I think it's it's not business becoming political; it's uh, politics getting involved in business. Um, the only thing I might challenge you on is I do think if you start to think about it, you can name some conservative or some companies that are associated with conservatism. Uh, you know, I mentioned Hobby Lobby, uh, mentioned Chick Fil A. Um, uh, yeah, my pillow. Uh, you know, brass, uh, bass, uh, pro shops. You know, there's a there are, there are a good number of examples when you start to to run down. Oh, in size, I don't know. Yeah, the Coke Industries. Yeah. Uh, I also want to welcome people that are watching with us online, that you can also submit your questions online, um, and that I'm able to see them coming through here. But we also want to get through the many hands that we saw here in the room. Um, to kind of go on this side, um, this gentleman right here. Thank you. Um, Politicization might be a low cost way of differentiating your product. Um, then one hypothesis might be that more competitive markets, you might see more politici politicization. Uh, do we have any sense for the relationship between how competitive a market is and how likely the firms in that market are to be uh, engaged in politics? Well, we, we did a study at ITIF looking at the most recent census data on concentration from the 2017 business survey, which is the most recent. And um, what you find is that there's essentially no increase in what's called the C4 concentration ratio at about 850 different industries. C4 is essentially how much market share the biggest four companies have. So the fact that there hasn't been any increase in concentration in the economy, even though the Neo-Brandeisians like to tell us and warn us we're in a monopoly crisis, mm -hmm. suggests to me that, at least on a temporal basis, that's not, that has not been the cause of this, that it's something else. Now, maybe on a, within a current period, that might be related, but not temporally, I don't think. And then over here, this gentleman right here, I don't know who has the three. Thank you. Back in 1971, the Lewis Powell Manifesto denounced the infiltration of the left in politics, <clears throat> in the press, in the universities, academics, uh, and even in business uh, associations. There was a huge reaction in the US, a, a very good reaction. Uh, eventually, uh, <clears throat> the world assumed globalization and free trade and, and, uh, and poverty was reduced to less than 10% uh, worldwide. Between other things, Cato was founded at that time. Now we are even worse than in that period of time. Uh, with politics, obviously, the academics, uh, the press, uh, and even business accommodating to the political situation, uh, looking for a benefit in the short period of time. But it will backfire, no? uh, I believe. Where is the new Lewis Powell in the US? We need it, even in, in the less developed world. Could you restate the question just kind of in, in one sentence? No, I, I mean, we need a new Lewis Powell to denounce this penetration of the left in every uh, spaces of our world, which is uh, bringing uh, less uh, development, more poverty, especially across the world. We need something mm -hmm. to be done as it was done then. So. As I understand, I haven't read the, the Lewis Powell memo, but I've, I've read of it, I guess. And from what I understand, you know, essentially he's kind of making the case for uh, economic freedom. We should have uh, lower taxes and less regulation. And I think it, what's interesting is that there it tends to be a perception that that's what businesses do when they get political, when they really don't. Uh, it, typically when they get political, they either lobby, they either indulge their beliefs often on social issues that aren't really economic policy, or if they get involved with economic policy, they're asking for particularized uh, policy. They want a regulation that raises their rival's costs, 
that protects them or some sort of special benefit. Um, so what's interesting is that to the extent that business really does get involved, it's not in the way that Powell you know, described it. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more. Um, this um, woman in the back of the room, could we bring the microphone back there? Thanks so much. I enjoyed all of the presentations. The part that I have a problem with is the com combined statement that, number one, there isn't much we can do about this, and number two, even when Republicans are in power, we should be passive because we don't want to start some sort of a world war politicization. And in contrast to that, you know, I look at someone like Glenn Youngkin, as soon as he comes in, he, he said in the schools we're going to eliminate critical race theory. Trump tied, tried to do that in the government as well. It seems to me that all of these diversity, reverse discrimination policies could in fact face not just constitutional challenge ultimately, but a strong statement of government, if not legislation, executive order upholding the traditional American values that we know at least half of the country still adhere to. And the reason why I think this is important, for example, you go to these banks that depend on the government for their charter and say, by the way, we want to eliminate all of that forced uh, reverse discrimination and go to an equal opportunity uh, policy. The reason why I think this is important is because these, the posture of government is a statement of value that shapes the culture. You cannot have one side using it super aggressively and the other side saying, okay, we don't want to fight. Your reaction, please, Mr. Atkinson in particular. Well, you, you just made my point. There's nothing we can do about this because I'm not... Look, the reality is the war is going to get more intense. Uh, the Republicans are angry about it, and they're going to use more things, like they did in Missouri to not buy use Citibank funding or some company. I got, I got that. So, you know, whether you want to have an equal war, that's a different question. That's not my question. My, my only point was the war is going to keep getting worse because Republicans are now at a point, I think, where they're like, hey, we have been asleep at the switch on this culture war stuff. We got people like Youngkin and, and DeSantos, and so we're going to fight back. That is going to politicize business. That's my only point I'm making. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying the idea that we're going to somehow not politicize business going forward, I think, is, is not right. We're going to politicize business even more. All right. Well, thank you very much to our panelists, to Matt, Rob, and Elizabeth, and for all of you. I think we have a, a break, a lunch. All right. <laughs>
Hello? If I could get everybody's attention. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Myron. I'm the Vice President for Research at Cato. I want to thank you all for coming. Thank Ryan for organizing this conference. Thank Searle Foundation for its financial support. And especially thank all the Cato conference and media people who make events like this run as well-oiled machines. It's now my privilege to introduce our lunch speaker, Jason Furman. Jason is the Edna Professor of the Practice of Economic Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School and in the Department of Economics in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Jason engages in public policy in a wide range of areas, including U.S. and international macro, fiscal policy, labor markets, and competition policy. He also co-teaches EC10, the Introductory Principle of Economics course, which is the largest course at Harvard. Previously, Jason served eight years as a top advisor to President Obama, including serving as the 28th Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. He's a member of numerous organizations, including the Council of Foreign Relations, the Group of 30, serves as the trustee or on the advisory board of other prestigious organizations such as Russell Sage, the Brooking Papers, uh, and the Hamilton Project. In addition to articles in scholarly journals, Jason regularly contributes to the Wall Street Journal and Project Syndicate, including in this morning's Wall Street Journal. He earned his BA from Harvard, where he was first year roommates with Matt Damon. I don't think we'll hear much, of, hear much about that today. Um, and he holds his PhD in economics uh, from Harvard as well. Now beyond the impressive credentials, what I want to emphasize about Jason is that when I come across one of his op-eds, I can often predict what his position is going to be, but not consistently, not always, because he doesn't endorse a particular party line of either party. Similarly, when I do disagree, which, which happens, okay, it's not about values or adherence to the red team or blue team, but it's about economics. Reasonable economists can and do disagree with decent frequency, and that's presumably healthy uh, for everyone. This sort of open-minded perspective, this thoughtful perspective is pretty unusual, to say the least. Jason's perspective suggests someone who cares about getting it right and not just signaling loyalty to a particular tribe. And I, for one, am truly appreciative of that. So without further delay, I'm delighted to welcome Jason. Thank you very much. Oh, and I'm uh, truly appreciative of that um, kind and generous introduction. I'm also appreciative that somebody's invited me to talk about a topic other than inflation. I used to have a wide range of topics I'd thought and worked about and have gotten overly obsessed with that one um, narrow one. Uh, perhaps taking off of Jeff's introduction and that way of thinking, um, I wanted to start by talking about one of the big problems in public policy is that we don't just have one objective. We often have many objectives. And the objectives we have may differ depending on our values. One objective would be to raise as many people's incomes as much as possible. We also care about people's lives, protecting their lives in a pandemic, extending them and letting them live longer and healthier lives. We might care about climate change. We might care about poverty. We might care about inequality. Um, there's many objectives that could show up on that list. When thinking about how to make policy with those different objectives, I think there's a sort of classic mistake that's more common um, among liberals and a classic mistake that's more common um, among conservatives. And I'm going to caricature both of these mistakes. And of course, these don't apply to everyone or everything. They're just tendencies. The liberal mistake is to get the sign wrong. The Republican mistake, the conservative mistake, is to get the magnitude wrong. I'll explain what I mean by that. With the liberal, the temptation is to think that all good things go together, that there aren't any trade-offs at all. You see that in the idea that the best way to deal with climate change is to invest in green technologies. That'll create more green jobs, increase economic growth, and slow carbon emissions. Or the best thing during a pandemic is to have um, restrictions on activity, because that won't just save lives, it also, by saving lives, will um, help the economy. And that all of these good things um, go together. And that's what I mean by getting the sign wrong. Not that it's never the case 
that all good things go together. I can think of another example, a number of examples where you can do things that both help the economy and help climate change. But an awful lot of what you'd want to do on climate change, you're doing not because you want more economic growth, but because you want um, less emissions. And they're not things you would have done in a world where carbon dioxide was a completely um, harmless gas. So that's what I mean by getting the sign wrong on the trade-off. Um, what's the consequence of this? Well, if you applied this philosophy rigorously and analytically carefully, you'd end up doing too little. You shouldn't just combine your interventions to things that advance, let's say you have just two goals, to things that advance both of your goals simultaneously. Everything that advances both goals you should do. If you, have, if you care about inequality and growth, anything that helps growth while reducing inequality, you should want to do it. But once you've done all of that, you then want to do some more things. You want to do some things where you give up a tiny bit of growth to get a big gain on your other goal, climate change, poverty, save lives, or vice versa. Um, that you um, give up a little bit of lives, a little bit of climate change, in order to make a huge stride forward um, for growth. So analytically, if you were rigorous about it, you'd end up doing too little. Uh, more common, though, the mistake is not to be rigorous about it, and instead to fool yourself into thinking that whatever you're doing is going to accomplish all your goals um, simultaneously. Now, if it's well-intentioned and you're setting up a wonderful program for children, a wonderful program for climate change, a wonderful program to save lives in the pandemic, you know, what's the harm of kidding yourself and rather than talking about some side effects and unintended consequences, just saying um, that all good things go together? Um, I think there are some downsides to it. One is the world really does impose some constraints on you. If you try to, for example, do a massive fiscal stimulus in an economy that's very close to its capacity, you're just not going to be able to have no trade-off between unemployment and inflation. In fact, you might end up at the wrong side of that trade-off with a lot of inflation and no real ability to budge or push the unemployment rate um, any lower. You might end up with a bunch of regulations to deal with climate change that themselves have a set of distributional costs that in addition to the benefits for climate change, you want to say it's going to be more expensive to buy this microwave, to buy this car. That might be worth it. That might not be worth it. But to pretend that's not the case, you can end up inadvertently harming people. And the third problem is you may not actually be able to get what you want done if you trick yourself into thinking it benefits everyone. If you think there's no costs or no downsides to your policy, um, you don't expect any opposition um, to it. I remember one issue we worked on in the White House, one of the people working on it assured me that this new regulation we were going to have for business, uh, that the businesses were going to actually love it because it was going to increase predictability, make their lives easier, make their lives better, and their stock price all fell 5% on the day we announced it. Um, that doesn't make the policy bad, by the way. Our goal was not to maximize the stock price of these companies. It was to maximize social welfare. But as an input into that social welfare analysis, part of it uh, was how it affected those companies. And I trust their shareholders ex post evaluation of regulation more than the well-intentioned staffer who assured me um, that they would all love and um, appreciate it. So you can end up with policies that have losers the losers aren't fooled by your happy talk. They understand they're losers. The problem isn't that they don't understand economics. It's that they do. Um, they don't like it. And if you don't understand that and figure out compensation, you can't build um, a political coalition. The conservative error can be one of not the, getting the sign wrong on the trade-off, but getting the magnitude wrong. Thinking that whatever it is, the effects on economic growth are going to be so large that you don't need to think about um, anything else. If you look at the recent tax cuts in um, the United Kingdom that were originally proposed, I think the people proposing it, insofar as they had any analysis at all, thought it would increase economic growth so much that those tax cuts would pay for themselves. Whatever staffer assured the prime minister that that was the case um, had to deal with the fact that after they were announced, financial markets 
disagreed um, and did not think that those tax cuts were going to pay for themselves. Interest rates um, skyrocketed. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act, Robert Barrow and I, um, he coming from more of the conservative side, me coming from more of the liberal side, um, did a paper on it together in terms of the economic impact. Originally, we thought we might say, you know, come up to, with two different conclusions and crosswalk between our conclusions and explain why we had a different view. We ended up having the same view, so we didn't need to do that. That view was that they would add 0.2 to 0.4 percentage points to the level of output after a decade. That might be good enough to support the legislation, and for Robert, it was. Um, in my case, that was a relatively small gain in growth, and some of the distributional and other harms, um, from my perspective, um, outweighed that, and so my judgment was against that legislation. Um, but you could only make that judgment if you thought it was going to add you know, 80% to growth, then you're going to want to do it. If you think any time you raise tax cuts on a high-income household, any time you do anything for climate change, it's going to just wreck the economy and destroy it, well, then you can't really get into a cost-benefit conversation when the costs are infinite. And that is um, what I think, in some sense, is the conservative vice. So what's the solution to both of these? Here I'm going to uh, talk my book and argue it's more economics education, um, whether that's in my class, reading the many things uh, that many of the people in this room um, read, and thinking in a disciplined way about issues like budget constraints, like trade-offs, like cost benefit, um, and the like. What I'm concerned about is that there just seems to be less and less interest in that in the world today than there has been um, in the past. Well, it's always a little bit concerning when you think the past was some golden age paradise, and when you were more a part of that past than you are of the present, you probably need to check that temptation um, even more. But my perception is when you look at something like student loans, in the United States, that not a lot of economic analysis went into the consequences of that. And insofar as it did, it focused on one half of the equation, the direct effects of the policy, who would benefit, without looking at the other half, on the indirect unintended consequences for uh, tuition, future indebtedness, who would ultimately foot the bill, inflation, um, interest rates, um, and the like. The, UK, with what they did with their recent mini-budget, would be another example of where economists don't seem to have really been in the room doing the analysis, because I don't think it's that they have bad economists at the Office of Budget Responsibility in the UK. It was just they didn't want to bring them in and um, listen to them. Now, I think we have to un try to understand why um, economists are listened to um, less than they should, and I'm on the record of saying I'm glad President Obama didn't listen to everything I had to say, because if he did, um, he wouldn't have had a second term. And if he had managed to limp along that far, it would have been a sort of disastrous one. So I think you do need to have some balance of what you can pass Congress, what people can live with, what's implementable, a whole set of considerations um, economists don't have. But the economic portion of it is in you know, considerably shorter supply, or actually I think the problem is in shorter demand than almost any of those other considerations are. On the progressive side, um, some of this has gone under a rather explicit set of mo interrelated movements, um, some of whom support modern monetary theory, some of whom support a neo-Brandeisian approach um, to antitrust, all of whom hate neoliberalism. I, at first, didn't really know what neoliberalism was, and then eventually I realized just whatever I think is neoliberalism. <laughs> That's the definition of it, and you know, probably the same goes um, for some people um, in this room. And I've tried to think, a friend of mine asked me, you know, what do the sort of anti-neoliberals, post-neoliberalisms sort of want to substitute in its place. They don't like cost-benefit analysis. They don't like putting a value of life. They don't like doing an antitrust analysis of the effect on consumer welfare. They don't like calculating the budget constraint. What's the sort of alternative? The charitable explanation I got from someone more sympathetic to these ideas than I am is that you know, this post-neoliberalism, anti-neoliberalism 
is sort of dedicated to the proposition of inclusive growth. We should do as many things as we can to increase growth and reduce inequality um, at the same time. Maybe universal preschool would be an example of that. Maybe that would increase growth and reduce inequality. That's the definition I'm all in. In fact, I think in some sense everyone's all in. Who would be against something that only had good effects and didn't have any bad effects? So I think there's some other definitions sort of that, that acquire some more bite. Um, one of them is a belief that economics has overstated the importance of scarcity. In fact, that's the definition we use in our first class, um, scarce, uh, scarce resources uh, to achieve your means, a uh, scarce means to achieve your, your, your ends, and you know, has overstated that, has overstated budget constraints, has overstated um, all of that. And then we need to break free of the shackles of it. Um, I do think there have been times when um, those constraints have been overstated. I think when you're dealing with the financial crisis, the budget constraint around fiscal stimulus was smaller than many people thought it was. Fiscal stimulus was going to expand the size of the economy, partly pay itself back, and cost much less than you'd think it actually would. So I think there have been times and places where that's been the case. But you really need the analysis to understand what those times and places are. And if you're emerging from a natural disaster like COVID, much of which is going to solve itself through vaccination, all of which can't solve itself infinitely fast because supply chains have their constraints, the economics of doing fiscal stimulus in that environment is quite different than the economics of doing fiscal stimulus in a world of a 10% unemployment rate in the wake of a financial crisis where households are overly indebted as opposed to have um, very healthy balance sheets. There's a third definition that I think a lot of post-neoliberals coalesce around, um, and that's a really deep skepticism of markets. They don't like the way you know, I teach economics, which is I start, as I did in class on Monday this week, with perfect competition. And then I say, here's a bunch of assumptions that go into perfect competition. No externalities, competition, information, et cetera. And then the rest of the course go through those different assumptions, talk about lots and lots of ways markets fail. But in general, in thinking about those market failures, you're sort of starting with, here's how the market works. Oh, here's something that makes it go wrong. And then in terms of policy, here's how we fix that. So if it's an externality, it's a Pigouvian tax. If it's competition, it's antitrust um, and the like. And there's just much more enthusiasm for much more oops, direct regulatory approaches, whether that's price controls or anti-price gouging to control inflation, whether that's a pretty regulatory command and control approach to climate change under the misleading argument that it's too late um, to use market mechanisms. Um, using that approach on a wide scale um, to wages um, and the like. Um, that third definition of anti-neoliberalism or post-neoliberalism is probably the aspect of it um, that I like um, least. No, I'm not a libertarian. I'm not a libertarian, uh, I think, because even though Jeff tried to convince me that there's such a thing as consequential libertarianism that had no philosophical difference um, from everyone else, I think I probably do have a somewhat different social welfare function. A little bit less of an emphasis on individual liberty, a little bit more that if we could raise the top tax rate to 90% and there were no distortions at all from it, probably wouldn't mind doing that because other people could use the money better than and would make them happier than the people that were losing the money. And the only constraint on doing that is insofar as you're ending up hurting the economy and hurting the people at the middle and the bottom, um, not that the person at the top had some right to a property right that I think itself was derived in some sort of uncertain and contingent way. Not here to debate this question, just describing that I'm coming from a more um, utilitarian perspective and less of at least a philosophical um, libertarian one. Um, but I read libertarians a lot. Um, I read libertarians avidly, because almost everything that I would like to accomplish, whether it relates to poverty reduction, to climate change, 
or big topics like that or small topics like bringing down um, the price of hearing aids or bringing down the price of um, insulin, I think libertarians have an awful lot um, to offer. A lot of that is because of two sort of basic ideas. One is that people and businesses are sort of going to do what they're going to do. Your solution to inflation can't be that you think businesses are evil, greedy. Sorry, this talk's going to end up being about inflation. Uh, the corporations are just evil, greedy. They just do whatever they want. And by the way, don't worry about all the wage increases they're giving because they're just going to sort of eat that in the form of lower profits, and none of that will the greedy corporations pass on in higher profits. Corporations aren't going to do what you want them to do and what you'd like them to do. They're going to sort of do what they're going to do. Uh, people are going to do what they're going to do. I don't think it's 100% self-interest in a narrow, Gordon Gecko greed type of way, but it's an awful lot closer to that than thinking everyone's going to go out and act to try to create the type of world you want. And when you're designing public policy, you have to take that as given. Um, the second thing, and, and on this topic, I actually probably have more expertise than almost anyone um, that works at Cato, not to rub it in or anything. Um, I think the government has often really, really limited capacity to understand problems and craft really elaborate, creative um, solutions to them. Um, I don't think any of you were particularly surprised by that. You've all been writing about it for a long time, um, but you've lived it a lot less um, than I have. And you know, sometimes I'd be in a room where there was literally like a mathematical identity that people were arguing with. Um, there would be something like um, in health insurance, we agreed on uh, you know the Affordable Care Act would have a certain coverage ratio that at least you know, no more than 30% of your costs could be out of pocket. And then people would say, okay, now that we have that, you know, let's have a lower deductible. And I'd say, well, if you have a lower deductible, you know, you get higher coinsurance. And they'd be like, oh, no, no, let's have lower coinsurance. And I'd say, no, you know, once you set that other variable, these other two are just a function of it. So you can pick two of the variables. You can't pick all three of them independently um, when they have to add up. Those were the sort of less on that particular topic, the less um, you know, erudite ones. Um, on that particular one, when we were trying to decide this question of you know, what should the deductibles be, what should the rules on deductibles be, um, I sat down with a friend of mine who's a colleague now, and we thought long and hard about it for like an hour straight and couldn't decide what we thought was in people's um, best interest. We just weren't sure, and we were pretty educated and pretty good at it. To me, that said, you know what? We probably just shouldn't put that in a regulation, put that in a law, make it last forever. Maybe people have different tastes, different interests. They might know things um, that we don't know. And I think we were on the better end of the spectrum, because at least we understood you know, how to do arithmetic with three numbers. So those two insights, the people and businesses are going to sort of do what they're going to do, and that the government, I think, does have a limited ability um, lead me to a worldview that if I could pick the way we did public policy, um, it would place markets front and center. It would use them as much as possible to solve almost everything you could, but um, would recognize, first of all, they can't do all of that um, on their own. I'll talk about what that means in a moment. Second, they're not going to solve every one of those different goals I began with all on their own, because not one, every one of those goals is demanded by consumers. And they're not going to result in the income distribution I want. And so you're going to need um, a lot, potentially a lot, of redistribution at the end of that. So this is sort of a roughly a second fundamental welfare theorem economics view of the world of change the endowments and then let the markets work. So letting the markets work. Um, in part, that means not having anti-price gouging rules and not having rules on who can sell insulin and not having rules on you know, who can sell hearing aids, not having the Jones Act, not having, I thought that'd be an applause line, uh, <laughs> not, having, uh, not, not having tariffs, not having quotas, you know, all these different things where you're sort of micro trying to handle um, one part of um, the market. So a lot of it means getting rid of a lot of that regulation. Um, 
In fact, I think a competition agenda, which I've been very much in favor of and beating the drum for and for some time, a non-trivial portion of a pro-competition agenda is getting in the way of what's diminishing competition, which in many sectors isn't the big evil monopolist, it's the government, either well-intentioned or poorly intentioned um, through the types of things I just said or restrictions on occupational licensing, restrictions on land use um, and the like. So to make markets function, you have to um, you have to sort of get rid of all those things. You can have more competition so, um, so they can do things they're supposed to do. But they need a lot of inputs. Um, one input they need is uh, people. Um, the more immigration, um, the better. Uh, that, I thought at least Brian Kaplan would applaud that one. Um, uh, they need education. They need basic research. All of that, I think, is an important set of inputs into making those markets function. And then the markets may not have exactly um, the set of goals. Markets on their own don't take into account that my carbon emissions affect someone else, affect people um, in the future. And so harnessing the genius of you know, hundreds of millions of people as they make their choices, of millions of businesses as they figure out how to innovate in what they do by sending them the right signal through something like a carbon tax instead of a decent amount of the regulations we have now and with the money returned to households in the form of a dividend would be um, the best way to tackle a problem like that. As I said, I don't think this system, I don't have any reason to think this system would result in a distribution of income that I'd be happy with with a level of poverty that I'd be happy with, with something that I think would maximize a utilitarian um, social welfare function. So the other part of this would be the redistribution to ensure that um, the people sort of join in and benefit from this. Um, but there too, it's not like you have to take out, take off all that economic analysis, the cost benefits, the trade-offs I was talking about before. Ideally, you'd design it um, as well as possible. So I've written on the corporate tax side, raising the top tax, raising the corporate tax rate, and having expensing and disallowing interest deductions. I think on the individual side, for any given level of capital taxation, I'd rather do it in a less distortionary manner, which actually means either taxing capital gains at death, or if you can figure out administratively how to do it mark to market, um, you get ca less capital lock-in, and then one can debate you know, what the right level of capital taxation um, is. Another um, one is more broad-based um, taxation, and the very first one uh, that I'd start with and be most enthusiastic about, which has left the political debate um, entirely, and there's a bipartisan consensus that it's a horrible idea, would be to address the health exclusion, which is a way to raise money in a way that I think would increase some consciousness of costs in healthcare, lead to better insurance plans, and result in people having more money and a little bit less health, such that health coverage, such that at the margin, um, that trade off, that constraint they were having was being handled in um, a better way. The other um, end of the spectrum is what are you doing um, with the money? frankly wouldn't mind a European-style social welfare state where if you had broad-based taxation, you could support uh, broad-based benefits as well. But I don't think that's necessary. And in the United States, I don't think we can have broad-based taxation. And so any aspiration for policy to be essential, for benefits to be universal, either means it's going to be quite small or it's just not going to add up and leave us with bigger problems um, in the future. So I think you unfortunately or fortunately um, need to target. The more you can do cash rather than in kind, I think that's generally better. Um, the value of a dollar to someone is a dollar. Um, the value of anything else in kind, maybe you're lucky and you figure out the exact right, wonderful, amazing policy, but I think more likely you'll end up messing it up and the benefits of your uh, whatever you did get captured by um, you know, whatever it is. So child, you know, I was more enthusiastic about the child tax credit, which I think has a hard time going wrong than I was about the child care proposal, which could potentially have all sorts of the unintended consequences 
I was talking about um, before. Wouldn't personally go all the way to a universal basic income, because I think some targeting does make sense, giving more money to people uh, to provide insurance when they're unemployed than when they're not, more money to someone who's disabled and unable to work than someone who's not, more money to people with larger families than um, the opposite, too. This, uh, not saying, uh, this isn't a complete list of you know, my views on policy, a complete list of what we should do on policy. I certainly don't expect anyone to have changed their value orientation uh, based on anything I said. But there's an awful lot of the policies I just said that even if you ha are coming from a different value orientation, as long as you're still sort of agree on like arithmetic, and that if you have three numbers with a mathematical relationship, you can't pick all three of them um, independently, I think you can make an awful lot of progress. A number of these debates can be unbundled. How to tax cap capital can be unbundled from the question of how much to tax capital. You know, how much redistribution to, can, to do can be unbundled from the question of what is the best way um, to do that redistribution and figuring out where there are genuine shared goals of which of all the ones I said, I think growth is the least controversial and the one most people are in favor of is probably another one or a case we're doing this type of careful case by case, thinking about trade-offs, thinking about unintended consequences, doing the cost benefit, I think could make a real difference just have to figure out how to both continuing to increase um, the supply of it, um, but right now um, it does seem to be an excess supply. Most white papers um, are sold for a price of zero, um, and so it's also figuring out how to address the demand side, and I'm sure the next panel will know exactly how to do that. Thank you. <laughs> this okay. I'll stay here. We have 15 minutes for questions. If you will raise your hand, uh, I guess I'll call on people. So I'll start over here on my right. Is there someone coming around with a microphone? I have a good prediction. It works much better for the video capture if we actually get you on a mic, so. Right there. Gentleman with his hand up. <laughs> I think okay there you go. here we go all righty uh thank you for your talk uh definitely uh happy to see more of your kind than than the AOC for example um but I was following a lot of a lot of your talk but but at some point uh, I saw some confusion about how the government works and um uh, for example, uh, you were talking about maybe using the populist genius uh, to, to, put in, uh, to put in some direction uh, for the money being spent by the governments, right? But we are not having referendums over each policy being made or each executive function being made. While you, uh, when you take money from one person, put it in the government's budget, and the government makes a decision for that, that is actually the few people, or nowadays, by executive, um, <coughs> by executive branches' orders, only one person that makes a decision over the judgment of the others, right? So it's not the genius of the public. Uh, it is not the genius, genius of 100 million people. It is you putting one person's judgment over everyone else's, right? For example, you said uh, it is better to give more money to people who have bigger families. Well, having a bigger family is a choice. Maybe I don't want to have children. Why should part of my tax, right, go to someone who wanted to have ten, ten kids, right? So that is exactly putting your own judgments over mine and everyone else's. And as Milton Friedman has said, uh, uh, assuming one's judgment over the others is not very, very different from from having a dictatorship. We're just doing it. Uh, small parts by small parts and uh, kind of uh, fooling ourselves in how the government works. Okay, thank you. Uh, so 
probably don't agree on every topic, which is great. Um, uh, the unleashing the genius of 100 million people was talking at something like a carbon tax, which says you're now gonna go figure out what you can do about carbon. The government does one simple thing there, and then it sends everyone off to figure it out, as opposed to the government deciding, here's what we're gonna do on nuclear, here's what we're gonna do on solar, here's what we're gonna do on wind, um, and here's what we're gonna do on microwave ovens. On government spending, you know, we're in a democracy. People have chosen these policies. I think it would be dictatorship to say people can't uh, be elected and do these policies. Now, you can think the policies are a bad idea. I don't love every outcome of democracy either, but I wouldn't say it's undemocratic or a dictatorship just to have taxes and government spending. Um, I look at government spending on education, science, infrastructure, not to mention you know, the rule of law, defense, and the like. And on balance, um, I think it's pretty good. I think it could be improved on. I think it also, in some cases, is inadequate and lacking. The returns to basic research I think are very, very high, and we do um, too little of it. K through 12, I think, can be improved with reforms to how we pay teachers. But preschool, I don't think we can do much more of it without um, putting more money into it. So I think I have a different judgment than you. Uh, mine comes, as I said, more from a utilitarian perspective. And ultimately, yeah, I think it's a legitimate choice for the government to make. And I'd like to see them make better choices. But that choice isn't presumptively to do nothing. Other questions? Gentleman over here. Well, I already have the mic, actually. <laughs> No, oh, okay, go ahead, Brian. Um, so Jason, when you were actually working in, with policymakers, did you ever even try saying, let's get rid of all this regulation and have a Bogovian tax instead? And if you thought that was pointless, what did you learn from the fact that you were, from that realization? My view is that to be a policy advisor, and this was the way President Obama functioned. I mean, I, I had all sorts of um, insights for him on like what could and couldn't pass Congress. And he had like no interest in my insights. And I was sort of offended by that. Um, but then the congressional staffer had all sorts of insights about the economic consequences of different tax policies. And President Obama had as much interest in that person's view of analysis of economics as he did in my view of legislation. And I thought that deal was sort of OK and worked out for me. Um, I thought your job was basically to say, this option's 10. You know, be amazing. This option's seven, this option's three, and this option is minus five. And then the legislative advisor's job, if it was legislation, was to put probabilities on the 10, I can't remember what numbers I just said. And the president's job was to multiply and decide which one was highest and do that. Uh, I'm not sure he saw his job um, that way, and obviously, um, obviously that's a, a flippant and unfair joke. But um, yeah, but I think you needed to go in and say. And so yeah, if in every meeting you just said a carbon tax is better than this, it just wasn't that useful. President Obama understood a carbon tax was a great policy. I think most everyone um, in the West Wing of our White House thought it was a great policy. I don't know what they think in this White House. I do think in democratic circles, there's less enthusiasm for a carbon tax, even sort of blue sky, you could do anything than there used to be. And so what I sort of want from people is not that they necessarily do the perfect thing every time, but they at least sort of know what the perfect thing is and have it in their head so that if there's an opportunity, um, they'll figure out how to do it. And there were some times where President Obama would pick the option that was less politically palatable and surprise me wanting to take on the fight. There were other times where, you know, if one option was 10 and one option was four, he'd pick the four because he thought it could get it done or the 10 wasn't worth the fight. And as long as I sort of armed him with that information, and by the way, he didn't necessarily agree with my 10 and four. He might change those numbers and have his own views about how the policy worked off and did. Um, I felt I did my job. The gentleman over here in a blue cap. Could you just raise your hand a little higher so they... But I think your job, Brian, is different. I mean, your job is to write books with big ideas that are going to change things over a longer period of time. I think you need to have that project, but also have the... Hi. How to get the next thing done, too. Uh, my name is Samar Chatterjee Save Foundation. Um, it's interesting to hear a person from Kennedy School of Government take this kind of position that you, you've just described. It's very interesting 
So is it like before the midterm <laughs> that you're taking kind of uh, balanced on both the conservatives and the uh, and the liberals, because generally the Kennedy School of Government has been more liberal than conservative. And just one quick, uh, m your mention of the masking requirement, I had a comment that I found that native-born women were very comfortable with masking requirements, double masking, triple masking, and so on, as much as like almost going back to the Islamic uh, burqa, and uh, somehow they are very comfortable. So yet, Governor Yunkin was able to uh, give a clarion call and win the election. So could you t tell us what's going on here? So um, if you think my sympathies are exactly straight down the middle, you probably misunderstood me. Um, and you know they're more on one side than the other side, and I'm very comfortable with that. I tried to explain a little bit about why that is. I think I might distinguish between the ends and the means, and there's a set of ends that I think probably the Democratic Party has in a more passionate way than the Republican Party has that I agree with. And then there's the question of what the best means to those ends are, and those are two uh, different questions, and the means might be where I differ more. Um, in terms of this, I, th I think I'm reasonably confident. I would have given roughly the same talk two years ago, probably less discussion of inflation, and uh, would do the same talk two years from now. There was a hand up right in front of you, Heather. Yeah. And not just because those were all the same proximity to an election. Yeah. Hi. Hi, my name is Mark. Thanks a lot. I have a quick question. What's your views on the macro, specifically the outstanding debt right now of the United States? I think it's around $31 trillion I saw yesterday. Are we, are we getting stuck or getting more and more constrained? You talked about constraints. I mean, obvious economic constraints. What are your views on that, and how much further do we have to go or not go, with, particularly with rates rising and the interest expense component? becoming a bigger part of the budget. Yep. So I've put forward with Larry Summers a sort of rough rule of thumb that you should focus on real debt service and want it to be below 2% of GDP and not you know, trending up rapidly, you know, even if it's below 2% of GDP. We are much, much closer to hitting that warning sign now than we were when we first wrote that paper. In part, that's because debt has gone up, and in part, it's because, uh, and in larger part, it's because real interest rates um, have gone up. There's a question as to, you know, what do we forecast real interest rates to be a decade from now? One view is real interest rates were low three years ago because of demography and inequality and productivity and other things, but none of that's really changed. We have somewhat more debt, and that's going to drive real interest rates up some, but you know, there's a formula that lets you do that, not a huge, huge amount. And once we get through this episode, um, real interest rates will come down. I have a certain amount of sympathy um, for that view, but I also have a certain amount of nervousness. It's not just that real interest rates today are high. If you look at forward real interest rates, what the market bets the real interest rate will be a decade from now for money that you want over the decade after that, um, that's also quite high. In fact, that's even higher than where real interest rates are right now. And so at this point, you know, two years ago, I thought the main fiscal adjustment we needed to make was when the tax cuts expired, let them expire or pay for them with tax reform, and that we needed to reform Social Security within Social Security. We could argue about taxes and benefits and that that was sufficient and we could take our time doing it. Now I would say, first of all, sooner is better if only for inflation and helping the Fed and that we may need to do more than that, and at the very least draw the line sort of in quite a strong way against anything that is digging the hole deeper. I think we have time for one more. Uh, David Bowes. Hi. Um, I thought in the beginning of your talk when you mentioned liberals get the sign wrong, conservatives get the magnitude wrong, you were really talking about the traditional sort of Reagan right but maybe even libertarians there. Um, and I wonder what thoughts you might have on what seems like a shift on, among conservatives and Republicans against that Reaganite free market perspective to a more protectionist industrial policy and even maybe pro-welfare state as long as it's for the right people 
uh, perspective on economic policy. Y yeah, I'm agree with everything. That. You had a question mark at the end of it, but I sounded like maybe you had a view on this topic, um, and I suspect my view on this topic agrees with yours. Look, I do think the deepest, strongest, most unifying conviction on the Republican side is that tax cuts like cure all problems. Um, there'll be Wall Street Journal editorials that say the way to deal with inflation is tax cuts because they'll expand the supply side of the economy um, and bring inflation down. So I think that from Reagan to the present is um, undiminished, which is sort of a shame because that's the part of it I like least. Um, the part where I'm in enormous amounts of sympathy is the free trade part, um, the immigration part. And look, in our eight years in office, we watched that slipping away. Um, we had Paul Ryan say he wanted to work with us on immigration reform. I 100% believe he did. He didn't, I think, as his people. Uh, he couldn't bring them along. Um, we had some political person in the White House in 2014, I think, tell us on TPP, the Republican voters are turning against trade, but don't worry, before their members of Congress figure it out, we're gonna get TPP passed. Donald Trump figured it out a little bit ahead of schedule, and we didn't get TPP passed. So I think, yeah, the idea that, um, you know, sort of markets is um, one that there is less of a constituency for now um, than there was in the past. And hopefully Doug Colt-Eakin will lament that even more than I did on the Republican side. So we actually have time for one more short question. Gentleman over here. Uh, thanks uh, for a great, great speech. Um, I think uh, you'll agree and everyone in the room will agree the Biden administration has paid a pretty high, or we've all paid a high price for the Biden administration not taking kind of economic advice uh, seriously enough uh, in its early months. Um, I wondered if you could give us a sense of, or, or your view on whether that's changed since then, uh, what, your, what your sense of the administration is now in terms of whether it's learned from those lessons, whether it's listening to economists more than it used to, uh, anything on that front. Yeah, so there's things they've done that I strongly agree with and supported, like the Inflation Reduction Act. Wasn't the perfect way to deal with climate change, but I think it was better than nothing and probably the best they could do under the constraints. I think the IRS enforcement revenue there was just about the best thing you could do on tax policy, and the corporate minimum tax was uh, slightly better than doing nothing on um, corporate taxes, but probably more in the 12th best um, than the first best when it comes to corporate taxes. So there's a bunch of things I like. Um, there's a bunch of things I don't like. I've made no secret of my views on um, student loans and no secret of my views on the American Rescue Plan, although I regret that I'm clearer about it now than I was at the time when I spoke less clearly about those views, but still tried to get them across. Um, you know, administrations always are debates between different people and who they want to listen to um, and what they you know, want to do. Insofar as inflation continues to be a problem, it would say, you know, hey, let's look at tariffs. Let's look at the Jones Act. Let's look at a lot of these regulations. Um, some of that's happened, less of it than I'd like, but I think those issues are hopefully live discussions and maybe inflation will unlock a few wins in some of those spaces, but we'll see. I pray we have to cut it off there, but thank you, Jason, very much. Thank you very much. That's great. We have a short, a short break. Yeah. So we'll see you back in 15 minutes. Thank you very much for...
Okay, I believe we're going to get started on this next session. So if people wouldn't mind finding their seat and grabbing their last drink or whatever they need. Perfect. Well, thank you and welcome to this afternoon's panel on Does the Regulatory State Fuel Populism? I am honored to be here with all of you and with our distinguished guests on this panel to discuss this topic. As the audience knows, uh, over the past a uh, couple of few election cycles, there's been a lot of discussion of populism, populist candidates, what motivates their supporters, and what does populism mean? As was alluded to in a little earlier panel, populism is a bit of a loose term. Sometimes it has been described as the struggle of the little guy against the big guy, the haves versus the have-nots, the political outsider versus the establishment, and populism inherently seems to require a distrust of elites and elite institutions. Of course, distrust is in ample supply today. In America, public confidence has declined across US institutions. In fact, public trust in government and government institutions declined by more than 50% over the past about 50 years, or 20 years, I should say, 50% over the past 20 years with 44% of Americans saying that they trusted government to do the right thing always or most of the time in 2000, and 20% saying the same this year, although I worry about that 20% a little bit. If you know much about regulation, you can imagine how it could collectively fuel frustration, resentment, and distrust. Regulation has a habit of protecting the polit politically well-connected, picking winners and losers, creating endless bureaucratic veto points and ever-growing compliance costs. Regulation segregates by income class and race. It limits opportunity, frequently arbitrarily. It excludes newcomers, entrepreneurs, and innovators. It also just makes it hard to get things done. It makes it hard for people to solve their own problems without government involvement. Although there are some, there are some industries that have experienced deregulation, uh, namely airline, rail, and trucking industries around four decades ago, the number of regulations in other areas, including health, safety, environment, and housing, continues to grow, as do the regulatory agencies that oversee these issues. Where Democrats, prefer economic regulation, national conservatives propose new immigration restrictions, antitrust, and online speech rules. So both sides of the political divide together dr drive the demand for and creation of new rules. Our distinguished panel today has spent a lot of collective time thinking about these issues and they are thought leaders on these topics. I'm looking forward to them helping us answer some questions today, including does the regulatory state really fuel populism? How does it do that? And what should we do about it? What are the opportunities for regulatory reform? And where are we most at risk of new and bad policies? With that, I will introduce our guests. There is much that could be said about each of them, but I am under direction to be extremely brief, so please refer to um, their additional information included in conference materials. First, Casey Mulligan is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago and former chief economist for President Trump's Council of Economic Advisors. Next, James Broll is a senior research fellow focused on regulation and regulatory institutions at the Mercatus Center and adjunct professor of law at George Mason University Law School. And finally, Brian Kaplan is a professor of economics at George Mason University, adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and editor and chief writer for Bet On It, the blog hosted by University of Texas. Remarks will be provided in the order panelists were introduced. 
Um, each panelist has seven minutes each. Then we will move to have a whole group conversation. And then following that, we will ensure that there's time for audience Q&A. So if you wouldn't mind holding your questions till then. With that, let's start with Casey. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to start out with uh, my definition of populism, which I think is pretty close to the way Vanessa was using the term. Um, and actually, I adopt my definition from str strain, uh, although he and I look at it a little differently. And he referred to it as uh, pitting the people against the elites. Um, where I would differ from him, uh, maybe some others, is number one, these elites do exist. <laughs> Even in the Trump White House, it felt like a Harvard College reunion. <laughs> and we, had a, we were low on the Harvard percentage. <clears throat> um, and this conflict is not imagined. That's what Strain like will tell you, well, this is just an imagined thing that, that the uh, downtrodden are uh, doing for their own entertainment. You know, people really do suffer from significant policy mistakes. And the elites don't acknowledge these mistakes, probably in many cases aren't even aware of them, let alone fix them. Um, and I, had, I wrote a book about uh, the good and the bad and the ugly in the Trump administration as I saw it. And I have a bunch of examples of that. I'm going to share a couple with you in just the couple minutes I have today. Um, this is data on um, dr deaths from drug overdose. This is an index, so it starts at 100 in uh, 2000. You heard the number last year went over 100,000 people in America in one year dying from, from drug overdose. Um, but this epidemic, as they call it, goes way back, uh, a couple decades. Uh, and it was raging. And uh, one of the regulatory decisions that was made um, by Attorney General Eric Holder, and President Obama is very supportive of this, in fact, that's kind of a Holder's condition for joining the administration, was that they were going to fix the problem they were focused on, which was the incarceration. Incarceration has costs for the people incarcerated. So they decided, you know, we're not going to be putting people uh, in jail, federal prison anymore for uh, drug offenses. They're not violent. Uh, meanwhile, lots of people are dialing, but, but I guess death and is, is, isn't a violent thing. And they weren't just talking. The federal prison population had increased like 33 years in a row and started, headed straight down right when Holder made that decision. Um, just a coincidence, don't call the causality police on me, although I guess police don't prosecute anybody for anything anymore, but <laughs> um, just by coincidence, that's when fentanyl entered our country on a permanent basis. It had popped in here and there, and the DOJ would go beat it back, but it came in within three months of that decision um, and hasn't left us. And you can see a huge spike in uh, the overdose deaths. Susan Rice, who's now the director of uh, domestic policy in the White House, in her autobiography, she begins with her day moving out of the Obama White House uh, during Trump's speech. And she overhears the part of his speech where he uses the phrase American carnage. And she's appalled, like, how could he ever use such a word? This is how he could use such a word. Um, in fact, he was pretty specific. Drugs have stolen too many lives. I'm not sure Susan Reif was even aware of this, by this time, hundreds of thousands of people who had died from that, and many hundreds of thousands more family members who didn't like going to those funerals. Um, and President Trump said the American carnage stops right here and right now. Um, well, there's the inauguration date, by the way. Um, here said, when I say Susan Rice, not aware, she didn't mention in her book. Big, long book, she got to talk a lot about things, didn't talk about the opioid epidemic at all. Um, and what I did is I looked throughout the entire Federal Register, which is the, really the kind of daily newspaper for the federal government, um, and how often was opioids mentioned and how much was climate change mentioned. It's, it's totally out of proportion uh, during the Obama years. Uh, that reversed uh, during the Trump years, but during the Obama years, clearly they're talking about something that the Harvard grads are really uh, interested in, and the people in Ohio aren't. Uh, let's be frank about it. And the people in Ohio are getting a little angry, and justifiably so. So where does regulation come in here? I mentioned the Department of Justice activities. That's an aspect of regulation. Um, it's indulging the preferences of the elite. Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa mentioned that, and that's what Trump called a rigged system. I, it's not a bad phrase to use. Uh, 
let me give you another example, the individual mandate. I, Jason's talk, which I really enjoyed, he talked about how around the ACA, the government people didn't do the arithmetic that well. Well, they're also just kind of clueless how things work, including the experts. So many of the professors on this topic said, we have to mandate health insurance, otherwise the market's gonna fall apart. Well, people hated that individual mandate. And actually, Obamacare didn't fall apart when we got rid of it. And they were just totally wrong, and they made people upset for no policy reason in the end. Um, and they just, they're not all knowing, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, and it's not an accident that Trump continues to brag about getting rid of the individual mandate because it was such an angering thing to people and served very little purpose. Uh, lots of prohibitions of low, so-called low quality products. Again, indulging the preference of the elite. You gotta have a certain type of insurance. You gotta have a certain type of car, a certain type of safety, a certain type of this, a certain type of that. You gotta have an electric car. <laughs> That's for the rich people, right? And well, we're gonna force us all to have that. Um, one example I give in, in the book is about payday loans. Read J.D. Vance's perspective on payday loans. He's actually used them as a consumer. And then read Elizabeth Warren's view on payday loans. Entirely different. Um, and then a lot, another one I mentioned is drug prices. That was a big issue in the populist world. Why are drug prices gone up so much? The people don't analyze it. They're not sure why. They just see what their cost. Well, one of the things that was going on is the FDA was actually blocking generic manufacturers on an age-old drug, and they wouldn't say, allow them to come in there and produce it. And that made drugs very expensive until uh, President Trump got a letter, read of a lot of that. This is my last slide. This is my estimates um, of what reviving the regulatory state would cost. I made this in 2020, thinking, well, if President Trump is gone and, and a Democrat replaces him and kind of brings the regulatory state back to the Obama uh, pathway, what's it gonna cost the different quintiles of the income distribution? And these regulations are very costly on the low-income people. Because um, again, where the regulation is indulging the high preference, uh, the, the high class lifestyle. And they, they might not understand the details, but they understand that the system's rigged against them. And every once in a while, they, uh, often in a Tuesday in November, they speak up. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. We'll move to James. Uh, thank you very much. So we've heard a lot today about some of the downsides of, of populism, and I'm not gonna refute any of the complaints we've heard about uh, changes to antitrust policy or antagonism to free trade. But I would like to talk about what I see are maybe some of the upsides of populism. Uh, Casey mentioned the definition of populism. I looked it up as well before. And the definition I found says, a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups which to me doesn't sound so bad. I mean, shouldn't politics represent the interests of common people and not just some tiny elite group? Uh, and I would argue that in the area of regulation and regulatory reform, that populist politicians, uh, Donald Trump is one example, but I, I think it's true at the state level as well, tend to be pretty open-minded on regulatory reform. And they, they may be some of the best allies actually at the moment for regulatory reform. I should probably start off with a qualifier and say I do think the government needs experts, especially when it comes to science, technology, innovation policy, and, and economic policy as well. Economics is very counterintuitive. I think to the average person opening up American Economic Review, a lot of that looks like Scientology to them. With that all said, experts make mistakes. They're humans too, and there's a lot of reasons to doubt experts. Uh, especially over the last 20 years or so with the experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, before that Vietnam, financial crisis, some of the response to the pandemic, and, and on and on. That said, uh, President Trump, who, who was probably the most populous president at least so far in my lifetime, he was uh, a big supporter of regulatory reform. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about what, some of the things that his administration did on regulatory reform. Uh, it wasn't all perfect. Some of it has been undone by the Biden administration. Uh, but some of it has also inspired further changes at the state level. So Trump instituted the first regulatory budget in U.S. history uh, at, the, at the federal level or in any state, too. Uh, what this did was it, imposes, it imposed cost caps, uh, caps on the amount of cost that regulations could uh, 
impose on the public with their rules in any particular year. Uh, a number of states have actually built on these reforms. So Ohio and Virginia are both examples of states that have s simpler regulatory budgets than the federal government had, but examples of regulatory budgets. In fact, Ohio just passed a law this year that requires a 30% across the board reduction in regulatory requirements across agencies in the state. Trump, his, he was probably best known for his one in, two out policy, which a lot of elites and intellectuals made fun of. They said this is a silly policy, there's no economic justification for it. Uh, we've seen Idaho, Arizona, Texas, Ohio, Oklahoma have all adopted some version of this policy, uh, either one in, one in, one in, one out, one in, two out, one in, three out. In some cases, they've codified this into law. And I think that this policy was helped the, keep the regulatory tide at bay. Um, and that's really, in some ways, the legacy of the Trump administration was they just, he was able to keep the regulatory state kind of on pause for four years, and now it's starting to rev up again. Um, but I also think a lot of these reforms are likely to come back. Um, let's change gears and look a little bit about the record of the experts when it comes to regulatory reform. So I would say the main change to the regulatory system over the last 40 years has been the introduction of cost-benefit analysis into the federal regulatory process and also this technocratic review process at the Office of Management and Budget. So rules undergo review by experts at OMB and they provide feedback, often economic feedback. And so this has led to this idea of a cost-benefit state, which is what Harvard Law Professor Cass Sunstein talks about. Well, the cost-benefit state, as, as Wayne Cruz at the Competitive Enterprise Institute has talked about, is largely a myth. I mean, there's barely any cost-benefit analysis even done in the federal government. Uh, it's, so this idea that there's all these technocrats reviewing every regulation, making sure that everyone, uh, every one of these rules has benefits and excessive costs, it's not true. It's a myth. Uh, I did a study a couple years ago with Laura Jones of uh, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. We found about 7% of rules go through OMB review, so 93% don't go through it. Uh, about 2% of rules are required to have a regulatory impact analysis. Only about 1%, which includes a cost-benefit analysis. Only about 1% of rules actually have a cost-benefit analysis or something approximating it. And about 4 tenths of 1% of rules have a cost-benefit analysis with both a cost and a benefit estimate. So 4 tenths of 1% of regulations, that's the cost-benefit state. And the reality is a lot of these are just, e they're EPA air regulations. They're important regulations, but that's really where the cost-benefit analysis is done and everything else kind of escapes the process. And even where it is done, there's a lot of value judgments that go into the analysis, and the, the biases of the analysts tend to get built into the, uh, become biases in the analysis itself as well. And so there's clearly a danger of taking populism too far. We don't want to reject good science. We don't want to be just at the whim of the, of the mob. Okay, we don't want QAnon running the government. Um, but on the, on the other hand, we don't want out of touch experts maybe who have their noses in books and don't have much real world experience. Uh, they're not, they don't always have the best track record either. And to me, the alternative to both of these extremes is what we're, I think we're all here today to support, which is markets, free markets. Uh, we're at the Cato Institute today. Free markets demonstrate that there, it's not all madness in crowds, and I don't think it's all madness in populism. There's quite a bit of wisdom in crowds as well. Thank you. Thanks, James, and now to Brian. It is thrilling to be back here at Cato in person. It is wonderful to see all of you here. I haven't been here in years. Uh, the question before us is, does the, regular, does the regulatory state fuel populism? Whenever someone asks me a question, I like to listen and answer the question literally. This is one of my eccentricities. All right, uh, so just to start, um, what is populism? Uh, surprisingly, we've already had two other definitions of populism. I have a different one that I like very much. Uh, in psychology, there's a concept that I think all economists need to know much better. It is called social desirability bias. It is a fancy term for something we all know in real life, namely, when the truth is ugly, people lie. Am I fat? 
Oh, of course not. You look great. Um, uh, furthermore, sometimes the lies become so ubiquitous that people start believing absurd things because they just never hear anything else. I think of populism as really the political version of social desirability bias. It's when you evaluate policies purely on how they sound superficially. You don't want ugly truths. Ugly truths like that sounds good, but it fails a cost-benefit test. Right? Uh, the kinds of things that I think of as really exemplifying uh, social desirability bias, you know, if it saves one life, if it saves one life, then we should do it. Right? Never mind if it inconveniences hundreds of millions of people. Right? That is the kind of thing that works in politics, saying, look, we're doing this to save lives. Well, how many lives? And how hard is this going to be? Those are the kinds of questions you generally do not want to ask in politics. And as far as I know, this is true in every known country. Even dictatorships try to go and sell themselves with a lot of feel-good nonsense, where if you really think about it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Another example that I really like of social desirability bias at work is universal programs. We should take care of every American. Well, who's taking care of every American if we're taking care of every American? There's something weird about that. I was talking to Denmark a couple weeks ago, and I was saying, I know you guys think your democracy works better, but in this way, you're the worst in the world. You are, the, you are one of the countries where you spend a whole lot of the budget helping everyone, including most people who don't actually need the help. If you were a philanthropist, you wouldn't go and give a dollar to every human on Earth. You would say, where are the war orphans? Let's target the money to where it will actually do a lot of good. And yet, that kind of talk saying, well, do we really want to waste money on everyone? Why don't we just focus on the specific narrowly tailored problems? Again, that does not sound very good in politics. And so we do see so much politics is really about saying things that sound good and then spending money in ways that sound good or regulating people in ways that sound good, even though the actual payoff is very small. Or as we're discovering, they don't even do a cost-benefit analysis, which I do have to say um, is a very elite thing to do, by the way. I've never heard a random person just say, you know what we need more of in government? Cost-benefit analysis. That sounds very much like something where elites are not getting their way, actually. Um, so we're thinking about there. Uh, now, uh, that is what I think of as populism. It's this politics of social desirability bias. It's thinking that, what, that we should just do what sounds good, avoid what sounds bad, pretend as if there are no ugly truths in the world, even though the world's full of ugly truths. Um, now, on the actual question, does the regulatory state fuel populism? What I think is clear is that populism fuels regulation and fuels, fuels the regulatory state. If it saves one life, that sounds good and it leads to a pile of regulation where we spend massive amounts of money trying to get very small gains. We all saw this during COVID where just the smallest hypothetical possible gain is led to make almost everyone in an area miserable or just say, look, we can't do something fun because there's a one in a million chance this could lead to someone going to a hospital. Like, well, maybe that person who's so worried should just stay home. Again, that doesn't sound very good, but it's the same thing you would say if someone says, I can't go to the concert, I might die if I drive there. You know, if you're that worried, you probably you just shouldn't go rather than saying we can't have a concert because someone might die on the way to the concert. Uh, so I would say that it's very clear that the reverse version of this is correct, that populism does fuel the regulatory state, but that wasn't the question we were asked. The question we were asked is, does the regulatory state fuel populism? On this, I think the honest answer is probably not. Why not? We have a lot of evidence that policy is heavily based upon perceptions of voters. But when we go and try to see what causes those perception to vote, perceptions of voters, one of the main things that does not seem to cause voter perceptions is reality. Uh, there is a fantastic paper by, let's see, by, by, Gimpel, by Gimpelson and Treisman on public perceptions of inequality around the world. What they discover is that there is barely any connection between perceived inequality in a country and actual inequality in the country. There are people in very, you know, there are countries where inequality is in fact very low, where you ask people there and they think that it's high. There are countries where inequality is actually very high and people think that it's relatively low. Uh, even more impressively, they find that no correlation at all between changes in inequality in the real world and changes in perceived inequality. 
Uh, this means, for example, that every free market person who has said, let's have some more redistribution because then people won't be so worried about inequality and then we can get more support for free markets. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You are under the illusion that actually changing inequality will change perceived inequality and the evidence says otherwise. Uh, the same goes for almost any other political variable that people care about. You know, are we being inundated by foreign products? You know, the actual relationship between changes in foreign trade and changes in perceptions of the amount of foreign trade, probably next to nothing. And we can go down the list. Um, now I am, of course, like most people, emotionally I like the idea that everything I don't like goes together. But that's just not true. Again, that's another ugly truth. So while, since I don't like the regulatory state in general, I don't like populism in general, I like the idea that each causes the other in a horrible, despicable tangle of causation. Um, causality police could get involved there too, I guess. Uh, but I think you know, the reality is that it is not objective facts that cause people to support any political policies. You know, what does matter? I mean, of course, the really easy one is political perceptions are very much based on conformity. Other people think something, so I think something. Probably a whole lot of beliefs about COVID is, are based on that. Certainly, public beliefs about COVID couldn't be based upon scientific research because most people don't read scientific research, couldn't understand it if they did read it. So it's more along the lines of, well, what are the people that I know saying? What is the popular view among my tribe? You know, of course, media also plausibly plays a role there, although we've got to worry about reverse causation. People are going to tend to watch the media that says what they want to hear. Right, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, the kind of regulatory state that I am most focused on in my work right now is regulation of housing. Uh, this is one where, on the one hand, I'm very much in agreement with almost every other economist who studies it, saying that housing regulation is terrible and is doing immense harm. But then even economists will often assume, well, the problem here is objective self-interest, is that homeowners are the median voter and they know that it benefits them to have this regulation because it keeps prices up. There's, again, so much evidence against this. Uh, tenants are very nimby too. The people who clearly lose from housing regulation because they rent and they don't own homes, you can generally see that they have a lot of support for housing regulation too. So what's going on? It just doesn't sound good to normal people to say, let fat cats build some stuff and then you will be able to get a cheaper house. Sounds much better to say, let's have an affordable housing program where government then goes and builds it with its nonprofit hands and then allocates it based to people on need. That is the kind of thing that sounds better. Uh, so um, this is one where, again, I, would I kind of like the idea that uh, housing regulation is causing a bunch of other problems politically, but I think really what's going on is social desirability bias. The good arguments for housing are ones that don't have a lot of emotional appeal. And so I think that's the, the general story, the what's going on. Sorry. Thank you, Brian, for your comments, and I appreciate you literally answering the question, and also James and Casey really um, doing the same in various different ways. I guess I want to start with Casey, since, um, since we started with Casey before, um, and I want to be a little bit more practical in this question, and you'll, you'll have to forgive me. I'm most recently was on the Hill, and so I'm interested in how we get policy done. And I know that you saw a lot of policy getting done as part of the Trump administration um, in a very, you know, a, a very successful administration, as James alluded to, um, in terms of regulatory reform. So I'm wondering if you could just actually tell us a little bit about that. Um, what were the obstacles or what was the resistance like? I'm sure that you associated with senior officials across agencies and they probably told you their war stories. Um, and were there sort of strategies within the administration that were effective or um, that you think could be uh, improved for next time? I really, I really like that question. Uh, I thought a little bit about it so I can give some decent answer. Um, the, the regulatory budget came through this set of research. It was a small group of people at the time who had kind of scholars who had kind of worked out, well, how should a regulatory budget work? Um, 
and uh, Rosen was an important part of that. And he, he was on the transition team, uh, made an executive order very early in the first month or so, um, got OMB running on that. Then he went over to Department of Transportation to oversee what was going to be the single biggest deregulation around CAFE standards. Um, and then President Trump moved him over to Department of Justice to defend the lawsuits that were coming. <laughs> um, so some, having some of those senior personnel uh, with those skills was, was important. The other thing we learned, maybe a little bit by accident, uh, and, I, and we kind of got an A-B test on this, is to have a set of principles. Well, you asked what the obstacles, the bureaucracy, deep state, if you want to call it that. There are going to be the obstacles, um, and they're formidable ox obstacles. Um, and so what we did in the health area is we laid out a set of principles, and it's called the Choice and Competition Report. You can still see it on the web. Uh, they didn't take it down. And it laid down the different principles. Uh, you know, consumers ought to choose, there ought to be free entry and, and those sort of things. And we gave specifics uh, and uh, allow nurses to practice and stuff like that. It's a big, thick report. Um, really, we wrote it in, in the right House, but it's, it's an HHS product. And so they're kind of on board. And then every time the deep state came in over the White House and said, well, we want to do this, and we're like, wait a second, didn't we have this report that said we like want more competition, and you're coming in with a reg that's going to reduce the number of hospitals or number of insurers? And, that slowed them down. That's the A part. Now, in the B, in the labor area, we did not do a set of principles. Um, and instead, we dealt with the deregulation there and kind of one off at a time. And that we were less productive there. And I think not having principles was, uh, would have been helpful. Every time we're dealing with labor, instead of arguing on this one reg, we're like, can we go back to our principles? But we didn't have any. So uh, the type of things that Cato and the other groups could do would be to be ready with a set of principles for each agency uh, uh, on how to operate. Um, and then the president was important. Um, you know, I, I've, I've told this story about uh, Operation Works. You know, we studied the pandemic, pandemic's economics in 2018. Um, really, the national security people came to us and they said, us, the econ people, and they're like, you know, we're a little worried that a foreign country might unleash a virus on us, or it might jump from animals. We're not sure which. <laughs> what, kind, what should the economic policy be around that? And, and we, we thought about that for a while, and we said, you know what? Got to get government out of the way. During the pandemic, you don't have time to sit around and wait for approvals and all this kind of stuff. We need it to get the vaccines and the treatments. We need it fast. We had executive orders on that in 2019, before anybody ever heard of COVID. We had worked that out. Uh, that was a little, and part of the reason is Trump was very enthusiastic about that project. Um, meanwhile, Trump was getting experience on how to get the FDA to turn that FDA ship, because remember I mentioned the generics earlier. So he had already worried about, already dealt with the personnel over at FDA, and he got kind of a good rapport with them, and he made them feel good, and they part of the team. And so he, he learned how to turn the FDA ship already in 2017 and 2018, and so then when COVID came and it was time for a warp speed and we really didn't need to turn the ship, we got it, we got it done. Warp speed came by the end of the year, despite the experts saying that it was not going to come, Fauci, not to mention any names. <laughs> Fauci, by the way, signed off on the executive order that said we were going to do it quickly in 2019. He came in his doctor suit. It was the first time Trump ever met him. And he, he signed off and said, because it's his area, you know, we don't do executive orders without consulting his team, and we did. But then all of a sudden in 2020, he's, he's pulling the president aside in front of the camera and saying, Mr. President, you can't say vaccine by the end of the year. The FDA needs a year and a half. What are you talking about? We just worked that out in, in the working groups before. And that's the example, the deep state and the expert being in the way. I mean, he wanted power for himself. And uh, having a quick cure was not going to be a, uh, good for, for his power. So those are, those are the obstacles, and those are some of the strategies we use and the ideas, I think, going forward.
Thank you. No, I appreciate that, and I'm happy to hear, delighted to hear that planning and research and preparation actually, they make a difference, <laughs> they do, since that's what we do here at Cato is research. Um, James, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, you wrote a, a piece recently on the next phase of regulatory reform at National Affairs, a piece that I enjoyed reading, and you mentioned in that piece that you think that libertarians and conservatives on, on regulation um, that they should be more pragmatic in their approach to regulatory reform. And I'm, I was interested in that. The piece was long enough that you didn't really have time to get into it, but I'm interested in what you were trying to get at there. Did you mean more sort of incremental reforms? Did you mean that we should tone down the rhetoric a little bit around you know, where we're headed or where we're going? Um, what were you thinking? That's a, that's a great question. So. One of the frustrations that I run into as kind of a free market leaning guy who's, who's dealing with public policy makers on a regular basis is just that there aren't that many people really like me on, in regulatory reform. Um, and so on issues like cost-benefit analysis, for example, it's, it's incredibly frustrating to me that value judgments, which are assen essentially um, there, the academic literature has come to support of a lot of what I consider ethical or value judgment decisions. And then these are the analysts in the government can point to the academic literature and say, look, we're just following the science. Like if you open up studies about the discount rate that's used in cost benefit analysis, now this is an ethical choice that, it, that goes into the analysis. It's not like there's a right answer about how much to wait, wait to put on the future. But you open up these articles on this topic and they're just full of math and equations. And it looks like science and it's very confusing for the, av the average policymaker to see that it's not science. Mm -hmm. And so it's an area where I think the elites, the, the analysts are kind of pulling a fast one on the public. And I feel like there just needs to be more of a concerted team effort. Um, I'm, I feel somewhat on my own on, on some of these debates where I point out some of these issues and there's just not a lot of other people uh, who can come to my support. I, some libertarians are just, they don't want to get involved in any of it. Mm -hmm. They're more like, I don't believe in anything that the government's doing and that's it's somehow they're sacrificing their principles somehow to get involved. And then there are other more free market people who, are, who have this more kind of like go along to get along sort of approach and they, they want to make friends with people on the other side and gain the respect and go to certain conferences and so forth and get invited to get certain positions in the government maybe and so they're not going to rock the boat too much. So if you want to actually change something, there's kind of a void in that area and so I wrote that piece in National Affairs to try, try to drum up some support and get people a little bit excited about hands-on policy work from a free market perspective. Thank you. Um, Brian, you have been one of the, I would say, probably louder, more extreme voices, um, in a good way, <laughs> in a good way, on regulatory reform. Um, so I, I would kind of like to hear um, how you think about reform messaging, strategy, you know, ideally, um, you know, how, how could we actually improve uh, the effectiveness of would-be free market reformers, um, folks on our team, in the, in the way that they either re approach reform or the way that they talk about it? Yeah, great question. People often come to me and they say, how can we make these arguments better? And my usual answer is the arguments are already fantastic. What we need to improve is the way we talk to people. I'm a big fan of Dale Carnegie's classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. How many people here have ever read the book? Yeah, it's, it's a great book. I read it in high school, actually, and I immediately saw it was all true, and then I ignored it because I didn't feel ready to do any of it. And then I spent about 20 years reinventing the wheel, realizing, wow, I'm talking to people in a very ineffective way, and it's not getting me anywhere. And then a few years ago, I reread it. Like, why did I reinvent the wheel? He gave me a wheel. Dale, <laughs> what was wrong with me? But anyway, that's all water under the bridge. You know, you know, there's some very basic things. The way that you talk to people. Always talk to people like they are your friend. Uh, even in a debate, even when the, the other person is heaping abuse on you, I tell people, just talk to that person as if that person is your best friend. I know they aren't really your best friend. 
but when you are watching that argument, it's just hard to take the side of the abusive person over the person who talks to the other person like a friend. And one-on-one, -on -one, again, it is very unlikely anyone will listen to you if you talk to them as if they are your enemy or as if they were stupid. It is always much better to be very friendly and again, like on the simplest level of just smiling at people. Right? This may seem obvious. Some people do it naturally, but most people don't, and especially when there's a political dispute. A lot of people who otherwise have good social skills forget everything they know and start talking at people. Right? And when I say this, it's not because I'm so great. <laughs> All I can say is I've improved. I've learned ways of talking to people in better ways. And, you know, I think that actually you get a lot further just with a smile and a good sense of humor while saying exactly the arguments that you think are best than by trying to go and tailor your arguments exactly but without having a good attitude, without smiling. In terms of bigger things that you can do, uh, you might have heard I wrote a nonfiction graphic novel on immigration called Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration. A lot of the reason why I did it is because I'm just looking for ways to have a broader reach and to be more persuasive to other people. One really nice thing when someone is animating you is that in real life, I'm never the best Brian Kaplan. In real life, I never have quite the right smile, the right tone, but when I have an artist drawing me, I can actually tell him, you know, Zach, make my smile 7% bigger. <laughs> All right, make my, make my eyes 3% sadder. Right, so when I'm illustrated, I can actually achieve the supernatural level of being just the right way I ought to be. Of course, it's a cartoon, but it's the cartoon saying just what I want to say. I've got another graphic novel on housing regulation coming out, and I'm going to say it's going to be the most fascinating book on housing regulation anyone has ever done, right? Because it is combining words and pictures, which then work on a lot of levels. You can go and convey all the information, but at the same time, you can also give the right emotional tenor to not just the book overall. You can micromanage it. You can have every single passage, every single frame, showing the right tone, the right emotions in order to win people over. Right. I guess the, you know, the one other thing that's great about doing these graphic novels, by the way, is I really widened my age base. Right. So all of my other stuff, basically the limit, other than Jason Furman's son, is like high school students. So Jason's re you know, Jason reads my books in middle school, so yeah, another great compliment to Jason's son. Haven't met him, but I'm looking forward to it. But anyway, with the, when I was doing the graphic novel, my five-year-old daughter was reading it over my shoulder. There have been a lot of kids that have stolen the book from their parents and read it, and it does not mean they understood everything. But like anything that you can do that just broadens your audience, and yes, uh, there is a lot of truth to the idea that if you can communicate to people when they're younger, you are much more effective and much more able to change their minds. You can do this for evil, of course. You can go and get a kid and brainwash him at a bunch of nonsense, but if you've already done intellectual due diligence and done a good job and thought about it carefully, don't be ashamed to tell a child what you think. I'm not. Well, I sure think that that is a, a great recommendation to be, to be, to try to be polite at very minimum. Friendly, not just polite. <laughs> polite is what you are at a funeral. No, friendly. Oh. That's what we want. <laughs> <laughs> you realize when you're working with people on the other side that that is the only way that you can actually have a working relationship is if everybody starts from the basis of we're going to at least be polite, so um, because it can uh, go downhill quickly if, if people start breaking social norms. So, um, Well, that's great. I guess I want to make sure that we have time for audience Q&A as well, but I did want to circle back on one thing that kind of came up a couple of times during the conversation, during people's remarks, and that is the idea of elitism and how that influences um, the policy making, policy making preferences and policy making. Um, and I've certainly seen in various different places, and Brian may disagree with me on this, but I think in child care regulations, you, you can see some of this. You know, DC just implemented a rule where they want daycare staff providers to have uh, bachelor's degrees, um, and they have a variety of other things that they want them to have as well in terms of experience and focus um, within, within those educational requirements. And that seems like something that is 
exciting if you are maybe an upper, uh, upper income person, uh, parent. Uh, maybe you want your kid's daycare provider to have a master's degree if you have enough money. But a lot of people are just actually trying to get their daycare needs met so that they can go to work. They want accessible, you know, safe. They want a caring person there that will uh, meet the basic demands of uh, their child during the day, which are pretty, pretty basic um, um, when you are are just a little taut. So, so I guess maybe if I could just have the three of you react to, to that, and you know, there are certainly places, as Brian has mentioned, where maybe this doesn't actually explain um, what's going on perfectly. And if it's, if it's not the best ex explanation, um, what's a better explanation? Yeah, I would say that Regulation requiring that all daycare providers have a bachelor's degree is a classic case of social desirability bias. It is really easy to make that sound good to almost anyone. Say, shouldn't every preschool child be taught by a highly trained, skilled person? Shouldn't we go and not cut corners on something like this? Isn't the welfare of these little children too important for us to be worrying about cost? Now, this doesn't mean that parents are not going to be thinking about costs when they're spending their own money. But you know, a lot of what we get out of really thinking about economics versus politics is that there is a big difference between how people think when they're spending their own money, where it's like, it has to be the best is just not something people really do because that's my money. But on the other hand, for a politician to say every child deserves the best, it is hard to argue against that in a way that sounds good. If you were to say, well, look, it's too expensive to give everyone the best. That doesn't sound good. Or if you say, look, maybe they're a little bit better, but it's not worth the cost. That doesn't sound good, right? You could just go with, I don't care whether they've got a degree as long as they love children. That's probably getting close to the best they're going to do. I don't know the actual data on support for these regulations. I think you're right that less educated people are, would be less totally in favor of the regulation. But I would also think that it has very broad cross-class appeal because the way that you sell it is just by saying, doesn't every child deserve the best? Well, that should be a matter of law. So this came up a little bit in the National Affairs article as well as I, one of my complaints about regulatory economics in general is I, I just don't feel like our theories about where regulation comes from, why we get particular regulations are completely adequate. We have a few different theories. There's a public interest theory that says regulators are correcting market failures and they're looking out for, the social, for social welfare. There's capture theory that says they're just acting in the interests of business. There's the public choice theory that says they're just out for themselves, kind of. And I think that there's truth to all of these stories, but um, it doesn't fully explain why one particular story seems to be more correct at one time and another theory might se seems to make more sense at another time. And I also feel like there's underappreciation for just ideology in general, maybe culture to some extent, um, the ideology of intellectuals, of, reg of regulators, and this kind of relentless drive that they seem to have to continue doing good as they see it and solving problems really irregardless of whatever the costs or consequences might be. Uh, I think net neutrality is a good example of a, of a policy that nobody was really clamoring for. It came from a, a Tim, Tim Wu at Columbia University. It's a really just kind of an intellectual exercise, and now it's got this whole momentum of its own behind it. And so it's just another reason why I think we just need more good people involved in, in regulation is to come up with better theories of regulation and explain the administrative state better than we're doing now. You know, in your, in your example, and also when I discuss, I, I, I want to say more about the capture theory. The special interests are a big factor. Uh, they were, in principle, an obstacle in the deregulatory exercise. The regulatory budget helped a lot with that because they, of course, they wanted their individual regulation, but a lot of them told us, they said, you know what, I don't like to see this regulation go, but I really appreciate all those other regulations that you got rid of that are really helping my company, my customers, my family. Um, the exception of that was the auto companies because their one regulation was just too giant to uh, compare to the, all the other ones that we were getting rid of. So the special interests are, are, are very important. Uh, but I took the topic today to be kind of the delta on top of that, which is does a higher amount of populism affect, affect all of this, and is it affected by regulation? 
Thank you. Thank all of you. Um, I'm sure that we have questions from those that have been listening. I'm going to start in the back with Jason. Uh, this is mostly for Casey, but anyone else can answer it too. I'm always suspicious when someone thinks everything that's popular also largely corresponds to everything that's good, and I'm worried they've either deluded themselves about what's popular or deluded themselves about what's good or possibly both. I wanted to ask you where you see those two in tension, and would you think that immigration and trade were two areas where President Trump did what might be the populist, possibly even popular thing, but at odds with what we in the ivory tower would think was actually good for people? Um, President Trump, on his own, I, I was, we were part of a group of making a recommendation to Trump about immigration policy. And I said, in a closed meeting with just economists, I said, well, we should give him Becker's solution, which is there should be a fee. They, they all laughed at me. <laughs> and they did an empirical analysis and showed Trump the different systems that Canada, Australia, other countries have. So they go into the meeting to show him this, and what Trump says, on his own, he says, you know, we should charge for this. <laughs> and what we ended up with, the, Trump's immigration plan, we, we lost the midterm, so it didn't go anywhere, but Trump's immigration plan, which was unveiled in the Rose Garden, you can read about it online, was essentially a point system like uh, Canada and Australia, which is kind of a regulatory poor imitation of the fee system, which is bringing people with high, who get a lot of points as an economic contribution. So it's kind of mimicking the, the type of people who would come in anyway. Um, but he, and he said, when he began that speech about his immigration plan, he said, immigration, you could hear, I could hear the Becker in it. He, could, he said, the uh, citizenship is the most precious thing we have to offer the people outside. Um, and I could hear him thinking that, you know, we should be charging for that, but, it, but we didn't. On trade, uh, yeah, he, he stirred up a lot of people with trade. Again, I would say, look at what he actually did. He came close to making a dent in the Jones Act. Um, he did tariffs instead of what Reagan did, which was quotas. The Japanese would come into Reagan's, and, and a lot of Reagan people, including Lighthouser, were there to see this and tell me about it. The Japanese would come into the White House in the Reagan era and say, can we have a quota? And then we'll say, sure. <laughs> we, we, got, we got our protectionism, and the Japanese com companies get rich. And Trump did it differently. He did it with the tariff. Now, of course, the free trade would be even better. But is that the relative al alternative? Uh, I, I'm not sure it is. Look, we got the Jones Act. Trump didn't invent the Jones Act, right? It's been around for uh, over 100 years. We got the chicken tax, which has been around my entire lifetime, over 50 years. Um, you know, Democrats and Republicans all signing on to that. And so I think what he did was uh, better than the alternatives that we've seen as a matter of history, as opposed to the alternatives that we have in the classroom, which we still, still should teach, of course. OK, right here in the pink. <laughs> the fuchsia. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will try to ask my friendliest question ever. <laughs> um, excellent panel, and a, another one. Thank you so much. Um, so from Brian, we got basically the answer that there is no coloration between a regulatory state and populism. But can I ask you whether you would see something that, in my experience, actually goes in that direction, but maybe somewhat differently, but very close to, to the mandate of, 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 of Cato Institute. And that is that when you over-regulate, you create moral hazard on behalf of the economic agents, can be firms, can be households, and that obligation to, uh, to, to deliver on that moral hazard when things go badly, you bail out. We did that 2008, 2009, <laughs> then we did big time in COVID. Everybody can be bailed out, actually, universally, as we learned. You know how it was financed. But... And you develop what I feel is, 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 is a big risk, is develop an interest in a paternalistic state, both by the individual, individuals and firms and the state. So it's not only the state or not only the elite, 
you, de you develop much deeper interest and uh, incentive in, in a paternalistic dependence on the state. And that I, it seems to me that's a big risk, and I'd like to, to with my smile, <laughs> I'd like to your, your views on that. So just to be clear, I, I actually think there is one way where there's a very close connection between the regulatory state and populism, which is populism causes regulation. The part where I'm doubtful is whether the regulation act, or is, is, yeah, is, is the other way around, where the regulation causes populism. Um, in terms of paternalism, I'd say that's another thing that sounds really good to most people. If you just say, hey, well, it's his life, let him do what he wants with it, that's not something that you're going to say in a presidential debate. That's not something that's going to win friends. On the other end, we say, look, we're all in this together. We care about everyone. We're all a big national family. Then, yeah, that's the kind of thing that goes over well. That's probably a, you know, the main reason why we do have so much paternalism is that it just doesn't sound very good to say he's an adult, let him do what he wants, live with the consequences. Um, I guess you know, there is this other idea that a lot of economists have that once we have a lot of redistribution, then if we don't combine it with some paternalistic regulation, then we're going to get moral hazards. So maybe that's what you had in mind, right? And again, that's one where you basically you wind up doing two things that sound really good to people, even though if you really thought about it, it's like, well, isn't the, isn't the problem caused by the first thing? So we're going to correct one problem with another thing. Why, you know, why is it you first go and take care of people, whatever they do, and then second of all, go and try to stop them from doing what they want? Why not just go and let people do what they want and live with the consequences? Yeah, so, you know, you know, so much of this just comes down to it's really hard to make the case because it doesn't sound very good, but you know, obviously, if you really took the premise of paternalism seriously, almost none of us could do anything. We would have to be having our calories counted down to the smallest level. Uh, this is one where uh, the main good thing in the world is just the people aren't that consistent, and so we don't. F when we have a bad premise, we don't actually f fulfill it. It's like you know, we haven't got, yet gotten to if it saves one life as a literal rule, because if it did that, none of us could be here. We'd always all have to be at home, locked in a bulletproof chamber, just to avoid the small risk of something going wrong. I, I'd just add real quickly: there are, there are some good studies out about the role of trust and how that affects the regulatory system and that countries with low trust tend to have more regulation. You can kind of get in this negative feedback loop that you're describing where the regulation leads to more dysfunction and people trust each other less, they demand more regulation and then that process goes on and on. And there's certainly plenty of evidence that American trust in institutions of all kinds have gone down in recent decades and that's probably associated with the populism phenomenon to some extent. Yeah. That's a case where I think there's a much better explanation of what's going on, namely that so societies differ in trustworthiness as well as trust. Trust basically follows trustworthiness. And then in countries where trustworthiness is low, you get bad governments, bad regulations, and also people say correctly that they don't trust things. Uh, that's not the same as saying if we could just get people to trust government, then regulation would go away. I think all else equal, if people trust the government more, they would want more, even more. It's just that there's this confounding variable of the trustworthiness that tends to get overlooked. Okay, in the corner, Jeff. I was very confused about what the relation was meant to be between the opioid crisis and populism for any definition of populism that anybody's given. Second, I was super surprised to see you attributing anything about the opioid death rate over time to the Holder Memo. The Holder Memo was about marijuana policy, not about opioid policy. It was a memo that more or less codified what was already happening, so it's not clear why it would have any effect, just as the rescinding of that memo almost certainly didn't have much effect on whether the federal government was enforcing the federal marijuana laws in states that legalized marijuana. But then third, I'm just curious of your perspective on the libertarian view about the opioid crisis, which is that it was caused by government by restricting access to opioids, which drives people to buy them underground where they're laced with unknown quantities of fentanyl and things like that. And it's the uncertainty about potency that you get in underground market that's the crucial cause of the overdose deaths. Thanks. Um, let me start with the uh the Holder memo was not codifying what already happened. Maybe at state levels, 
But if you look at federal prisons, peaks right when the memo comes out. Um, federal pr this is a matter of record. Anyone can look it up. Federal prisons peak in 2013. Federal prison populations peak in 2013. Um, and, you know, I didn't look up what those prisoners, were, exactly what they're booked on. But, you know, a lot of these guys deal in the multiple things, okay? And, and when they're put away, this was kind of Levitt's work, when people are put away behind bars, they're, they're less active on, on a lot of things. Um, what's the connection to populism? I mean, you missed the whole American carnage thing. Trump is going around the country in 2015, and people are saying, we got this big drug problem. Please do something about it. I'm sick of going to funerals in my neighborhood of, of these people. And... Um, He's listening, he's like, oh, okay, <laughs> I understand that's bothering you. Meanwhile, the Obama people aren't paying attention. That's why I brought the data on the Federal Register. Like, they're talking about climate change every day, but they're not talking about this opioid uh, issue, which was bothering people. Now, maybe a libertarian would say, don't listen. Uh, that's, I can understand that perspective. I was very much on the Milton Friedman view of drug regulation until the customers started dying at this at the rate. And now I became... I, I still appreciate it, but I'm I, I, a little slower to push the libertarian view when I see the number of customers uh, dr dropping dead from that. Okay, right here in the gray. Yeah, um, just a uh, quick background to my question. The um, live in Arlington and the county board and infinite wisdom is about to do away with single family house zoning and and, and they claim it's going to they're going to instead of a single house in the zoning you can have between 2 and up to 8 units in the same lot and um being an owner of a single family house in Arlington I I find this is very strange I wonder if you if any of you feel like you could make a prediction of what would be the end result of uh, doing away with the single family housing zoning and creating up to eight units in the same lot? Maybe, Brian? So I think it is a great idea. The experience so far is it won't change things nearly as much as you hope just because of the retrofitting that's involved. Uh, in the state of California, the, the way that they have done it, so they, you know, they have said that now you can have up to four pieces, uh, four, you know, four units on a lot, but the owner must continuously occupy the house while you are subdividing it, which is a reason to not do it. I don't know. So it is one where you need to re re read the fine print. In terms of what the argument is, the, the reason you want to subdivide is because the value is higher. The total value to, uh, to eight customers is higher than to one. Uh, while it is not as desirable to have one eighth of a property than all of it, very often people uh, people are willing to pay a lot more than eight times the value of the individual units. So it winds up being a big gain. Of course, you as an owner are free to sell out. But again, this, you know, this is a, you know, a standard case where there's a regulation trying to stop people from using their property in the most consumer-pleasing way. And yeah, I think that we should go and burn that stuff to the ground. Um, not just that, uh, you know, height regulations have to go, parking regulations have to go, ma a min max or minimum, land, uh, minimum lot sizes have to go. Uh, there's a lot of research on this saying that this has caused an immense increase in the price of housing way beyond the cost of production. Uh, probably now about half of the price of housing nationally is just caused by regulation. And it would be a lot better if we had a large increase in the production of housing so that we could enjoy cheap, spacious housing. Um, obviously, there's going to be some people who are unhappy about it. Um, the main thing to know is that the, you know, the people will complain about even the smallest changes. People will make a federal case out of it. There's a great book called Neighborhood Defenders where the authors went through every word spoken in zoning meetings in the state of Massachusetts. And what you can see is that you know, people will say, look, there's a, you know, a billion dollar project. It should be stopped because of a bird. Right? There's no cost benefit analysis being done. Instead, it's like, is this, is this something that bothers me even a slight amount? Uh, yeah, so you know, my view is um, this, re this regulation is terrible and it would be a huge improvement to get rid of it. Right here in the front. Thank you. Um, this is Russ Green with Stand Together. Um, I have a question for Casey. Um, as you're probably aware, 
There's a whole bunch of think tanks that have sprung up recently in the DC area that are essentially trying to codify populism, right? Basically create a doctrine, policy agenda um, off of you know, uh, President Trump's um, ideas and policies. But I think the irony here is that many of them seem to have interpreted populism as a reason to expand government or expand the arbitrary authority of the administrative state. So are they onto something or are they actually misreading populism in what uh, Trump actually intended and also what the base actually intended? I'd say they're misreading that. Another one I'd, thing I would point to is Brexit. I mean, w w was Brexit about expanding the government? I, I think there was a lot, of, with Brexit, there was a variety of issues, with, but why are the people in Northern England totally surprising the people in London? That's a, they don't even know, these people live 50, 100 miles away, they don't even know what they're thinking. And they're totally surprised. And what, what were the people upset about? Well, one of the things is like the idea that Brussels, like way over there, they're gonna tell me like how I'm gonna live. And that was pretty offensive. Uh, and there are other factors in there too. Um, but I, I think you see that as a, as a common denominator in, in uh, these populist movements. They don't like that other group uh, telling them what to do. Yeah, there's another psychological concept that I'm a huge promoter of, and that is action bias. It comes down to you know, something must be done, this is something, therefore this must be done. You know, anytime, anytime there's an accident and people say, well, what new safety regulations do we need? Well, what's the accident rate? Maybe this is the optimal accident rate, and so we shouldn't change anything, and we should just continue going about our lives. Um, I think a lot of what's going on with conservative groups that want to use government to achieve their ends is they just don't want to come to grips with the fact, look, whatever regulation you create, whatever bureau you create, will be in the hands of the, will be in the hands of the other party half the time, and the bureaucrats running it will be on the other side all the time. So what are you thinking? Right? You know, if you create a new Bureau of Internet Censorship, if it could pass the Supreme Court and everything else still, Democrats will be at the top half the time and they will be running the Bureau all the time. So why? It's like, well, we gotta do something. You know, sometimes nothing's a lot better than something. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, if anybody in the audience has one. Unfortunately, the um, provided iPad is no longer uh, powered up, so I won't be taking any from over the internet. In the back? Yeah, just trying to get my arms around this topic. And by the way, it's very refreshing to hear some positive spin on the Trump administration. We really hear far too little of that, generally, in circles in Washington. It seems to me that whoever wrote the question formulating it this way is looking at changes in government from a revolt, from a failure of the regulatory state. And a failure of the regulatory state is by definition a failure of elites because they run it. So that's what we saw with respect to Trump coming in. You could say in connection with the great financial crisis, that's what we saw with Obama coming in. And we saw it in Italy recently that the population there got fed up with the way government was working. Now, it's hard to define populism, but if you fit and everything everyone said here was very interesting. But is that really what we're talking about on a broad level? And thank God you do have these changes in regular in uh, government in which a new paradigm can come to the fore based on failure, as in massive government failure, like in Germany vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And it really doesn't make that much difference how you define it. Basically, less regulation as a generality is better because it's very hard to make the regulation work properly with given um, you know, clauses that we we cannot predict. I think we saw with central, central planning kind of showed us in a pretty stark way that there's so much information in this world 
that the planners don't have. And, and the regular people have it. They might not have the diplomas, but they're out there, they're living the life right there on the ground. And I think it's doomed to, to failure, and it has failed. And luckily we have a system where every once in a while, the people who it's failed can speak up. I, yeah, I would just add, I, I do think there's maybe a healthy degree of distance between some of the, pol the populist politicians like Trump and the, the base, and that that allowed him perhaps to experiment with some technocratic type policies that maybe uh, the base wasn't necessarily clamoring for. I mean, one example I can think of is this kind of deregulatory cost benefit analysis that was started in the Trump administration. I'm not sure where that came from, but I'd never heard. Uh, it, it's like, it was sort of an alternative to traditional cost benefit analysis that focused mostly on economic impacts. And I liked it a lot, and I thought um, it was very useful in fi identifying productive policies to move forward on. And um, that was really an innovation that the administration came up with, and it didn't seem to come out of any academic journal that I'm aware of. I could be wrong about that. Um, but I, so you don't want the people storming Capitol Hill to be running the government, as I said. I mean, so we want some distance between maybe the, the, the public, which can get pretty emotional and pretty upset and um, isn't always completely rational and the politicians who are sympathetic to them, um, and you want them to experiment with, with some technocratic type ideas too. The one in, two out, you know, was, uh, now, Rosen, I'm forgetting the first name, but Rosen had written Jeff papers. Rosen. Yeah, Jeff Rosen had written the papers on, on, on the budgeting. The one in, two out Trump found at the rallies really went over well. And, and you know, the regulatory budget was both. There was a, mm -hmm. just count the regs and do the ones and twos, and then there was an actual dollars column and there, the dollars column is kind of more useful for the reason you said, but the one and two was great for communication. And I got to infer the, that the fact that he was talking about that in 2016 and was still talking about it in 2020 means the people liked it. I mean, his people. Uh, I can confirm at the state level that's definitely the case, too. It's been quite popular among governors, and I think that's the reason why the public gets it. Okay, any other questions? We have one, we have one more. Let's <laughs> go right here. Uh, I'm Nigel Ashford, the Institute of Humane Studies, George Mason University. I'm deeply depressed about the state of the world today. Do you have any grounds for optimism in the area of deregulation? I mean, one thing I would say is what's going on at the state level. So I mentioned Ohio. Ohio passed a law in 2019 that required all the agencies in the state to do it, produce an inventory of all their regulations. This year they passed a law requiring to cut 30% of, of the regulations they identified in those inventories across the board. Um, Virginia had something similar. In 2018, a law was passed. Agencies had to do a review, produce inventories, a budgeting kind of system. Governor Yunkin signed an executive order as first day in office, I believe, requiring a 25% cut across the board. Then we've just seen a lot of these red tape reduction initiatives. They've had one in, two out, one in, one out. Um, and, and then I would say, I think the Trump administration set the groundwork for future reforms that are much more aggressive. Um, I, I would say there were a lot of these self-binding regulations that agencies issued where they'd put out a regulation like HHS sunset rules, a great example. Uh, HHS said, we're putting this regulation on the books that attaches expiration dates to all 18,000 of our regulations. Now, this was repealed by the Biden administration, but there's no reason why every department couldn't do, issue a regulation like that. And every department could issue a regulation like EPA had that requires the agency to do cost-benefit analysis and do it following certain criteria. And if they don't, then people can go to court and sue the agencies. This is one of the problems with court with the cost-benefit analysis as it is now is that you can't sue if it's not any good. Um, so I think bring back the regulatory budget, set goals like reduction targets, 25, 30% reduction goals based on the budgets, and more of these self-binding regulations, sunset provisions. There's, there are reasons to be optimistic, but it's an uphill battle for sure. And I've got something else for you, Nigel. We have just had two incredible years of massive deregulation. 
getting rid of COVID regulations piece by piece. Of course, that follows a massive increase in regulation, but you got to take what you can get, Nigel. <laughs> On that happy note, I think we're going to wind this event down. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and thanks especially to our panelists for their insights and for their time. Really appreciate them being here. Um, I'm told to tell everybody that there is a 15-minute break we're going to take right now. There are going to be snacks and drinks outside these doors, so please help yourself, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thanks again.
One, two. This is microphone number nine. It's really soft. One, two. One, two.
Okay, okay, everyone. Let's uh, let's settle in for this final panel discussion of the day. Um, Welcome for those of you just joining us to the Cato Institute. This is panel session five of this conference. Um, and this particular panel is entitled Unsustainable Fiscal Policy, the One True Bipartisan Commitment. And I know that this panel is gonna be deeply entertaining because they've even put the popcorn out for us uh, uh, for it. And it's actually difficult to think of a topic that's on the one hand so timely, but yet from a policy perspective so out of vogue. This week, the federal debt was in the news um, as its nominal value exceeded the milestone of $31 trillion. Now, as economists, we know these sorts of figures aren't meaningful without uh, context. So if we look for some historic context, the federal debt today stands at around 100% of GDP, which is the highest it's been since immediately after World War II. Unlike after defeating the Nazis, however, we don't have the prospect of demobilization slash in spending, and it doesn't look as if there's any, any appetite for running primary budget surpluses for a quarter century as we did then. Nor indeed do we enjoy the prospect of reaping the low-hanging fruit of greater female labor participation and other factors that boosted economic growth in those immediate two to three decades. In fact, with an aging population interacting with entitlement programs, debt is projected to soar on most assumptions in the coming decades. These are not debts that can be inflated away. A lot of them are inflation-proof promises to pay social security benefits and the real healthcare demands of Medicare. And that's before uh, the odd crisis, which seems to hit with an alarming regularity, adds uh, a debt to GDP of about 20 percentage points every 10 years. Now, it became uh, somewhat of a conventional wisdom sometime over the past decade that we could be comfortable about a higher level of uh, federal debt because interest rates have been low. Well, the cost of government borrowing has been rising this year and now stands at a similar level for many uh, maturities for treasuries to 2007. So are we at an inflection point? Is this a time to worry about the debt? And what even are we worrying about? What are the implications of a very, very high federal debt burden? Well, few outside of this room in DC seem that concerned, and ascendant political forces don't seem to care much about fiscal sustainability at all. Um, in fact, progressives were pushing for a huge expansion of the social safety net as part of the Build Back Better program, and until recently, of course, a highly expensive Green New Deal National conservatives want to prioritize other things than pesky GDP growth. Uh, they want to curb immigration, for example, one of the few obvious non-fiscal levers where liberalization can perhaps, in the near term at least, ease these pressures. So on that happy note, to discuss our fiscal prospects, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, four distinguished panelists. We've got Jeff Myron, who's Vice President of Research here at Cato and Director of Graduate and Undergraduate Studies at Harvard's Economics Department. We've got Alan Cole, who's a, a Senior Economic Policy Analyst at the Committee for Economic Development. We've got Mark Goldwyn, Senior Vice President and Senior Policy Director at the Committee for a Responsible Budget. And last but not least, uh, Ramina Boccia, Director of Budget and Entitlement Policy, well, the new Director of uh, Budget and Entitlement Policy here at the Cato Institute. Uh, each speaker will have a, up to seven minutes for some opening uh, remarks, and then we'll have a moderated uh, conversation. And I'll try to leave as much time as possible for audience Q&A, because I know that this is a topic that really stirs the passion. So on that note, I'll hand straight over to Jeff. Thanks very much. Uh, happy to be back up here. So I have six points. I'll try to get that in in my seven minutes. First point is that the situation is serious. This is a projection of the debt to GDP ratio for the US going out to 2052. And as it goes all the way back to 1900, you can see that it's projected, it's currently about where it was in World War II. It's projected to be much, much worse. And if you adopted the same assumptions that went into this graph and projected it even further, it just goes up and up and up forever, okay? except it can't actually go up forever. Okay. Now, some people console themselves by saying projections can be wrong. Well, of course, projections can be wrong. They're almost always wrong, at least a little bit. They can be wrong in either direction. Okay? We have some record of how good the CBO's projections have been. 
In the last 10 or so years, they've been mildly too optimistic. Okay? But, of course, that could change. Okay? But there, as Ryan just mentioned, there are tons of things that could happen, the next COVID, World War III, on and on, that could make things much worse than the CBO projections. Okay? So is, it, is there any realistic chance we'll just get lucky and things will go in the better direction? Not much. Okay? Second point, faster growth is extremely unlikely to solve the problem. Of course, faster growth is good. Repealing bad regulations and excessive tax rates and all those things are good. But we would need highly implausibly higher growth for it to make a difference. This is, from, again, from the CBO data and their forecasting systems. So the solid line in the middle is their projection out to 2052 of what they call their extended baseline. Okay, I won't get in too much in the weeds, but that incorporates their basic assumptions, some of which are imposed on them by Congress, they're supposed to make these forecasts based on those assumptions, even though we know those assumptions are not necessarily the most accurate or realistic, and that'll come up again in a moment. You can see that you could slow things down, the trajectory of the debt relative to GDP, if we had 0.5 percentage points faster growth per year every single year, that would be a huge improvement in the U.S. growth performance. There's never been that kind of improvement. Average growth okay, is something like maybe two and a half to two and three quarter percent over the long haul for rich developed countries that are at the technological frontier. We're not talking about really, really poor countries that might catch up okay, to the frontier much faster than that, like South Korea did or things like that. So um, getting to that better path Okay, is extremely unlikely, and even that path isn't so great. Even on that path, we're eventually going to have a fiscal crisis. Okay. Third point, if you make more realistic assumptions about the path of spending and taxation than the ones CBO is forced to use in its extended baseline, then things look much worse. Okay. So, for example, they're forced to assume something about the discretionary expenditure in the budget relative to GDP, but the historical data would suggest okay, that it's not going to be that low, that it's going to be higher, okay. and so that means the deficits are going to be bigger and the debt is going to grow faster. And you can see, depending on which of their alternatives you consider, things look you know, substantially worse even than their baseline projections. Fourth point, okay, is that there is something which works to slow the growth of the debt to GDP path to a substantial degree, and that is limiting the growth rate of entitlements. Notice that I said growth rate, okay, that's crucial. Okay, all the level effects on this topic are sort of irrelevant because various things are growing so fast that even if they're initially small, they're going to grow to become too big relative to everything else. So this assumes that we hold Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, miscellaneous other entitlement programs fixed as a percentage of GDP. Not eliminating these programs, not holding them constant in real dollars, letting them grow in real dollars, but no faster than GDP. And that makes a huge difference. Okay, there's still a very, very, very mild upward trend, but you can easily imagine living with that okay, if you could actually get there. Okay? Now, of course, that's going to sound like politically suicidal for anyone to endorse, but it's worth noting the following, uh, noting that cutting entitlements would be a good thing to do based on microeconomic principles. What does Medicare do? What does Medicaid do? It subsidizes the purchase of health insurance. Basic economics says setting aside special cases with externalities, public goods, et cetera, et cetera, we don't want to subsidize or tax any good or commodity or service in the economy. We want to let the free market choose the appropriate level. Roughly speaking, okay, that should apply to health care as well. So the U.S. and most rich countries are way over consuming health care. So limiting Medicare to a slower path that doesn't grow relative to the size of the economy would almost certainly be in the direction of economic efficiency, okay, a better balancing between the costs of health care and the benefits of health care. Okay? Same thing for Social Security. We're subsidizing people to take early retirements. We're paying them not to work, reducing productive inputs in the economy. Retirement is a standard good. People can make decisions about when they want to retire the same way they can make decisions about buying tomatoes or cars or houses. There's no reason the government should be taking a stand on that. Disability insurance aside, that might be a very different thing. So in fact, 
if we could cut Medicare, Social Security, and maybe to a lesser degree Medicaid, okay, those would be good for the economy. It would generate efficiency improvements okay, while also avoiding fiscal meltdown. Last point. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I thought I would have blown my time with it. Last point. It's useful to think a little bit about exactly how debt threatens the free economy. One thing that's sort of tempting to think is that Say we keep going on the path we're on, and eventually what's going to happen? Interest rates will rise even more than they already have. It'll keep happening. Okay? Countries won't want to borrow to us. They might not even want to roll over our debt, even at very high interest rates, because they just don't think it's ever going to get repaid. So there will be defaults. There will be fiscal chaos. Okay? At one level, that's not all bad. You're never any richer than the second after you default on all of your debts. Okay? Right? You just got rid of all your liabilities. That sort of sounds like a good thing. So why exactly, why shouldn't we have a party now and let especially foreign lenders help pay for it and then default on them at some point? Okay. Somebody doesn't like my, my say. Okay. I'm not endorsing that, but it's useful to think about that and say, well, exactly what is the problem? What's going to happen that's bad because of this growing debt path? And there are basically two components. One, once we get to the fiscal crisis okay, and have a recession and all that because of the high interest rates, we will adopt a ton of really stupid policies, okay, as happened during the Great Depression, Depression as happened during the uh, financial crisis, as happened during the Great Recession more recently. Bad times lead to bad economic policy. So that will be very bad for the economy going forward. Even leading up to okay, the actual crisis, most economies will tend to rely on tax increases and promise to cut expenditure later, but they'll never do it. So that will just make okay, the problem even worse. Okay? And that's also sort of very bad for the overall economy. Okay? So bottom line is okay, we should really, really care about this. And how should we care about it? We should want to cut expenditure. Okay? Raising taxes is going to make things worse because it slows down the economy. Okay? And the expenditure is mainly stuff that, at a minimum, libertarians object to in the first place. Okay? So politics aside, the difficulty of getting it passed aside, it's a win-win to slash those entitlement programs. So summing up, the debt problem is real and it's huge. There are no free lunches or easy fixes. As another example, you could zero out all discretionary spending, the entire defense budget, every single program other than Social Security and Medicare, and will only change that picture a teeny, teeny little bit. Because those programs are not growing relative to the size of the economy, but Medicare is growing 1% to 2% a year faster than the economy. That's what leads to the explosive debt. Okay? So the only thing that works is cutting entitlements. The good news is uh, we should do that anyway, but we need to start now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jeff. I told you you'd need the popcorn. Um, <laughs> Alan, over to you. Well, thank you, Ryan. Um, as, as you've mentioned, the economy has changed a lot since the low interest rate 2010s. And in fact, the US economy of the last year has been characterized by two major trends, both inflation and rising interest rates. Uh, CPI inflation is at 8.3% over the last 12 months. Uh, U.S. 10-year borrowing costs are at 3.8%, and both of those are well above the pre-pandemic figures of about 2.5% and 1.9%, respectively. And both inflation and interest rates essentially have very negative out implications for the fiscal outlook, and they greatly strengthen the case for uh, fiscal consolidation. Um, Inflation to date, um, there are two components to that. There's a demand side component and a supply side component. Uh, the demand side component is essentially that, that US dollars are more plentiful. Um, and when you have more plentiful amounts of a currency that can kind of um, change the balance of power between uh, the buyers and sellers of uh, goods and services. Um, you might have thought that in the low inflation 2010s, it often seemed like people who had uh, money to spend um, had more power um, in economic transactions, and now it sort of feels like the reverse. Um, you might ha have cash to spend, uh, but find that it's not going as far. 
Um, so past outsized federal budgets have contributed to that, essentially by supporting people's incomes, but at, a, at the expense of the U.S. Treasury. Um, fiscal consolidation can essentially help reverse the demand side component. Then on the supply side, um, you know, that's goods getting more expensive for real reasons, um, that is, uh, reasons that are, you know, bounded in, in the real world and the production of goods and services, um, not having to do with uh, financial or fiscal policy. Um, so, for example, the pandemic and the invasion of Ukraine have created shortages of key commodities like food, energy, and fertilizer. And those supply side shocks raise inflation and reduce living standards, but they also make it more challenging for the federal government uh, because um, a lot of entitlement commitments, they are essentially either explicitly or implicitly inflation adjusted, I either um, promised a benefit uh, with a cost of living adjustment or maybe even um, a particular claim on real goods and services. And um, in that case, you know, the fact that, that um, dollars are more plentiful in the economy uh, doesn't really offset the fact that things are more expensive. It's just that things are more expensive and the government has to figure out a way to make that work. Um, so supply side shocks uh, make the fiscal situation worse. The Federal Reserve has been raising the federal funds rate expeditiously this year. Um, in order to combat inflation and longer run interest rates, which in part reflect expectations of uh, what the Fed is going to do next, they've also risen dramatically. And interest rate figures, um, it's helpful to break them down into two components. There's both an expected inflation component and a real component. And the expected inflation component is critical to understand uh, because it it shows that inflating away the debt doesn't really work. Um, you might think that um, as a debtor, as um, the U.S. government might be better off uh, having inflation happen uh, because the real value of the debt gets eroded. But because of the rising interest rates, uh, because lenders price in that expectation of higher inflation, um, essentially for any amount of real debt that uh, you incur, uh, you pay a higher uh, cost of capital on it going forward. And those effects approximately should cancel uh, finance-wise. Um, they might not always, you know, you might catch people by surprise with uh, some debt that was um, taken out at lower interest rates and then interest rates rise and you get to enjoy the low interest rates for a while. For example, I'm doing that as a homeowner, uh, but that's not a permanent solution because eventually the debt rolls over. Um, the real interest rate component is also important and that is also rising. Uh, we can see from the um, uh, yields on inflation protected treasury bonds uh, the real borrowing costs are about 1.6 percent, well above the zero uh, that we usually had around pre-pandemic times. And that rise is significant because it essentially directly impacts the trade-off between fiscal consolidation today and fiscal consolidation tomorrow. Um, if you uh, take a policy prescription that collects a tax or saves on a, a government program uh, by, by cutting its budget, um, and you use that to retire some debt, um, it's 17% more expensive uh, to do that 10 years from now than it is to do that today um, in real terms. And since paying bills late has essentially become more expensive, it becomes more worthwhile by comparison to pay them on time. Then there's also a subtle um, but important effect that also strengthens the case for fiscal consolidation and attempting to bring um, interest rates back down a little bit. Um, high, in, high real interest rates divert dollars away from private investment by raising the cost of capital for firms. That's usually defined as a risk-free interest rate, which is kind of derived from uh, what the government debt looks like, um, plus a market rate premium. Uh, market risk premium because firms are more subject uh, to the um, ups and downs of the market than um, guaranteed treasury bonds. And um, if you raise the cost of capital for uh, firms, 
this slows long long run growth uh, because for firms forgo investments. You raise their hurdle rates and some things that used to be profitable no longer are. Um, you see this a lot in long dated uh, sectors of the economy, things like housing, uh, housing starts are declining. Uh, you see that in things like the startup world uh, where they're mostly looking at, at the idea of earnings or benefits very far out and if you change the trade-off between today and tomorrow, um, the economics of these looking into the future uh, private sector uh, participants in the economy, they don't work out as well. So that's why they pull back first. But in the long run, that makes it harder to finance good government programs because essentially um, you've forgone things that are actually important to people or things that would actually make a lot of money or things that, that would uh, make the future economy stronger. Um, in the face of these circumstances then, uh, the federal government should focus on fiscal sustainability and economic growth for the long haul, including careful attention to the balance sheet. Um, in terms of outright debt reduction, um, their options include major reforms to entitlement programs, uh, for example, for Medicare and private health care more broadly, uh, responsible consumer choice among competing private health plans uh, could help achieve quality affordable care, uh, social security's costs could be reined in with gradual reductions in benefits for the most affluent workers and with broader coverage of the payroll tax. Um, tax policy can be reformed by removing some preferential tax breaks to raise revenue in a fair and responsible manner. And additionally, Congress can commit to abiding by its regular budget process rather than resorting to stopgap measures that may result in increases in discretionary, discretionary spending or incorporating pay-fors into its budget process. Um, and one more idea is that Congress can segment out uh, the unusually large debt that was incurred during the pandemic. Uh, there's about 5.3 trillion from the uh, six major relief bills and then an additional 1.3 trillion uh, just from essentially the government takes some losses during economic downturns and we would estimate that about 1.3 trillion of extra debt was incurred just by virtue of the economy being worse. Um, in sum, um, I'd say that the twin trends uh, mentioned here, the rising interest rates and the rising inflation, are both signs that fiscal decisions should be made especially judiciously in our current environment. Thank you. Now going to pass over to Mark, and I want to particularly thank Mark because uh, he was a very, very late call up to the panel, and we really appreciate you doing this at the last minute because we know you're very busy. Uh, pretty much, uh, very often seems like a one-man band trying to fight for fiscal sustainability within Washington. Uh, oh. Jeff, you're in Boston, so we can't <laughs> count you. Well, thank you for having me. You are making me miss a miniature golf game right now, but <laughs> I, I, sh I should be okay. Um, thank you all for having me. Uh, over the course of the COVID pandemic, we borrowed about $5 trillion just to sort of fight the economic fallout. We borrowed another $20 trillion over the rest of U.S. history, nothing to do with COVID, mostly before it. So we are a very indebted nation, and now is the time for a fiscal pivot. Now, I work for an organization called the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. I'm always saying that it's time for a fiscal pivot, but this time I really mean it. Um, <laughs> right? So. Our debt right now is about as large as the economy. If you look at most recent uh, projections from CBO, it's headed to about 110% of GDP after a decade, which is higher than after World War II, higher than our highest record. Uh, if you incorporate the student debt cancellation the president has proposed, expanded veterans benefits, the CHIPS bill, higher interest rates in the near term, it's headed to 120. Uh, if we further assume that interest rates remain elevated, GDP remains uh, sluggish, we extend various expiring tax cuts and health provisions and discretionary spending, we're maybe headed to 140, 150% of GDP. That is unheard of in the United States. Um, now, it's always been the case that our, as, as long as I've been working on this issue, uh, that our long-term debt has been an unsustainable trajectory. Um, but in the past, there's been a, a trade-off, a macroeconomic trade-off in, in addressing it. 
on the one hand, deficit reduction we know is good for sustainability, is good for medium and long-term growth, is good for interest rates. On the other hand, it comes at the expense of near-term demand. We don't have that problem right now. What we actually face is an inflation crisis. Uh, the inflation rate right now is the highest it's been in 40 years. Um, and there's not a lot of signs of, its, of it slowing down. There's some slowdown in goods inflation, but there's not a lot of signs that inflation is going to return to normal on its own. Now, inflation occurs at most simply when you have too much money chasing too few goods and, and services. And so anything we can do in fiscal policy to tamp down that inflation uh, is not going to hurt the economy, but actually going to help the economy. So a deficit reduction plan enacted now would, would have a few major benefits. First of all, um, it would directly help us fight inflation. The Federal Reserve is chiefly in charge of fighting inflation, but um, that doesn't mean that fiscal policy doesn't have a role to play, particularly when inflation is so high and there's such a high risk of persistence, either from expectations changes, wage price spirals, things like that. Secondly, and very related, deficit reduction today can actually reduce the likelihood of a recession. Right now, the Fed is, is headed towards um, sort of uncharted territories. We are raising the rate well above its long-term neutral. That uh, puts certain sectors of the economy, like housing um, and the financial sector, at risk. Um, it um, can create financial instability. It does some things it's intended to do, um, but can still hurt the labor market. And so we're at high risk of recession. The more that fiscal policy helps, the more that monetary policy can slow down. Not stop, but slow down a little bit. And that reduces our recessionary risk. Uh, Again, related, deficit reduction can help us with our rising interest cost. Under that original CBO projection I mentioned to you, interest as a share of GDP is headed to about 3.5% by the end of the decade. That would be a national record for interest cost. Um, we are spending more on interest than we're spending on kids today. Within a decade, we'll be spending more on interest than on defense. Within a quarter century, interest will be the single largest federal government program. And by the way, all of that is before incorporating the higher interest rates we've seen over the last four months. So we have an interest crisis in the brewing. Uh, the more we do to reduce debt, the more it both pulls down interest rates and reduces the debt that we're paying that interest on. And finally, uh, smart, thoughtful deficit reduction is key to long-term sustained economic growth. Uh, our debt is crowding out our public investment, excuse me, crowding out our private investment and shifting more of the returns to that investment abroad. Debt reduction is the exact inverse. It can speed the pace of economic growth, speed the pace of, of, of wage growth, and help support investment. So we need deficit reduction, and we need to start acting pretty fast. Uh, the worst thing, by the way, we could do is what we're doing right now, which is continue to add to the deficit with things like student debt cancellation um, and veterans' bills and new kinds of tax cuts. Um, we just can't afford that at this moment from an inflation perspective. But of course, it matters how we do deficit reduction. And in light of the current inflation crisis, I would suggest we look at sort of three criteria. Number one, we need inflation reduction that's going to tamp down on demand. That can, that can occur through higher taxes, through cutting tax breaks, through lower transfer spending, or through lower reductions in, in federal spending. But, um, but we need to focus on getting demand under control. Number two, where possible, we should be directly focusing on price. There are certain prices that the federal government sets directly in the Medicare program. When it, where it comes to federal procurement. In those areas, we can have an outsized impact on inflation, but not only reducing the spend, but reducing the actual cost of particular goods and services. There's other areas that we affect price indirectly. Through, for example, various subsidies, both in the budget and in the tax code. Uh, cutting some kinds of tax breaks, for example, uh, like the state and local tax deduction or mortgage deduction, not only will help us tamp down demand, but also can put downward pressure uh, on rising housing costs, similar to the health, health exclusion on health care costs. And then lastly, we need to focus on boosting supply. We should not pretend that we can solve the inflation crisis with the marginal effects that, that federal policy can have on the supply in the near term, but it can help push in the right direction when we have policies that are boosting labor supply, that are boosting investment, and more importantly, it can help our growth in the long run. And so that means looking at things like um, what kind of signals are we sending to workers about when to retire, about how much to, to save? What signals are we sending to businesses about when and how to invest? And how can we improve these to have stronger supply in the, more, in the near term and a more vibrant economic growth over time? So the time for deficit reduction, the time for the fiscal pivot is right now. Thank you. Romina. Well, I have good news. Um, can you hear me fine? Yes. 
Um, Congress brought back earmarks. I hear they're supposed to help them pass spending bills, so surely a, a grand bargain is just around the corner. Um, just kidding. I also noticed they put me on the far right side of the panel. I assume it's because I used to work for the Heritage Foundation. It might take me a while to, uh, to shield that, uh, that, that far right wing coloring. Um, I found that there was a lot of bipartisan agreement on this panel at least, which is um, very encouraging. I think the challenge we truly face is that we don't have politicians who think of themselves in a governing position, but more in a, in a service industry. And in that respect, I do think that they service their constituents well, because um, what, we, what we find is that um, voters are more likely to turn out if they receive direct distributive benefits from their politicians, and uh, they're more motivated by non-means-tested benefits. Um, and so we see this play out in the polls. We're heading toward an election just now. Voter turnout is highest among individuals 65 and older, who also happen to be the individuals who benefit from programs like Medicare and Social Security, which are largest non-means-tested uh, programs. And those are also the programs that are driving us uh, toward this debt crisis. Um, if you look over the long-term horizon over the next 30 years, the, uh, the primary growth in spending is almost exclusively driven by Medicare, uh, th that's number one, and then uh, Social Security. So we, we cannot fix this problem without entitlement reform. No matter what else you do, everything else is just uh, chump change. There is uh, there's some good news on the horizon. We may be heading for a period of divided government. Uh, we may see a repeat of the 116th Congress, which brought us uh, such fiscal restraints as the Budget Control Act, which imposed discretionary spending caps. Yes, this, those did not exactly fall on the programs that are driving the growth in spending, but at least we had some debate in Washington um, over spending levels, potential offsets, and trying to find some savings on the mandatory side of the ledger. I also think it's good to get politicians in the habit of not just doling out more money. I feel that they got into a very bad habit, especially during the pandemic, uh, with massive spending increases on the discretionary side and uh, one supplemental uh, emergency package after the next, and I know they're already working on one because of Hurricane Ian. And so there's a number of reforms that we will need um, to tighten our uh, budget across uh, the board. Um, in terms of uh, numbers, I just wanted to point out that, uh, as Ryan pointed out, we just hit 31 trillion in gross national debt. That is roughly $93,000 for every American. So if you have grandchildren or kids just entering school, that's $93,000 um, if we were to divide it evenly across the entire country. That is a massive amount uh, of debt. How exactly are we uh, supposed to be paying that back? And that's not what everyone's, n nobody's even talking about. We're just talking about slowing the growth, ideally, uh, in, uh, in the debt. Um, Congress will not take action without some type of forcing mechanism. I'm very sorry, Mark, I would love it if, especially leading up to an election, they would agree on a deficit-reducing package. That just seems highly unlikely. So what are some potential action-forcing mechanisms on the horizon where we might see um, might see some fiscal action. So uh, one of the more common ones that uh, lawmakers have used in the past uh, to force spending cuts, fiscal restraints, occasionally spending caps, is uh, the debt limit. The debt limit is uh, at, um, it was set to at $31.4 trillion. We just reached $31.1 trillion. Um, we'll, we'll see exactly when the uh, U.S. Treasury runs out of its uh, statutory allowance to continue borrowing, but that sets up one potential uh, action-forcing mechanism. And uh, we need to take advantage of these action-forcing mechanisms because, as Jeff pointed out, once we are in a fiscal crisis where interest rates uh, rise steeply and significantly, where potentially we experience hyperinflation far worse than we've seen uh, just in the past few months, and where we might find ourselves in a scenario where um, foreign bondholders decide they just don't find treasuries to be such a good investment anymore, and they might dump them in the markets, we could find ourselves in a crisis situation very quickly that uh, we couldn't just inflate our way out of, as some on the left seem to think, that we don't need to worry about rising debt 
uh, and we don't need to worry about additional spending because you know we can just use this uh, magic money money machine called modern monetary theory. And I think as we've learned uh, with the recent inflation bout, that has its costs and uh, is not a free lunch. So instead, we need to discuss real reforms and those action forcing mechanisms are our best opportunity because alternatively, we'll have to make decisions in a crisis and those are likely to be less than ideal and might actually make the situation worse in the short and long run. So what are some of those changes? Uh, I think we should bring back spending caps because they were beneficial. So return of 2011, there are some reforms I would like to see. Uh, uh, an across the board discretionary spending cap would be better than individual caps on discretionary uh, defense and non-defense, uh, but those are details. Uh, but if we uh, are going to have spending caps, we also need to be aware that lawmakers will be looking um, very hard at ways to circumvent those spending caps, and one of the easiest ways for them to do so, a loophole, is the emergency spending provisions. So we should also tighten the rules around emergency spending provisions such that they don't get abused for non-emergency spending in an attempt to avoid caps. Um, so put real limits on emergency spending and pre-fund those disasters that we can predictably, uh, that we predictably know will occur. But importantly, because m most of the growth in spending and the debt is driven by entitlement programs, we need to get to a point where we have a bipartisan commission with expedited uh, voting authority to reform Social Security and Medicare. I don't think we can um, reform these programs without bipartisan support. Everyone needs to be in on it, or it's most likely not going to happen. And the most, uh, uh, the direction that those um, changes need to take very much involve making the programs more progressive, fo focusing benefits on those individuals who need them most. There are a variety of more indirect ways of doing so, s such that we don't discourage capital formation, um, and also increasing the retirement age. Um, Life, as life expectancy has, has gone up, but really importantly, I think that we, we should not be relying on politicians to be making those changes as life expectancy increases, et cetera, but rather adopt automatic triggering mechanisms such that these programs adjust uh, with such factors like indexing for longevity instead of relying on politicians to make such legislative uh, changes. Um, so I, I want to be optimistic because we really have no other option. And, um, and, and so, you know, maybe earmarks will grease the skids for a grand bargain. I won't hold my breath on that. But more importantly, we do have an opportunity, especially in the next Congress, to focus on fiscal restraint. And um, we know how to do it. We just need to get the politicians uh, on board with it. And, for that, I think we need uh, the American public because that's who politicians listen to. It comes down to caring about the debt, and then we know the mechanisms for how to fix it. Thank you. Well, Romina, I'm going to see your optimism and, and dump our big bucket of pessimism back into the conversation. Um, Mark, my first question really is to you. You mentioned deficit reduction. Alan mentioned fiscal consolidation. I'm having a sense of deja vu. Those of us who were living in Europe in the early 2010s, a bunch of governments engaged in deficit reduction. They front-loaded taxes. They promised to cut spending at a later date. We described it as the St. Augustine approach to deficit reduction. Lord, give me fiscal discipline, but not yet. And. Um, what that led to, I think, in many countries was um, a kind of scattergun, salami slicing approach to various budgets. A lot of those uh, budgets have since increased. It was like politically unsustainable. Those countries um, still have debt levels that are relatively high, and they still have the terrible long-term outlook. So it isn't fiddling around with you know, the odd bit of deficit reduction in five years in the Inflation Reduction Act or whatever. Isn't that all a sideshow to what Jeff was talking about, until we actually grapple with the central problem, which is the runaway entitlements. All of this other stuff is just noise. We cannot fix our long-term debt situation if we don't get the rising cost of health care under control, and we don't find a way to, to fund and slow the growth of Social Security. But um, I would actually push back pretty strongly against the claim that that makes revenue and discretionary spending a sideshow. I think that's an excuse that's been used over and over again by politicians to increase discretionary spending 
which by the way has been the fastest growing part of the budget um, over the last five years if you remove COVID stuff since 2017. And it's been an excuse to cut taxes over and over again. And before, you know, I mean, all said and done, we've done a combined about 2% of GDP of changes in the wrong direction on revenue and discretionary spending, maybe 2.5%. Um, it takes a long time of slowing health care growth to get that much gain. So, no, I don't think we can ignore the other parts of the budget, even though the entitlements are, are the long-term key. And to be clear, I was playing devil's advocate. I don't necessarily agree with that position. But, you know, Jeff, libertarians have been sounding the alarm about the federal debt um, for years, for decades. Um, Japan has much higher levels of public debt relative to GDP. It's not a particularly kind of dynamic growing economy, but it's a pretty nice place, and they seem to have kind of settled with it. Um, why should we actually care about this, and why, why do we assume there has to be some sort of fiscal crisis when there hasn't been in an aging population like Japan? So Japan is one observation that is indeed a bit puzzling. There are some special features that may help explain it. But we also have data on a whole huge set of countries over centuries, if not millennia. It's work done by uh, two of my colleagues, Carmen Reinhardt, used to be at Harvard, is now at the World Bank, and Ken Rogoff. And they've documented that many, many countries have had fiscal crises when their deficits and debts uh, got beyond a certain point. Um, in particular, they also documented that it was very hard to predict based on anything that was obviously observable when it was going to happen. It was going to happen, but it always seemed to come as a surprise and come out of nowhere. That's true of Greece in recent memory. If you had plotted the interest rates on US debt and Greece debt up until 2009, they looked incredibly similar until boom, all of a sudden they were not. Something triggered it, and then there was the panic. So in addition, we now do have the early warning sign in the US, the rising interest rates. We can't forecast that perfectly, as Jason was discussing. But I think overall, Japan is an outlier, but the vast majority of the evidence says that we do get these crises. Okay? It's hard to predict exactly when. And Romina, um, Mark kind of discussed deficit reduction as if there was a symmetric case for tax rises just as much as uh, spending cuts. I know that when you were at Heritage, you guys did a lot of research looking at the experience of uh, Europe in, in, in deficit reduction and the impacts that had on output growth. What sort of lessons do you think we can learn from those examples of what successful deficit reductions look like? Yeah, um, if I can quickly respond to the Japan point, because I find that also very interesting. Um, one key difference is that um, most of the, the debt, uh, the Japanese uh, federal debt, is held by its domestic population. You have an incredibly high savings rate that is not reflective of what's going on in the United States, and that makes um, the Jap Japanese situation more robust in the sense that it's their own population um, lending to, to their government, whereas in the United States context, we have a, a context with a much larger uh, percentage of our debt held in foreign markets, and uh, some of that held by, um, you know, allies, adversaries, a combination of the two, um, where we are just in a very different situation. But on the point regarding taxes and spending cuts, I, I think I know Mark well enough that uh, I don't think he's suggesting. Um, that we need similar sized spending reductions, especially in the entitlement programs, to tax increases because the math on that is just, uh, is d just doesn't work out that way. The entitlement programs are growing much, much faster. It's not sustainable uh, to raise taxes uh, as a percentage of GDP by a significant amount. The United States has never managed to do that, even with very different and higher tax rates, such as 90% uh, uh, on the highest uh, earners. Um, we find that tax uh, revenue inflows are surprisingly robust even as uh, marginal tax rates have fluctuated over the course of U.S. history. Um, with that in mind, it, uh, it's, um, I think that politically you will probably end up having to make some concessions on, on the tax front in order to get a bipartisan deal done 
Um, and, uh, but that's a very different conversation from what role do taxes play versus what do entitlement reductions play. And in the European context, um, as Jeff alluded to earlier, if you, if you raise taxes in an attempt to do fiscal consolidation, you also run the risk of slowing economic growth, which actually ends up undermining your goals of fiscal consolidation because economic growth helps you do that. So it is much more efficient to tackle the spending th side and particularly growth in programs that contribute to economic inefficiency, such as encouraging people to retire early, which is what Social Security and Medicare do, encouraging people to consume an excess amount of healthcare services, even when doing so doesn't make sense anymore. Um, so the, it's much more efficient to tackle the spending side and much more robust in the long run. I think, Jeff, you wanted to come in. Uh, there was a paper that also got published as a research brief by Cato uh, by a former colleague named Alberto Alessina, precisely about the European uh, fiscal austerity measures. Um, the standard Keynesian model says that cutting spending okay, reduces GDP by a pretty big amount. There's a big multiplier effect. Okay? Raising taxes also reduces GDP by, by a smaller extent. Okay, so traditional Keynesian thinking is it's better to raise taxes to reduce deficits, but his analysis of the European experience with data over 30 or 40 years was very different, that the effects of the spending cuts on GDP on future growth were much smaller than traditional Keynesian multipliers predicted, and that so you got GDP growth coming back faster and more robustly when you cut spending, okay, as if you were attempting to engage in austerity, and so that was definitely the way to go completely. Supportive. I mean, if I could jump in there, um, it, it matters why that conclusion um, um, was reached because we're in a very different environment now than in 2010. We want to slow the demand side of the economy. And so um, that can be done on the tax side and the spending side. If it turns out that taxes were more effective at slowing demand, which was bad in 2010, that would be good now, for example. What we should be thinking about is not taxes and spending, but what are the specific policies that are going to get us the strongest growth. And I think Romina mentioned um, a few, where can we get healthcare costs down? Where can we encourage longer work? But there is many in the tax side as well, where we have a, a, uh, the tax code subsidizes inefficient and bad behavior in a, in a number of ways, including various deductions for mortgage interest, uh, exclusion for healthcare. The way that we tax capital gains is totally backwards. So I, I think there's room on both sides of the ledger. Yeah, of course, taxes have impacts on both supply and demand. And a lot of European countries have had very, very slow productivity of growth as well. Now, I'm not saying that's all down to the high taxes, but um, certainly in some countries there were some bad tax rises as part of those deficit reduction packages. Alan, I'm going to be a bit mean, and I've told you I was going to be a bit mean, so you, you know what's yeah, coming. You wrote a piece in August 2021 entitled, Sorry Deficit Hawks, Low Interest Rates Are Here to Stay. Um, <laughs> In it, though, you critique the idea that deficits would lead to a loss of investor and creditor confidence. Now, obviously, we're in a very different world now for a whole variety of reasons. My basic question is, Paul Krugman had a piece earlier this week where he said, actually, the fundamentals that drove low real interest rates, demographics, slow productivity growth, all the other kind of long-term headwinds are still there. And so, actually, we would imagine over time the, interest rate, the path of interest rates will return to something like the path of interest rates before. Is Paul Krugman right, or are the bond markets right? Um, it, it's a little bit of both. Um, I, I'm going to split the difference here, not, not come down strongly on either side, but let, let's talk about what web evidence is weighing on each side. Um, two very, very disruptive events have happened in my lifetime. Um, or it, it recently, um, some of the most disruptive events of my lifetime. We have essentially the worst war in Europe of my lifetime, and um, the COVID-19 pandemic was even more disruptive than that. Um, and what I've begun to learn um, now seeing two of these events in the past three years is that um, governments react to them in a, a particular way, or at least they have reacted in a particular way, um, which is um, even though the world has gotten worse, they attempt to preserve the standard of living uh, to which their citizens are accustomed, and they do that through financial support, through sending out checks, um, things like that, um, through subsidizing um, 
costs of, of energy, which are spiking because of the war. Um, and the problem with that, if you kind of think from a uh, grand, real goods and services perspective, is, well, if you're producing less, how do you consume the same? You might think that's completely impossible, and it's close to impossible, but there are a few outlets. Uh, you can try uh, importing a lot, um, and that way your people uh, can enjoy imports. They produce um, less than they consume, but they shed financial assets. Um, not everyone can do that. Um, around the world in total, the balance of trade is precisely even. And the other thing you can do um, is you can have your central bank raise interest rates um, which chokes off some investment-related activities and some debt finance consumption um, in order to uh, keep down the, the cost of goods and services and largely uh, try to preserve consumption. Um, the problem with that is, well, um, once interest rates are up, uh, you've changed the calculus of, of um, you know, what, what's good and bad policy. Um, the, the trade-off between the future and the present is different. Um, and obviously, now that we've had two of these events in, in a row, one of which uh, I'll note came after I, I wrote uh, the, the piece that I did, um, it seems to me a little more likely that, well, maybe this is going to be a recurring pattern, the, that you know, sometimes bad things will happen in the world, bad supply shocks, and governments will respond by trying to make everything OK. Uh, by trying to preserve consumption, and they'll find that they can't um, in, in total uh, without choking off investment or otherwise um, experiencing some painful trade-offs. But that said, you know, these are temporary events, um, at least um, to some degree. And um, over the long run, what, what I, I saw back in um, the 2010s, um, as late as 2021, and maybe going into the future is that um, in some ways, lenders need borrowers as much as borrowers need lenders. Um, there are a lot of people um, in the developed world who are expecting to live longer than ever and on longer retirements than uh, ever. And um, what they do is they either save money on their own behalf in things like 401ks or by proxy in pension funds. And those pension funds just keep on buying financial assets, even if um, the price or the risk profile seems poor in some ways, and they're just forced to accept it, uh, because what are you going to do? Are you going to spend down your retirement fund uh, just because you feel that, um, that either firms aren't offering you a good enough PE ratio or countries aren't being fiscally responsible enough? Um, you need borrowers to some degree as much as uh, borrowers need you. And the fact that so many people are aging, especially in Japan, which we've mentioned, uh, Japan's kind of far out there on, on the um, uh, long longevity and aging curve. Um, you've, got, you've got people who are going to take relatively uh, poor conditions for investment if that's all that they can get. Um, and that dynamic is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, but it's a little bit like, you know, after one disruption, you can say, uh, well, things will return to normal. But after two, um, you, you begin to wonder, um, well, um, the, this is a, a trend that's recurred at least once. And you don't want to be that guy who feels like you understood the world uh, that you grew up in. And any day now, things will return back to the world that you understand. Uh, no, we're, we're in different territory now. That's how I feel about 90s music. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Um, we have got time for just a few questions. What I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to take two at once, and then the panelists can answer whichever they prefer. So, gentlemen here uh, in the middle table, and then the gentleman, uh, I don't know, behind him, at the back of the room. Hi. Um, I'm going to preface my question by saying that I worked as a government bond trader for about 40 years or 35 years. And I think that you guys are optimistic because I, I do not think you're taking into consideration the structure of the capital markets and maybe five, six, seven dealers do 50 odd percent of the business in the government bond market. And we could have a financial crisis and a collapse of confidence 
any day now. We could have it within five years. That's precisely what happened in the 1970s. And there were always supply shocks. Supply shocks always happen when inflation gets out of control. And inflation gets out of control because the Fed doesn't do its job. So we're in a structurally a very similar situation to where we were in the 1970s. Go back and get the Wall Street Journal and read it from 1970s, and it's going to read like it reads today. So I don't think you're taking into consideration how fragile the financial structure is underneath the headlines. And that's why I think more has to be done now. Well, thank you. Um, and the gentleman at the back. So I have a question about the psychology of policymaking. So Danny Kahn and Avis Tversky have this concept of a prospect theory, which is that loss stings at least twice as much and up to 10 times as much as a gain. So loss hurts a lot more. When you're talking about fiscal reform and entitlement reform, you're talking about people losing things. So these are things that are going to be painful, in part because some people will be hurt by these things. So as much as we might agree with the substance of the policies, how do you think about talking to the people that are hurt by these things? And how do you think about talking to the policymakers who would have to enact these things, knowing that the people that are hurt by them aren't going to be so keen and might vote them out of office? So uh, that question I'll summarize is, how do you talk about the potential for default on promises that people have been made? So do you want to? Each of us takes one. No, no, no. Well, you can answer. You, I want somebody to answer that question, and then I'll ask the other question. <laughs> I wish I knew. That's if I knew the answer to the second question, I could be making a lot more money than I am <laughs> right now. Be a lot more successful. But um, I, I think it's helpful to do. I, I think it's helpful to deliver bad news with good news. So I think if you're going to raise the retirement age, it should be in the context of making Social Security solvent, right? So you can deliver a positive. If you're going to Tackle Medicare it should be in the context of making sure people's premiums are actually going to be lower because their health care costs are lower. So that's not a solution, but that's the best I got. And what do you make of the question about the fragility of, of bond markets and the structure of bond markets? I was quite taken aback by the scale of the reaction to the Brit uh, recent mini budget in Britain that cut taxes. I mean, we expected borrowing costs to go up, but it caused a lot of convulsions. Is that evidence out there that actually this? The bond markets are a lot more fragile than we perhaps uh, perhaps think on this stage. I'll leave it. I, I think there's happy. always um, I think there's always a risk of a financial panic, um, and there's only so much that central banks can do. So I don't put that risk high, but if there's a very low probability risk that's repeated over and over again in escalating circumstances, it starts to become scary, even if that risk is very low. So the cautionary thing to do. Um, is, to, is to lower the heat. I don't have an answer to the fragility. I don't know the details nearly as much as you do. I have a response to that sort of issue, which is employers, governments, everybody should stop providing retirement help in the form of pensions, defined benefit plans. They should all be 401k, at most, 401k, because then you're not in this soup. People put money in, they own whatever is there, and the value goes down, the value goes down, but you don't have a huge pension fund that can have these runs of this kind that we just saw in the UK. Another point on the fragility of the bond market and um, inflationary times and the 1970s in particular. Um, I mentioned before that interest rates have both the real and expected inflation component. Um, and this has kind of an interesting and perverse effect on uh, what central banks have to deal with. Uh, because um, if you have high inflation, you want to um, hike interest rates in order to uh, tamp it down. Uh, but actually, uh, because inflation is high and perhaps expected inflation is high as well, um, you might have to raise rates by more than you think in order to get the same real rate that you did before, uh, because that expected inflation component is larger. Um, and if you aren't ahead of the game and inflation keeps rising, uh, the target rate that you need, uh, just even to get the same neutral real rate, keeps on going up. And that's why uh, people who remember the 1970s have extraordinary stories about 
mortgages, and we are starting to get some extraordinary stories here, um, but there was a great moderation in between where inflation was under control, and that, that's why people are so nervous about inflation and the Fed is so eager uh, to head it off. To the I, question about... Um, sorry, could we take... I just want to take one more question. Okay. I'm conscious of the fact that this guy has been waiting for a long time. So could we get a question here? Let's, we're going to have to make it a short question with a yeah, short answer. Really, really quick, in entitlements, I seem to be a lot of uh, recently a lot of articles about corruption and uh, p people getting stuff. And I seem to remember, um, you know, the Social Security has all these people over 100 years old getting money. And I wonder, is, in your knowledge, is the bureaucracy doing anything to, to, to close out those accounts? I mean, we don't have tens of thousands of people over 100 years old, but somehow somebody's taken that money. And that, I, I think the inflation on, um, using that nasty word, on, uh, on the entitlement program is something that uh, should be looked at. Um, yes, there need to be updates made to things like the death master file to make sure that people aren't collecting benefits on behalf of individuals who are already dead. I wish there were more savings to be had there. It is a fairly small portion of overall spending in Social Security, even though it, um, it, it, it will raise headlines uh, to the point of how do, we, how do we sell these reforms if they mean losses for people. Well, usually they happen in the context of, for example, the Social Security Trust Fund running out of money, which will bring about automatic spending cuts of about 20%, which would be direct benefit cuts for beneficiary. And so then you have that alternative scenario to overcome and say, okay, we're going to do these other things instead, and we'll particularly protect individuals who are already in or near retirement. We've seen that uh, s proposals like that made uh, among politicians. Um, and you can also um, um, highlight how you're going to increase, especially for younger generations, their ability to save for their own retirement and accounts that they own and control, and where they can actually uh, set aside less of their income and see greater gains by uh, taking advantage of growth in the marketplace, for example, and in, in Medicare or other health care, increasing individuals' choice uh, such that they can get quality care at lower cost. There's some low-hanging fruit there as well um, that are reforms that you want to pair with uh, eligibility changes. Well, thank you. This is an incredibly long-term problem and one that uh, Cato is continually uh, keen to draw more attention to. And I appreciate the work that all of you guys have done over the years to write and think about this issue as well. Thank you uh, so much for this panel. We're going to go straight into um, the final speech. I'm just going to have a couple of minutes to, to talk to our next speaker and get the stage um, cleared away a bit. So do stand up and stretch your legs. But if you could thank these four speakers in the appropriate way.
Okay, uh, everyone. Uh, I realized before the lot, we're going to get going with the final uh, closing speech now. Um, so if we could just settle down, uh, get back into our seats. The sooner we, uh, the sooner we finish the session, the sooner the drinks reception. So um, I realized before the the last event that uh, I didn't introduce myself. Uh, my name's Ryan Bourne. Um, I occupy the R. Evan Scharf Chair for the Public Understanding of Economics here at Cato, and uh, I actually put together the program for this conference. We were originally supposed to be doing this conference in May 2020, and a little thing called the pandemic uh, obviously put pay to that, but I'm delighted that we've been able to do it, and uh, uh, very, very thankful for the generosity of the Soul Freedom Trust who've provided the resources for us um, to do this. Before I introduce our final speaker for the day, I'd like to also thank the Cato conference team and the building staff here for all their hard work to make today possible. They've kept us well fed and well watered through the day. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree we've had some fascinating panels and speeches, which I think have really captured the essence of the tum uh, tumultuous political time we're living in and the economic risks and opportunities that that brings for government policy. After this closing speech, I invite you all to join us to continue those conversations over uh, drinks downstairs. But before we get to that, I'm delighted to welcome Doug Holtz Ekin to give this keynote address, which is entitled The National Conservative Threat to a Free Economy. Doug is the president and founder of the American Action Forum. He's one of the most prolific economists and writers in the public policy space that I've ever come across in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. In fact, in preparation for this event, I examined his morning emails over the week before I was writing this, and in that period, he covered topics as wide-ranging as the Jones Act, manufacturing jobs, inflation, antitrust policy, the minimum wage, and several others. What's more, each post was crisply written and dripping with insights, making Doug a must-read for policy wonks and legislators across the political spectrum. Doug has an extremely strong pedigree where economics and public policy are concerned. He was an academic at Columbia University and then Syracuse. He has served in a variety of influential policy positions. Between 2001 and 2002, he was the chief economist of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He was then the sixth director of the Congressional Budget Office, providing budgetary and policy analysis to the US Congress. Uh, during 2007 and 2008, he was director of domestic and economic policy for the John McCain presidential campaign. Um, and after a role with a, a federal commission, he was then founded the American Action Forum, which describes itself as a center-right think tank on economic, domestic, and fiscal policy issues. It's difficult to think of anyone as plugged into the intersection between economics and politics, and I was deeply impressed with Doug's insights when I first saw him speak at Nobel Prize winner Ned Phelps's annual conference up at Columbia a few years ago on the dangers of socialism. Uh, I was there on a panel that day alongside someone called Lena Khan, whatever happened to her. And given that experience of seeing Doug uh, that day, as well as the knowledge that Doug is out there on the front line debating economic issues uh, in the media as well as in Congress, I couldn't think of anyone better to offer us some concluding thoughts on the ascendant national conservative movement within uh, and indeed beyond the Republican Party. So Doug, welcome to the Cato Institute, and the floor is yours. Wow. Uh, well, um, thank you, Ryan, um, uh, for the invitation, um, for the very gracious reading of my resume. Um, uh, my mother has a very different reading of my resume. Um, <laughs> She is one of a long line of high school teachers, and in 2000, I had reached the pinnacle of professional accomplishment. I was a tenured full professor with an endowed chair and chairman of the Department of Economics at Syracuse University. What could be better? Since then, I've been a government bureaucrat, a political hack, and now I've started a think tank, which is a glorified over 21 daycare center, and she's quite nervous about my prospects. <laughs> so thank you for providing some legitimacy to what I do. Um, 
Uh, I want to congratulate Ryan, Cato in general, uh, for just a fantastic conference um, with uh, the, the sort of unique combination of a, a great set of speakers talking about the right topic at exactly the right time. And, and you don't always get that. So um, the pandemic did you a favor. I think, I think the, the topic's right. And um, I, I'm really pleased to have the chance to sort of discuss the, these very important issues of what is the framework for thinking about uh, economics and politics and the political economy of what the United States does. Um, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I have struggled desperately to, to figure this out. Um, but uh, but I, I thought as a matter of discipline, the issue of what is the threat from this sort of nationalist conservative style of thinking and policy making uh, should be done relative to something, right? That's what economics is, it's a, a set of relative choices. So I want to talk a little bit about well-trodden uh, 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 paths, which are the competitive economic model on which so many of us rely. And um, a, a real bonus to speaking here I want to point out is that um, I don't do PowerPoint, I don't do slides, because I did my first PowerPoint in front of then President George W. Bush. He discovered the error in it, and I gave up PowerPoint in 2001. But <laughs> I have everything I need on the slides. I've got individual liberty, free markets, which are going to generate limited government. And I want to talk about that, so that's the starting point. Right? So, so we all know how um, uh, we, we sort of talk to um, uh, people about the sort of basics of the, the idealized form of competitive markets. What do you do? Well, um, people have the, the freedom to choose which products they do and do not buy. And if prices are too high, they say no. And if prices are, are low, they, they buy. And they might even buy more. And they continue to buy as long as that product provides value. And they reveal their values with their purchases. And indeed, you know, I know how much I value Twizzlers because a, it's one of two things in my diet, Diet Coke and Twizzlers during the day, red wine at night, live a long life. So, and, and I know that I value it at $7 for a two pound traditional bag of strawberry twist. I mean, that's, that's the marginal value of, of Twizzlers. And the, the other thing we know is that if, if the producer can sell it for something that's more than it costs, they can make more money by making more of it. And we're gonna just keep making more until the profit opportunity goes away because marginal costs will eventually rise. And what we'll find out is that that price is going to simultaneously reflect the marginal cost of production and the marginal benefit, the valuation I place on it. And that's the core of, of, of how we explain the transmission of values through the economy and the economic benefits of the competitive model. I want to talk about the politics of it, because I don't think it gets appreciated very well. If you think about a nation of 310 million people all operating in that fashion, what we will learn is that Twizzlers will have a marginal value for everyone who's buying them of seven bucks for that bag. Everybody, Alabamans, Californians, vegans, carnivores, I don't know where vegans are in the Twizzlers here. Anyway, um, atheists, pacifists, Lincecums, Scott here, and, and all of them. Um, all will have exactly the same valuation of that. And that becomes the social value of Twizzlers. Like, you don't have to have a, uh, some sort of uh, committee to put together the social cost of Twizzlers. We know what it is. It's been revealed, and we all agree on it. We don't have to take a vote. We all agree. It has a, it has a value. We've revealed it, and that, and that value is the price. And that value is exactly matched by the cost of society producing it. That marginal cost is what does it cost the labor? What is it, what it take in the form of capital? What kind of materials go into it? There are no externalities to Twizzlers, so there's, there's no sort of funny extra math you have to do. Reliance on competitive markets has the tremendous advantage that we need no politics. None. We agree. It's practically Shangri-La. Because there's unanimity about how much we should spend on Twizzlers, how much labor and capital should go into Twizzlers, and it's simultaneously true for all the other important products, Diet Coke and red wine, and, and other unimportant products as well. But uh, if you think about just walking into to, uh, the, the mini-mart attached to a gas station in the United States and the range of products that are available just there, 
It is mind-boggling what uh, a market economy can produce. And there is no way a political mechanism could make all those decisions. There isn't a legislature that we can design that can come to, to agreement on so many things. And the beauty of competitive markets is we don't need the politics. It's a, it's a, it's a, a phenomenal political mechanism. And it's often not appreciated for that. And when we stray from that, I think we, we start to, to appreciate the value of what free markets and individual liberties and the profit motive have delivered to our political discourse. So think about what happens when we don't have Twizzlers. Think about some, what happens in, in the standard market model when we have something of national importance that we all share, like national defense, and we've got to pick an amount of it. And some people are pacifists, and they, they want little or even negative amounts of it. Other people are, are quite worried about things. Why they want a lot of it. And now we have to have politics. We have to have a way to decide how much are we going to provide in the way of national defense that we will all simultaneously consume. So, so that's where the political mechanism ends enters, but, but think about how it enters. In that way of thinking, where you let markets do what they can do, let them um, uh, do it to the greatest extent possible, and only rely on government provision when you have to, everyone is agreeing that the politics are of necessity. We all know that we have different values. We have accepted the deal that says, there's going to be some disappointment in the political outcomes because all of these equally legitimate values have to enter in and not all can be uh, uh, satisfied simultaneously. It's just, it's, it's not going to happen. And so I think one of the great virtues of the so-called neoclassical consensus, which was we we're going to let um, uh, markets deliver everything they can and only places where there are market failures, where there are public goods and externalities and, and the kinds of things that markets don't handle as well, will we go to government mechanisms for provision. And those government mechanisms come with an automatic le legitimacy because the preferred way of doing it doesn't work. So you have to be doing it in the government and you accept the, the shortcomings that that, that that produces. Not everyone can be made happy simultaneously and, and we have uh, the for great disagreement. But the, the, there's a legitimacy attached to that political debate because of the way that we've gotten to it. And that is, by and large, I think, you know, how the U.S. operated for a long, long time. And, and it produced, interestingly enough, not limited government for the sake of limited government, but limited government because there are only a limited number of things you had to have the government do. And as a result, that limited government was legitimate by its very design. It wasn't an arbitrary restriction on, on what the government could do. It was, it was the government fulfilling its role in society. And that, that, I thought that was an incredibly valuable thing. It was never perfect, believe me. So among the things you left out in reading my resume, shocking, unbelievable. Um, I worked in the White House in 1989-90 um, at the Council of Economic Advisors as a staffer. And I had been at Columbia teaching public finance. And for those who aren't familiar with academic courses in public finance, they're all about what happens when markets fail, when there's an externality, and what clever things can you do to bring us back to optimal amounts of uh, production when there's externalities and, and public goods and things like that. So it's all about um, you got to be smart and fix markets, and, and the government's the solution. And, and I went to the, the Bush White House, and th these were Republicans, and they were prepared to intervene in ways that just blew my mind. I mean, I'd be, I would spend the entire time going, stop, no, leave it alone, it's fine. Don't, you don't need to do that. The market will take care of it by itself. Felt like, by the end, I felt like I was walking free to choose. I mean, it was just like the greatest experience of my life. So I know that the, the sort of idealized framework I just sort of walked through isn't literally the reality, but it was, but it was the, the underpinnings of, the, of a consensus on the way things were to work. And that consensus seems to have, I think, lo been lost largely because we haven't done the education on, on what it really was. Competitive markets were not just a way to get people rich. They were a legitimate political approach to providing goods and services in the right amount and allocating the activities in an economy. So I think that education has to continue. <coughs> Excuse me. My concern with um, the, these other approaches that, that have various labels um, uh, that, that get summarized cheaply under the Make America Great Again uh, label and, and, and sort of a nationalist perspective is 
Um, they, they begin by substituting for that value discovery mechanism called competitive markets and just saying, this is what we value. This is what is important to this country. And now, we've already seen that out there in the world, there are going to be old, young men, women, Minnesotans, very strange, uh, Ohioans. I mean, an, a huge array of differences. This country should be celebrated for its differences. That's its, its most amazing characteristic. And there's going to be the notion that there's one legitimate set of values to pursue, which means by definition, the rest are not legitimate. And, if, and, and that immediately sets up a very bad political dynamic. Because if you're told you're illegitimate, you do not want to participate in the process that has declared your, your views illegitimate. And you do not respect the people who have declared your, your views illegitimate. And so the starting point for my concern with this really is this notion that there's a set of values. And there's the issue of who gets to pick. Like, we have all these potentials. Who, whose values get to pick? Say, those are the national values. I mean, this was the, uh, the, the, the scientific accomplishment by Ken Arrow when he won the Nobel Prize for the Arrow Impossibility Theorem that said there isn't any legitimate way to pick in a systemic fashion among all the tastes and preferences in, in a population. What you're going to end up with is a dictator. And what we see too often is the language and behavior of this way of thinking about the government's role in the economy is highly dictatorial and, um, and highly, as a result, frightening to those who were raised with a, a deep love of the freedoms and the, the democratic principles of this country. And, and so that, that set of, uh, of beliefs, I think, is a very dangerous way to do business. It leads to some other things that, that, that we, we see all the time and decry, but they're almost inevitable. Um, it is going to be the case that uh, any such approach to, to running a country is going to have a huge amount of industrial policy. The market signals aren't valuable. They're wrong. Like there's one set of values that's right, so the other one, so we got to direct, we got to override the market, so we have to pick what's going to happen. There's no longer a consensus. I mean, it's obvious anyone, anyone would pick a lot of Twizzler production. That's easy. But, but there is a question as to, you know, what will get um, approved in the market? And, we, and there's a tremendous amount of industrial policy that's going to flow straight out of this. And protectionism, which, which is obvious. But the, that overriding of the, of the market is, is inevitable in these systems. There is no respect for what it does. The market discovers values. The values have been discarded as unimportant in this framework. And so we, we don't need markets to do that. Um, that comes with it. Uh, a couple of other corollaries. Number one, you're not going to get um, efficient government policies. People like me don't like to distort prices. We don't like taxes distorting prices. We don't like subsidies distorting prices because that's distorting someone's values. We want those values displayed. The inefficiency of policy is going to be irrelevant. So, you, you know, uh, any nationalist conservative approach is going to have the biggest dead weight loss triangles you've ever seen. They just don't care. This is a way in which the, I don't know what Jason said at lunch, but this is a way in which the left and the, right, the extreme rights at the moment are agreeing. I mean, they, they behave in exactly the same way. Second thing that will happen is there's no particular um, uh, cost then to taking the taxpayer's money. You need to, to override what the market's doing, so you need the money, you need industrial policies, and so you're going to have a very large government. There will be no res natural stopping point for the government. There is no legitimate limited government in this framework, and it will get and more inefficient. And as a result, it will be uh, a threat to any sort of sustained uh, rise in prosperity, any sustained growth in the, in the, the, in the economy. And that's inevitable given the, the foundations of how this, um, this is, uh, world thinks about things. So um, what comes with industrial policy and a lack of respect for taxpayer money? A lot of cronyism. Help me out. I'll help you out. Cronyism always leads in the end to corruption. And the, the, the government, which may have been uh, seeking to represent the nation, but in the end has no legitimate set of values to do so, will harm the growth of that nation. It will then also destroy itself with, with corruption and inefficiencies. And so um, 
Uh, the good news here is there is a drinks reception after I'm done, so that's always good. Uh, number two, whatever this force is, however it arose, and, and you know the, the the notion that populism just isn't good for the populace hasn't yet been recognized, but that's the fact. Um, it, it has a, a, a self-destructive piece to it that will will end this um, uh, uh, path uh, on its own. And so, I you know I I'm not live through something like that. I'm not saying it's all fine, but it's important to understand things for what they are, and, and I think the, that's what we have. So um, it's, it's a very bad idea for me to talk too long because there are drinks out there. There are some people who made the correct but, but uh, premature decision to, to not listen and go drink, and, and we're going to go join them. But my, my message today is really simple. Uh, th there is a political legitimacy to doing business with individual liberty and free markets, and it's an efficient way to do things. It has a lot of technical uh, uh, merit from an economics point of view, but, it, but its political character is, I think, its most important feature. And it's, it's the thing to be understood, taught, and nurtured uh, through time. It does so very, very well. This recent movement, has none of those things in my view. And it is a threat to our economy. And panel after panel can tell you about why the, uh, this sort of um, interesting lean economy woman has turned out to be such a threat um, uh, to uh, the markets in the United States, why uh, some of these trade policies have been counterproductive and, and uh, self-defeating. Um, again and again and then, that's all going to be true. But the larger threat is it will destroy our politics. It delegitimizes delegitimizes people in arbitrary fashion that is unacceptable in the United States. It undercuts its legitimacy in the process, and it is profoundly corrupt in the end. And I am um, sad to see even uh, the shadow of its specter uh, land in these shores. But I thank Ryan and Cato for the chance to, to say this, and uh, I thank all of you for your patience in listening, and I wish you nothing but a prosperous future. Thank you. We've got a good amount of time for questions. So they're going to be, oh, well, I'm on. They're going to be roving mics around, so we have got plenty of time for questions. Um, I'll take one from Russ at the front. Thank you. Um, you make a very compelling case, but I'm going to try to put my national conservative hat on and ask you a hard question, if you don't mind. Go for it. Um, so you described your model, your free market model, as idealized. Yes. And a national conservative would say, yes, exactly. It bears no relation whatsoever to our real economy. We've had Republican presidents and Republican governments for a very long time promising to return us to this free market. It's never happened, and we're starting to suspect that it's not going to. In the meantime, uh, what we've had these big tech companies, <laughs> so it always comes back to them, uh, they've s sort of developed a monopoly or an oligopoly over the marketplace of ideas. Um, asset managers on Wall Street, a handful of them, uh, exert an increasingly powerful influence over all of the publicly traded companies. And um, this combination has produced sort of uh, an environment where there's an ideological monoculture where um, if you are in a politically unfavored group or industry, they will cut off uh, capital flows to you. Um, they might take your PayPal account away. Um, essentially, um, they are um, a de facto um, regime in partnership with the federal government. And that this new reality is such a threat to freedom that we have to sort of accept it instead of trying to go back to this uh, Reaganite vision of free markets. So how would you respond to that? So there are a couple things about that vision that, that I think are worth thinking hard about. Uh, the first is that it's ultimately an empirical question as to whether there is disproportionate market power in the hands of tech companies or uh, asset managers or, 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 or in general. And, um, and we hear this a lot. We, we do. Um, I will uh, 
commend to you the data, um, which is that we collect a lot of data on, in the United States, a census of manufacturers, census of retailers. Uh, we do an enormous amount of um, data collection. And um, my colleague, uh, Fred Ashton, collected all of the data back to 2002, up to 2017, the most recent uh, such. They do them every five years. And if you do, say, four firm concentration ratios, the, the fraction of the, the revenue earned by the top four firms, or almost any metric, and you look industry by industry over that time period, you will find no increase in concentration in the United States economy. It's not a fact. So the factual assertion that the U.S. is now riddled with monopolies who are dictating to consumers either was true in 2002 or isn't true now, but it, nothing has changed. And, and the, the way we talk about it has changed and the policies we're proposing have changed, but the data haven't changed. And so that, that makes me question the diagnosis and, 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 and uh, um, uh, proposed solution. Second thing is, among pro proposed solutions, yeah, we've never gotten uh, the federal government uh, to the, the scale scope and, uh, that I would prefer. That's a reality. There are differences out there, which I, I think it's important for us to respect. Um, but when we find market power, it is usually the result of the government. If, if you want to find monopoly power in the, in the, um, in the U.S. economy, you're going to find some government regulation. You're going to find some, uh, some place where in, in the interests of someone in the private sector and the government coincide, and they're erecting barriers to entry. So the number one thing to do is not to pay any attention to the incumbents, not to focus your fire on them, not to say what's good and bad about them. Don't even learn their names. Kill them. Allow entry and let them fail. The most important thing America does is it lets things fail. That's what we do better than anyone else. And if you stop letting things fail, you stop having a market economy. And so it, it, the solution to all of this stuff is not dictating behavior of incumbents. The solution is to make sure the incumbents don't have a choice but to listen to the customers or they're gone. Great, uh, next question. Um, uh, yes, we'll go. On that side, um, sorry, got the mics running around. Can we go over here? There's. I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question on what's your thoughts on cryptocurrency, the regulation of cryptocurrency, the SEC with Gensler and what he's saying, because it seems like the ultimate monopoly in that case is the government, and it's the currency they own that, and no one protects their monopoly probably more than a government. So um, I. I am first and foremost not a, uh, a cryptocurrency expert, and I want to be really honest about that. That's not going to stop me from answering. I mean, I have... <laughs> okay, so uh, now, as of this moment, there is nothing that is genuinely a cryptocurrency. So, so if you sort of look at standard definitions of money, currency, store of value, unit of measure, n nothing, general acceptability, all that, uh, uh, for transactions, none of them fit this. So cryptos are at the moment a boutique asset class that have some highly idiosyncratic risks, um, ranging from those that appeal to people who wanted to bet on the NFL when they weren't playing to, to very sophisticated investors. Um, uh, and, and if you look at the data, most of the big money appears to be very sophisticated investors. So that makes me think that at the moment, this isn't a particular threat. Right? These are, these are well-heeled, knowledgeable investors using a different set of highly idiosyncratic risks to um, uh, add some potential uh, return to their portfolios. So it's a consumer protection matter. It doesn't seem like a huge deal yet. Could be if they become more broadly um, used. And, and they're not held in any significant way on any financial, systemically important financial institutions balance sheet. They're, they're nothing like the evil of a, of a subprime mortgage, uh, you know, a decade and a half ago. So, so I, I think they're, I mean, and, and, you know, Kim Kardashian cares, so we, of course we should care, but, um, but, but I, don't, I don't think they're a big economic issue right now. There, there's more chatter about it than there's substance. Nigel. 
uh, Nigel Ashford, Institute of Humane Studies, George Mason University. Young people appear to have rejected free markets. Yes. Why do you think that is, and what could be done to reverse it? Uh, it's my fault. Um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I honestly, I, I think there's, um, uh, there has been a lack of education, public education about what are market economies, what are their virtues, and, and, and what are their, their fails, failures. I mean, they're not perfect. There's no question about that. Um, and, and because we weren't explaining how they worked, all we were saying is they work. Markets work. And so um, my son, um, uh, today's his birthday, as it turns out. He's uh, 37 years old. So you, you roll the clock back. He's in, in this, this sort of very formative part of his life when the uh, uh, financial crisis, Great Recession hits. I'm on the campaign chair with John McCain, and I tell him to say things like the, the fundamentals are sound, we'll, be, we'll get through this. And they look around and they think, okay, these people are nuts. The fundamentals are not sound. Everything in the world is falling apart. Then they say markets work. That stock market thing isn't working. The bond market thing isn't working. Housing market didn't work. And so we did a, a terrible job of, of educating a generation in the sources of their prosperity. Um, we took it for granted. We didn't uh, educate them, and we're paying the price for it. I, I, I believe that to be true. We've heard a lot today of uh, various kind of underlying gripes or, or, or problems that national conservatism purports to be responding to, whether it's the hollowing out of, suppose, hollowing out of the manufacturing sector, uh, regulators in the federal government taking issues like climate change much more seriously than the opioid epidemic and, and a range of other things that uh, Casey Mulligan mentioned. If we're being the most charitable, where do you th see genuine gripes with how government policy perhaps might have let down people who um, uh, national conservatives are trying to appeal to? So I, I think there's a, you know, as, as a lifelong Republican and conservative, I think uh, we offered nothing to a large swath of uh, lower to middle class Americans living in a lot of rural places whose economic prospects had disappeared. We offered them nothing in the way of uh, an alternative to just um, uh, being, being forgotten. And that, that was wrong. And um, uh, it's a lesson that, that I take to heart deeply. Um, so, can you hear? Yeah, okay. So I, th I think there was that, I, r I really do. Um, you know, the early waves of this were, were clearly visible to me in 2007 in the Republican primaries. I didn't fully understand it, um, and, but, but it, it, it was there already. And, um, and, 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 the, and, and the, the sort of um, strength of that population grew, political strength grew over time because they, they, they deserved a better deal. We, didn't, we, we left them behind, and, and I think that was wrong. Um, there's a second piece, which is, which is just sort of genuinely uh, the functioning of government. Um, you know, I'm, I've now been here 20 odd years. I'm a, 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 a certified swamper, and um, the the, the federal government has, has ossified in a way that's incredibly uh, frustrating, I think, to everybody and, and, and troubling to me. So in the late uh, 80s and in the early 90s, the information uh, technologies uh, and communication technologies revolution uh, created this phenomenal uh, white-collar job loss. It was on the, on the cover of all the magazines because a whole layer of middle management basically exists to take the data from the retail guys, write memos about it, and give it to their uh, superiors. And these dashboards and, and information systems made them obsolete. The, the management could get it straight from the retail, and that whole layer of, uh, of employment went away. It was white collar um, job loss. It was very frightening to people. The federal government never did that. So we now have a federal government that has a gazillion paper pushers who are writing memos for their n new political superiors. And we actually have terrible retail service in the federal government. So we, we never reinvented government in the way that we should have um, to deliver government services and, and do things. And so that's a, that's a problem in every agency 
that needs to be thought about, and the opportunity to do it comes with the retirement of the baby boom generation and, and a, a whole uh, cohort of, of federal agency employees. On top of that has turned this phenomenon, and this is the, the real breakdown, the Congress has on a regular basis ceded its authorities to the administration. And administration, you know, they, they come in, they don't really know anything about the government, and they, they, they have to cede authority to the, the civil servants. And it's a recipe for disaster, because you, you've now given up the democratic representation of ideas that's in the Congress, that's who we elected, to people who were there because they like that topic. It, it's really, it's a real problem. And, and I'm sympathetic to people who want to fix that, that need fixed. Yeah, when you put together the once in a decade or once in a century, um, you know, uh, crises like pandemics on top of that dysfunction, it's a, it's a recipe for all sorts of uh, dangerous uh, ideologies. So we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, I'm gonna try and get people who haven't asked a question so far today. So I think this gentleman here in the middle. So I get the people who have been saving their hard questions? Exactly, yeah. Save the best till last. <laughs> Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Could you just, just tilt, tilt? Yeah, that's it. Scream at that's it. it. Okay. <laughs> thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question: uh, the Fed. Do you think it's? Do you think the Fed is basically damaged free market functioning, creating these vast financial bubbles, and rescuing them with? Uh, starting the cycle all over again with massive money creation? So I think the Fed has been less than perfect. Um, I, I don't know if I want to characterize it in quite that apocalyptic of terms, but um, it has been the case that the world has changed on us, and, and I don't think we recognize it. When I was trained in economics between 80 and 84, um, in the, and in the 20th century, business cycles were income events. They were called the inventory cycle. That was equivalently, the, because the notion was, you know, the inventory start piling up, you dial back on production, you lay some people off, they don't have any money, they don't spend as much, you get this sort of downward spiral, and then ultimately the shelves are bare and you gotta do some production, you get the reverse upward virtuous cycle, and, and these were income flows. And we thought about um, mitigating business cycles from an income flow point of view and um, UI and discretionary tax cuts and public works all fell into that. And, and then without letting us know, uh, business cycles decided to change and, and we had the dot-com bubble burst and we got a mild recession in 2001, 2002. That was seven trillion dollars of equity wealth lost. But a financial market event ha hammers the, um, the real economy and then the financial crisis, Great Recession, again, housing bubble is about seven trillion. It's all debt, so it's highly levered, goes through the, the entire financial system in, in ways that weren't transparent, you get an enormous recession. And, this was over and I said, I our fiscal tools aren't changed, so we don't know how to, f how to fight the, the business cycle caused by a financial event, and so we, so we sort of had to cede, cede it to the Fed to do full employment, price stability, and then financial stability. We like financial stability because those things keep falling down. We're gonna have a recession, so don't let them fall down. And, and that it gets them into a different place where they're, they're worried about not letting things fail, right? We get, you get to that. Um, they're making up the policies, quantitative easing and um, forward guidance and all these this menu of things that we've seen recently on the fly, no particular way to uh, uh, judge their effectiveness. And so we find ourselves where we are now. I mean, right now, they are trimming their portfolio, which they put expanded by $5 trillion in the pandemic. Um, and they've never done that before, and we have no idea what the impact's gonna be. I mean, how much financial tightening will we get out of that? So what's the fallout gonna be across various sectors of the economy? We don't know. And so I think there's good reason to be concerned about, A, how much we've relied on the Fed, uh, and B, their, their capacity, even a well-intentioned Fed, forget whether they, they don't have the right uh, objectives, even, even if they have the right objectives, they're in a really hard position right now. And, and I'm, I'm worried about how it plays out. Okay, next question. Uh, this gentleman here at the front. There's a microphone coming to you.
From the things that you've laid out here, what do you think would be some next steps to make things better? I, I'm a, a, a big believer in public education. Um, I mean, the truth is I've lived my adult life uh, on the, the notion that better informed policymakers will make better decisions. There's no empirical evidence that's true, but I, I'm staying at it. <laughs> um, but I, I really think we need some public education. And I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the character of, say, presidential uh, elections and what's going on. You know, it's not like I was in the best campaign ever. I can tell you lots of reasons why I wasn't. But, but 2008, th there were serious tax plans. There were serious health plans. I mean, there were serious identification of, of national problems and ways that they should be dealt with. That got thinner in 12. It was non-existent in 16. It was non-existent in, in, in 2020. Um, we're not having a debate about the issues. And those are America's teachable moments. That's when Americans who are busy doing things that are like, far more important, like raising their families and, and going to work and going to church, and, and that's when they stop and say, okay, what do the people who are gonna run the show think is, is a, an important problem and what should we do about it? Th those are the teachable moments. Th if, there just hasn't been anything on that. I mean, the, the panel here is talking about the, the budget problem. If you think about it, my old boss, George W. Bush, his statement on budgets was essentially, um, we have to win the war against global terrorism at all costs. Uh, the Obama administration said for eight straight years, there's nothing wrong with the federal budget. It can't be fixed by having the rich pay their fair share. The Trump administration said nothing. And so for the 21st century, the, the most important public educator has not said to the American people, we have a problem. The problem is the federal budget, and it is threatening your future. That's a fact. No one's told them. So if you go to fix it, and you, and you go to you know, change Social Security or something like that, it's going to be viewed as an ad hominem attack with no foundation, because they haven't been told there's a problem that needs fixed here. And I think so that's, that's the number one thing for me. I mean, you've got you to level with people about the problems or you can't fix them. And, and that, that, that truth telling just hasn't occurred. And so that, I, I hope that that begins to happen. And on that optimistic note, we're going to uh, uh, close proceedings today. So, Doug, thank you so much you. for your time. We've really appreciated it. Thank you. Please, please do join us downstairs for. Oh. <laughs> please do join us downstairs for refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.